Chapter 35 There Was Ogres Pauk's mind was still on the imaginary battle. If I'm going to be back at the wagons, how am I supposed to look out for you? Suppose you're the un get stuck on somebody's land, sir. How am I going to get to you and find you and all that? That will be my squire's task if I have one. And I still don't think it makes no sense for knights to come at each other the way you do. You and sir, sir, want it. Aye. You never did hurt the other and at all. You just knocked him off his horse. I corrected the record. He knocked me off mine, Pauk, three times. Only twice twas, sir. That other time. Which makes three. There are half a dozen holes in your argument, Pauk, and I doubt that it's worth our while to plug them all. If you say so, sir. Besides, we'll be at the farm before I could do it. But I ought to tell you that I've never been in a real battle in which knights fought on horseback. What I've said about them, and what I'm about to say about knights fighting, I learned from Sir Rovd, Master Thopi, and Sir Waddit. From Master Thopi particularly. He's a regular gold mine of information, and I could listen for hours. Looks a pretty decent place, sir. Pauk said, regarding the farmhouse, its mud and wattle walls were whitewashed, and its thatch looked new. They're doing better than a lot of people I've seen, I paused, recalling Master Thopi's impassioned growl. Your complaint is that Sir Waddit and I didn't actually hurt each other much, much less kill each other. He knocked me off my horse, and once I got lucky and knocked him off his. Aye, the syllable bore a world of satisfaction. The first thing, the main thing you've got to get, is that Sir Waddit and I weren't trying to kill each other or even trying to hurt each other. In a battle, the knights are out to kill one another. Pauk nodded reluctantly. We used practice lances made of wood not strong enough for real ones. You don't want a practice lance to be strong. Somebody might get hurt or killed. A real war lance is as strong as it can be made. It has a sharp steel head, too. Ours were blunt. By hitting me hard with a stout dagger, one of the Austerlings was able to stab through my mail, remember? His stab opened a couple of rings, and that was enough. Aye, he was afeard you'd die, sir. I just about did. And maybe I would have eventually if it hadn't been for Garseg. Now suppose instead of a dagger that mail was hit by a heavy war lance with the weight of a knight and a galloping horse behind it. Puck scratched his head. Go through it like it was cheese, sir. You've got it. What's more, Sir Waddit and I aimed at each other's shields. The shield's what's generally hit with a lance in a real battle. And what good does that do? It's just like what I was saying, sir. Pretty often none. But the shields used in battle are a lot lighter than our practice shields, and the lance point will go through sometimes. Even if it doesn't, the knight whose shield got hit may get knocked out of his saddle the same way I was. Remember what I said about a second line of knights behind the first? Now pretend you're a knight who's been knocked off his horse pretty well stunned by the fall. We had reached the house. Cox said, If it's all the same to you, sir, I'd just as soon not. He dismounted, by that act alarming several ducks and a goose. Maybe I ought to run in front, sir, and tell him who you are. A middle-aged farm wife had appeared in the doorway. I called, We're harmless travelers looking for water for our horses and ourselves. Let us have that, and we won't ask for anything else. She did not answer, and I added, If you'd rather leave us thirsty, say so and we'll go. Pauk trotted toward her, leading his horse. This here's Sir Abel, the bravest knight Duke Martyr's got. She nodded and seemed to weigh me with her eyes. You look brave enough, and strong. I'm thirsty, too. I've been jousting and riding without a hat. May we have some water? She reached a decision. We've cider if you want it. It'll be healthier. Maybe a couple hard-boiled eggs and some bread and sausage? I had not known I was hungry, but when she said that, I found out quick. I said, We can pay you, ma'am, and we'll be glad to. We're going into Forsetti to pay an innkeeper what we owe him and we can pay you as well. No charge, you come in. She ushered us into her kitchen, a big sunny room with a stone floor and onions hanging in braided strings from the rafters. 
Sit down. We get you nights up and down the road every day almost, and that's good. The robbers don't bother us, only the tax man. But most nights don't stop here, or speak neither, when we wish them good morrow. They're not as thirsty as we are, maybe. I'll fetch the cider right away, kegs in the root cellar, she bustled out. Hard cider it might be, Pauk licked his lips. I agreed, but I was thinking about the woman and what she might want from us. She came back with three basswood jacks, which she set on the table. Fresh bread, nearly fresh anyhow, I baked yesterday. She took a sausage from the pocket of her apron and laid it on a trencher, where it fell in thick slabs under the assault of a long knife. Summer sausage, we smoke it three days, and after that it keeps if it don't get wet. I thanked her and ate some sausage, which was very good. Sir Abel, that's you? You seem like a down-to-earth person for a night. I interrupted my cider drinking to say I tried to be. You really the bravest knight the Duke's got? Aye, Pauk exclaimed. I doubt it, I said, but I don't really know. To tell you the truth, I don't believe there's a knight in Shearwall Castle that would hesitate to cross swords with me, but I wouldn't hesitate to cross swords with them either. Scared of ghosts? I shrugged. There's no man I'm afraid of, and it doesn't seem likely that a dead man would be worse than a live one. Not a man. She glanced at Pauk, who had drained his mug and was looking unwontedly sober. Little more of that? He shook his head. If it's a woman's ghost, I said, she may be after some property or something she thinks is coming to her. I talked to an old lady down south who knew a lot about ghosts and she told me that women's ghosts generally mean the woman was murdered. More often than not, justice is all they want. Not a woman, the farm wife got up to fetch a loaf of bread. A child's ghost? That's sad. I wish twas. She sawed her bread with exaggerated care, I thought to keep her feelings under control. Are you talking about the elf? They're not ghosts. Guess you know how you knights got started? I admitted I did not, that I had never even wondered about it, and added that I would like to hear the story. No story. There was ogres all around here in the old time, dragons too, monsters, these here giants that's in the ice country now, lots of them. A man that killed one, he was a knight, only after a while they was all killed off, so it had to be other things. You still haven't told me what the ghost is. A uh, ogre. Must have been one killed right here, cause it's been haunting my farm. Pauk looked around as if he expected to see it. You don't have to worry, the farm wife told him. He don't come but at night. I said, In that case we can't help you. We've got to go to Forsetti. I took another piece of her summer sausage, thinking she might pull it out of reach soon. We can't stay in Forsetti tonight, though. Or here, either. I promised Master Augur he'd get his horses back tonight. Her face fell. It will be late, I suppose, when we pass your house again. Dark or just about. We could stop in for a moment just to make sure everything was okay. Me and my sons would be pleased as pigeons, Sir Abel. We'd give you a bite to eat then, and your horses too. I snapped my fingers. That's right, the horses haven't been watered. See to them, please, Pauk. Not good to give them too much, sir. That's when they're warm from galloping. They can't be hot now. They've been standing in the shade whisking flies while we ate. Give them all they want. Aye, aye, sir. He hurried out. The farm wife said, He and my sons work this farm, Sir Abel. They're strong boys, both of them, but they won't face the ghost. Guns did, and it almost killed him. He was bad for more than a year. I said I would not have thought just being scared could do that. Broke his arms, and just about tore one off. As soon as I heard that, I wanted to talk to the son, but he was out seeing to something or other. It stuck in my mind, though. Chapter 36 The Dollop and Scallop In the tap of the Dollop and Scallop, it was a big, plain, dirty room where you smelled the spilled ale, the innkeeper gave me his bill with a flourish. I can't read, 
I told him. Or not the way you write here. I wish I could. I'd like to learn, but you'll have to explain this to me. I spread the bill on the top of a table. Now sit down and tell me about this. I see the marks on the paper, but I don't know what they mean. He scowled. Want to make a fool of me, don't you? Not a bit. I can't read and neither can Pauk, but I'd like to know what I'm being billed for. He stood beside me and pointed. This right here is the only part that matters, five seals up and down. For three days? It seems like an awful lot. Three days' rent of the best room I got. That's right here, he pointed. And food here, and drink? Pauk would not meet my eyes. And food for your dog, that's here. I caught his arm. Say that again. Tell me about it. Food for your dog. The innkeeper looked uneasy. A big brown dog with a spike collar. Shark's teeth, the spikes was. We give him bones from the kitchen, couple old loaves with drippings on them, and meat scraps and so forth, and I don't charge you for none of that. Only he stole a roast, too, and that cost. I didn't have a dog when I checked in. I tightened my grip because I had the feeling he was going to bolt if he got the chance. But I used to have a dog. Pauk knows him. You showed him to Pauk, didn't you? And asked Pauk if he knew who he belonged to. Pauk shook his head violently. He never showed me no dog, sir, I swear. Nor never talked about none, neither. I was going to punish you, I told him for drinking at my expense when you knew I didn't have much money. But if you're lying about Gilf, I'm not going to punish you at all. If you've lied about Gilf, you and I are finished right now, and you had better keep out of my way from here on. Pauk drew himself up. I never seen no dog in this here inn, nor heard tell on, sir. Not from him, and not from nobody here at all. Not your dog Gilf would jumped over the rail in that time we both remember. And not no other dog, neither. The innkeeper was trying to pull away. I said, Why didn't you show the dog to Pauk? I tried to, but he was asleep. Last night full of your ale, did he tell you I had agreed to let him drink as much as he wanted? The innkeeper said nothing. You said the dog stole a roast. Why didn't you show him to Pauk after that? Wasn't Pauk here until Maud Gouda came to get him? She sent a boy on a horse, sir, Pauk explained. Him and me rode back together, me sitting behind to him like. I said, It's clear that Pauk was awake this morning since Maud Gouda's boy found him and spoke to him. We couldn't catch that dog, Sir Abel. He's a bad one. So are you. I thought about the bill and the few gold scepters that remained to me. I could pay, but when I had, that much more would be gone forever. I won't pay for the roast. You wouldn't have fed this dog that other stuff after he had stolen a whole roast, so you knew he was here, and you did nothing to keep him from taking a big piece of meat that must have been left lying around in the kitchen. You are careless, and the roast is the price you've got to pay for it. All right, the innkeeper said. Let go of my arm, and I'll take it off. How much did you charge me for it? Three cups. I'll take it off. I said I would. Let me go. I shook my head and stood up. Not yet. I'm going to make you an offer. I'll pay the three cups with my free hand. I fished big brass coins out of the burse at my belt. If you'll show me the dog right now, and it's mine. I'll let you go, too. Will you do it? I can't. It run off. I swept up my coins again. In that case, I'm not going to pay you anything for the dog's food. You let it run away instead of informing my servant. Neither will I pay a single copper for what he drank. Strike those off and we'll talk about the rest. If you haven't cheated me on that, I'll pay it all. It's five seals, the innkeeper insisted. Five less the three cups for the dog's food. That much, or I call the watch. I picked him up, turned him over, and dropped him. I'm living at Shearwall Castle now. You can go to Duke Martyr for justice, and I'm sure you'll get it if you do. Only first it might be smart for you to think about whether you really want it. Sometimes people don't. 
We left him lying on the floor and went up to the room that had been ours, washed and shaved there and packed up everything we had brought off the western trader. When we went downstairs again, there was a knight in a green surcoat lying in wait in the taproom. He cut at my head when I docked his blade bit into the doorframe. I rushed him before he could get it out, knocking him off his feet. With the point of his own dagger sticking him under the chin, he begged for mercy. I said all right and got up and dusted myself off. I'm Sir Abel of the High Heart, and I claim your armor and your shield, your weapons except for your sword, your horse or horses if there is more than one, and your burse. You can keep your clothes, your life, and your sword. I'm not going to ask any ransom for you. Give me those things and you can go. Sir Knighter of Fair Hall am I. He got up and bowed. Your offer is generous, I accept it. Pauk said, Pa, and I gave him a look that meant, Shut up. Niter unbuckled his shield and leaned it against the bar, took off his steel cap and pulled off his mantle of mail, his surcoat and his hauberk, piling everything on the nearest table. My helm is on my saddlebow, he said. May I keep the surcoat? It bears my arms. I nodded. Thank you. He untied his purse and handed it to me. Five seals and a few coppers. You said I might retain my sword. Does that extend to the scabbard and sword belt? I nodded again. The innkeeper called you a brigand. I shall have words with him by and by. So will I, I said, and I told Pauk to have a look at the horse for me, adding that he should report on all of them if there was more than one. There are three, Niter said. A smart pull freed his sword. You might tell my squire to come while you're about it, fellow. Pauk hurried out. I made the mistake of looking at Pauk as he left, and Niter's thrust almost spitted me. I jumped, half falling, and the point twitched the front of my tunic. The overhand cut that followed it would have killed me, I believe, if the point had not raked the low ceiling. As it was, I got Swordbreaker out and thrust with her, driving the flat end of her blade into Niter's face. He was sitting on the floor trying to stop the bleeding by the time his squire came in. The squire hurried over and tried to help him, but Niter would not take his hands away to let the squire examine his wound. Neither would he speak. Your horses are mine, I told the squire. Pauk, is there a charger among them? There is a good in what he rode, Pauk said. Don't know if I'd call it a charger, but it's a good un. Then there's his, Pauk gestured toward the squire, and a pack horse like. Whatever goods are on that pack horse are mine too, I told the squire. I'm keeping that horse, and the one your master rode. Is the one you rode your own, or does it belong to him? It's Sir Niter's, sir? Abel. Sir Abel, I. I. You have no armor. I do now. I'm giving you the horse you rode. Pay attention. It was Sir Niter's. I took it from him when I beat him, and I just gave it to you. Now that you own it, I want you to put him on it and lead it some place where they've got a doctor. The squire nodded. He has a house here, Sir Abel. I... You are a true knight. I hope to be a true knight myself soon. I wished him luck. I must tell you that I was one of those who pummeled you in the practice field. You needn't give me stamper, and you should not. Niter said something indistinctly. I won't take stamper back, I told the squire. He's yours. Get your master up on him and get him out of here. Pauk and I went outside and watched them go. When they had vanished around the first bend in that crooked street, Pauk asked if I wanted him to look into the pack horse's load. I shook my head and told him to find the innkeeper. Here, sir. He'll be outward bound under all sail. Look for him anyway. There must be help of some kind here, a cook and so on. Look for them, too. I'll be in the tap, trying on Sir Niter's mail. Niter's sword was in there, too. I did not want it, but I was glad to have a chance to look it over. It was a little bit bigger than Rav's, and a bit heavier, too, although I did not think it was quite as good. Wanting to see what it would do, I drove it into the top of the bar. It went through five or six inches of wood and stuck, so I left it there. 
I had Niter's hauberk on and was fastening the lacings. That can be tough when you are wearing the hauberk, when Pauk came back with a stout, red-faced woman. This is the innkeeper's wife, he announced, and this here's my master, Sir Abel of the High Heart. She bent her knee, and I explained that I had rented a room for three nights. Upstairs front, Pauk added. I know this one, the innkeeper's wife jerked a thumb at Pauk. Only I didn't never see you up to now, Sir Abel. He told me his master was a knight, only I never more'n half swallowed it. He's a sailor, sir, and there ain't much truth in him. Sailors see things other people won't believe, I shrugged. Would you believe him if he were to tell you of the Isle of Glass? No, sir. I don't blame you. But I've seen it, too, and even walked through its glades. Seamen lie just as we do, of course, and for the same reasons, but I'm telling you the truth when I say that. Far be it from me to give you the lie, Sir Abel. Thanks. Don't lie now, and we can be good friends. Do you know where your husband is? I'd like to talk to him. I haven't no notion, Sir Abel. He's gone out, seems like. Yeah, it does. Before he left, he told me about a dog that came here. He said it was a big brown dog with a spike collar. She nodded. And a bit of chain hanging off it, where it had broke? I see. Your husband thought it might be mine, and I've been hoping he was right. I lost my dog a while ago. Do you know where it is? No, sir, I seen it yesterday. Only I don't know where it's got to. We was all chasing it and trying to get the roast it took back, and it run off. Real big it was. Drop ears and thick in the chest. That sounds like Gelf. If he comes back, be nice to him and send word to me. I'll be at Shearwall Castle. I'll try, sir. The innkeeper's wife's attention had strayed to Niter's sword. I told her who it belonged to, and I said that she and her husband were to leave it where it was until he came back to get it, at which she bent her knee again. I know it will be in the way, I began. She shook her head. They'll come in to see it, Sir Abel, and have one or two while they gawk and we tell about it. It'll be money in our pocket. I hope so. But when Sir Niter comes back, you'll have to let him take it. Tell him that I didn't want it and left it there for him. Is he a friend of yours, Sir Abel? Pauk laughed. He had it in for me, I told her. He must have followed me here, and he seems to have scared your husband away before we had it out. Did you notice what we did to the door frame? Reluctantly, she nodded. My bill was where I had left it. I got it and showed it to her. Your husband and I were talking this over. He made it five seals. I didn't think that was fair. She examined it. He goes too far sometimes, Sir Abel Gorndu. No doubt we all do. Can you write? She nodded. Then I'll pay you four seals in good silver, if you'll write paid in full across this and sign your name. You'd better date it, too. She hurried away to fetch ink, sand, and a quill. Chapter 37 A Green Knight I'd been riding a lot that day. I was sore, but I got my left foot in the stirrup and swung myself into the saddle almost as if I knew what I was doing. The horse Niter had ridden was a cobby bay stallion with a big white blaze, nervous and energetic, but not big enough or strong enough for a charger. A green lance, with pennant flying, still towered above the beautiful green leather fighting saddle. The bay skittered sidewise, iron-shod hooves clattering on the cobbles. "'Glad you got to ride him and not me.' Pauk said as he finished tying Niter's shield onto the pack horse's pack. Be careful with that, I told him. It's the only piece that fits. Got his mark on it, though, sir. Pauk was tightening the last knot. His arms, you mean? I held the bay hard. Aye, sir, a sheep with big horns, sir, only they wasn't big enough. We'll have it painted over. Three streets up the hill and four west, Pauk nodded, looking dubiously at his own mount. Sign of the hammer and tongs, sir. Can you lead two horses, Pauk? If they'll tow, I can, sir. Some will and some won't, and you never know till you try. 
The armorer with whom we had left my mail shirt was larger, younger, and slower of speech than Master Maury. He held up my new hauberk, whistled to himself, and carried it to a window where the light was better. I said, I got it from Sir Niter, if that's of any help. Double mail. Not our work, but taint bad. If you can let out the shoulders and the arms. Deed I can, Sir Abel, but it'll cost. Those mail trousers, I don't even know what you call them. I'll give them to you if you'll let out the hauberk for me. He gave me his hand. I got to take your measures, Sir Abel. I'll give you a final fittin' when you come get it, and have it done that day if you come in the morning. Pauk said, Ask him about this shield, sir. You say you like it. I do. I took it from him and held it up. Can you paint out the ram without making it look bad? Deed we can. The armorer accepted and examined it. Leather over willow, probably double willow, he looked up at me. Grain up and down and crosswise so as not to split. Only I'd have to get the leather off to see for sure. He was a nice workman, though, and wouldn't, or used a single. I won't look lest you want it, just repaint the face. What you want instead of the ram? When I did not reply, Pauk said, What about a heart, sir? A heart with the sun under. That ought to do it. I shook my head. Charge is up or down, the armorer said, dependin' on the design. Harder my artists got to work, the more I got to charge. There was one wanted three hearts and three lions, all on the one shield. We done it but it cost the world. I said that I would never use a lion. Well, what would you? That's the question. I thought about stars and stripes, and I remembered that all the teams at school had been bobcats, but nothing seemed right. Pauk had wandered over to the wall and taken down a long knife. Its blade was black, and Pauk examined it curiously. Ale fork, the armorer told him. Only one like that I got. You ever see anything like this, Sir Abel? No, but I'd like to. Pauk passed me the knife. They like them leaf-shaped blades. Drive me crazy. Looks all right to me, Pauk said. I was turning the black blade this way and that to get as much light as I could on it. There are swirls in the steel, like the currents in a creek, the armorer nodded. Mixed metals. We try to mix metals and they run together, like you'd mix water and vinegar. Elf got some way to mix them like oil and water. They mix, only they stay separate. See what I mean? I do, I said. I'm looking at it. I was not sure I ought to say more, but I did. You believe in the elf. A lot of people don't. The armorer shrugged. I know what I know. Pauk began, My master. I shut him up with my hand. His master does too. You must know a bit about swords. Have you heard of one called Eterni? Famous poetry about it. Do you know where it is now? The armorer shook his head. Fire elf work like that knife. King um made it, and he put magic in it. Can't break, can't bend. Need a dragon's claw to sharpen it, only it don't never have to be sharpened. Famous men's owned it, kings and knights and like that. And come back if you draw it. Only I don't know who's got it. It's somewheres in the elf world, probably. Pauk said, That's called elf for sainted, sir. The armorer nodded again. I know, only I didn't think you would. This here's Mythgarther, know that? Pauk shook his head. Figured you didn't. I ventured, You said Eterni had been made by the king of the fire elf. I was told that a man like us made it a man called Wieland. That's his name, all right, the armorer said. Only he was king of the fire elf like I told you. King Wieland, dragon got him but people still talk about him. That is true, a soft voice behind me whispered. We speak of him and mourn him even now. I nodded to show that I had heard. Out loud I said, The shield I brought you, will you paint it green? Green now, sir. What do you want on it? Plain green, I told him. I want nothing on it. 
Paint out the ram so that you can't see it at all. It felt cooler when we left the armorer's shop, and at first I thought the change, a great improvement, was due merely to our getting away from the heat of the forges. As Pauk and I rode out of the city, however, a west wind sent the bay's long mane flapping around his eyes, and made my cloak billow about me like a sail until I closed it and tied the cords. That wind was chilly, and no mistake, it came pretty close to cold. Sky help them what's at sea, Pauk muttered. He was looking behind us, and I turned to look too. Black clouds reached for the sun back there. While I watched, one was shot with lightning. I clapped my heels to the bay. There is one thing you cannot ever take from a knight, you beat, even if you kill him. That is a pair of gold spurs. I had wanted knighters and bad, and yet I had never said a word about them because of the law. I wanted them because they are the sign of knighthood, but as we rode out of Forsetti, I wanted them because they were spurs. We've got to shake a leg, I yelled to Pauk, or we'll get soaked. He slapped his mount's withers with the ends of the reins, kicked it, and swore until it broke into a pounding trot that nearly shook him out of the saddle. I need to cut me a stick, sir, and I'll stop off and do it first likely bush I see. I'll catch up after, never fear. You feel like talking? I reined in the bay for Pauk's sake. Not particularly, but I don't feel like not talking either. What do you want to talk about? You was in a brown study, sir, if I can say it. So I didn't want to fash you. Only I wanted to say, sir, there ain't much point to riding fast. That blow back there'll hit long fore we get to the castle. Only it won't be so nice to ride in as what this is, sir. So there's sense in hurrying after all. Only they'll be white and dinner on us, sir. We told them we was coming. I snapped my fingers. That farm. That's right. I wanted to talk to Duns. Naturally you'd forget, sir, thinking hard like you was. Another thing, sir. Time we eat it'll be poor and fit to founder us in a wind to knock you down. You really think Master Augur'd mind if we stopped overnight like and kept his horses out of the blow? Probably not. He'd overlook it, I'm sure, even if he didn't okay it. That's my feeling too, sir. It's landsmen, sir, what think you ought to sail in all weathers. From what I seen of them at the castle, they're not landsmen when it comes to horses, if you take my meaning. Pauk cleared his throat. There's one other thing I've been itching to ask, sir, and no offense meant. But why'd you tell that smith to do a plain green shield? Don't say nothing, sir, if you don't feel like it. It's no big secret, but once I thought of it, I could see it was the thing to do. Look here. I took the helm from my saddle-bow and held it up. I should tell you I took the little wooden ram off the top and threw it away. That was yellow, but what color is this? Green, sir. Right. It would cost, to have it repainted, cost money we can't afford to spend. The steel cap you packed for me is enameled, too, maybe you noticed? Aye, sir. Only I'd not thought about it. A design on my shield would cost quite a bit, even a simple one like the heart and sun you suggested, or the mossy tree I was thinking about myself. So, plain green. My lady is queen of the moss elf. Chapter 38 The Wind in the Chimney It was raining hard by the time we reached the farm. One of the sons opened the barn for us, and we rode in and tethered our horses in a crowded herd. I told Pauk he had to unload the sumpter so it could rest while we ate. You won't get no fancy meal, the son warned me. We's plain folk here. So am I, and so is Pauk, I offered my hand. I'm Sir Abel. The son wiped his hand on his soaking trouser leg. Duns, my name, sar. Tis wet, and I begs your pardon for it. So is mine, I told him. We shook hands, after which he shook hands with Pauk. Uns joined us after that. At first I thought him only a shorter version of Duns. Later on, when I got a look at him in a better light, I saw there was something the matter with his back. I asked our hostess's name, and Dunn said, 
Mother's new car is sar, only she's cooking and can't come out to talk till it's ready, and when tis will eat. I understand. If this rain keeps up, we may be begging you for beds as well as a meal, if you've got any to spare. Won't last to moonrise, Hans muttered. Wind's gonna die, rain keep a goin' a while. He was an excellent weather prophet, as I was to learn. Duns nodded. We got to unbed, and that's all, sir. Only I can give you mine. I'll sleep on deck, sir, Pauk put in hastily. You know I'm one what's done it many's a time. Seeing through him, I grinned. At my door to keep the ghost from killing me in my sleep? Aye, sir. Try, sir. Tomorrow we'll have to ride back to Shearwall, storm or no storm, I told him. I'm landsman enough for that, but we may stay here tonight if our hostess is willing. If we stay, we must remember to unsaddle these horses and see that they're fed. What do you think, Duns? Will Pauk and I catch sight of your ghost if we stay the night? He's no joke, sir. Not to you, I'm sure. Maybe he shouldn't be one to me either. When we were here before, your mother told me he crippled you for a year. Duns nodded, his homely, sunburned face grim. Suppose I wanted to look at him. What should I do? Duns glanced at Pauk, saw he had finished unloading the sumpter, and motioned for us to follow him. Get in a house first, sir, and we can dry off. With Uns lagging behind, we followed Duns through the pelting rain to the front of the house, splattering ankle-deep mud at every step and ushered in by a roll of thunder loud enough to shake the walls. Captain's whistlin', Pauk said when we were inside and he could make himself heard. I smiled and reminded him that most people would say that the Vol father was angry. Not at us he ain't, Dunce declared. We need this. Uns caught my sleeve. If ya was to sleep in a kitchen, maybe. He was answering the question I had asked out in the barn, but it took me a second to realize that. Duns ran his fingers through his hair and shook water from them. He's a knight, ya coof. Knights don't sleep in a kitchen. I'll fetch a towel, sar. That way you can dry your face anyways. Pauk edged close enough to whisper, Be a big fire in the kitchen, sir. Shivering and wet to the skin, I told Duns we wanted to say hello to our hostess, and promised we would not keep her from her cooking. He led us into the big cheerful tiled room, where we greeted her and warmed ourselves at the fire that was roasting our dinner. As we ate it, Dunn said, You wanted to know how you could see it, sir, if you was to stay. I nodded and added that I would gladly sleep in the kitchen if it would get me a glimpse of the ghost. Nukara shook her head. All I can tell you is what I done. I guess my told what happened to me. I nodded again. It seemed like it a very solid ghost. Duns nodded ruefully and his mother eagerly. Uns only stared down at his plate. What I done was sit up the night, sit up quiet till I heard something, then I creeped up quiet as I could. I can show where I first seen it. Maybe later. Twas hot and the windows open, and it jumped out and, and I caught up in a south pasture. I's a strong man, I said. I know you are. I remember your grip. I's stronger then. Only it's stronger than me, lot stronger. He was clearly shamed. Nukara looked at me anxiously. You're not going to wrestle it, are you, Sir Abel? The way Dunn's done? I thought you'd... I don't know what. I don't... I fell silent as the eerie howl of the wind filled the room, a ghost not nearly as substantial as the one I hoped to hunt down. Storm's getting worse, Duns muttered. Yes, I stood up. Nukara looked surprised. That was just the wind in the chimney, Sir Abel? I agreed, but I had recalled what Desiree had told me when we parted, and knew I had to go. Pauk rose too, but I made him sit back down and finish his food. After that I turned and went out, afraid that I would say or do something that would give my secret away. There was a covered porch at the back of the house, and I suppose I stood there for half a minute looking at the rain. That may have been why I missed her.
I do not know how long it took me to cross the fields and meadows and reach the woods on the other side. It was slow going and hard going, but I kept at it, head down, with the hood of my cloak pulled up as far as I could get it to give my face some protection. I started calling for her when I got close, and I was dumb enough to be happy that the wind had dropped and it seemed like she might hear me. The rain had slacked off by that time, too, not stopped, but not pouring the way it had been. If you simply want a woman, said a soft voice at my ear, I know one who would be honored. I jumped. It was a red elf maiden, taller than I am, but as slender as a glowing poker. I am back, lord, she said, and I am Baki. Possibly you have forgotten me. To tell the truth, I have been wondering where you were, I said. You got Swordbreaker for me and my bow and put them under my bed. After which you told me to go away and let you alone. I really did not want to talk to her, although I felt I had to. I said, You wanted to get under the covers with me again. You and the other one. She tittered. Has anybody told you you sound like a bat? Only bats, Lord. That was you, wasn't it, in the armorer's shop? I could hear you, but I couldn't see you. Not I, Lord. She smiled. She had big white teeth, and they looked sharp. It must have been Uri, or your precious Queen Desiree, perhaps. I sighed. I ought to punish you for lying. I, whose blood glutted you? You have not the heart, Lord. You're right, I don't. I started calling for Desiree again, though I felt pretty sure I was not going to find her. I need not look like this, you know. Smoke came out of her eyes. She shrank and faded, getting wider, white and gold. In about a minute, maybe less, there was a naked, shy-looking girl with golden hair and a big stick-out chest where Baki had been standing. Her eyes sucked up the smoke. Do you like me better now, Lord? Her head came as high as my chin. I had thought only Desiree could do that, but I said, I'm not exactly crazy about you either way. Your guilty slave grovels, the blonde bowed her head. She would do anything to please you, Lord, and if you have no notions of your own, she can offer any number of exciting suggestions. Aren't you cold? I am, Lord, and so are you. We can heat ourselves pleasantly by following one of my most exciting suggestions. First I will kneel. So, you, as quickly as I could, I said, Have you been following me all day? The blonde shook her head keeping her eyes down as she had the whole time. Up here, Lord. Of course not. But I have watched you from Elfris. Will not you go there with me? It is not raining there. Something too deep-voiced for a wolf howled in the distance. I stopped to listen before I said, I spent quite a bit of time in Elfris with Garseg. I don't remember seeing anybody I knew in this world then. Because you did not know how to look, Lord, put your head right down here. I shook it instead. You will not. Seriously, if you come to Aelfris with me, I will teach you to view Mythgarther. It is not difficult. You can learn in a day or two. And afterwards I'll come back and find out I've been gone three years. Not that long. Or I think not, Lord, it is unlikely. Lord, if you will not sport with me, may I change? I did not answer because she had begun to change while she talked, looking up at me for the first time, so that I saw the blonde had elf eyes of yellow fire. Smoke poured from them, wrapping her in a robe of twilight and snow. When it returned to her, she was Baki again. I said, Are you really my slave? Still kneeling, she bowed to the rain-soaked fern. I stand ready to serve my lord night and day, though night is preferable, he need only ask. Who's your lord? The white teeth flashed in that face of glowing copper. You are. Who should be my lord but that most noble knight, Sir Abel of the High Heart? A knight, I said, but not noble. I think otherwise, lord. The armorer seemed to know about you, Fire Elf, and he said you were iron workers. is that true? Metal workers, Lord, iron and other metals. Would you like to see a sample of my own work? What of a silver chain with but one end? Whenever you needed money, 
You could cut off a piece and sell it. I shook my head. Why did Cedar choose metal workers? You must ask him, Lord. I will next time I see him. Why did your people persecute bold Berthold? Persecute is a terrible word, Lord. We may have teased him. Was he worse for our attention? The years, the anger born, and you all hurt him? Why did you do it? A gust of rain hit us. The howl I had heard before came with it, deep but as lonely as the cry of a wounded bird. Baki wiped cold water from the burning oval of her face. Do you still care about this Berthold Lord, whom I have never set eyes upon, by the way, or may we talk of something interesting? I'll always care for him. Very well. It was not I. I was a chimera for Cedar for a long, long time. It must have been centuries here. If Elf teased him, I apologize on their behalf. I was tired, and I knew by then that I would not find Desiree, but I was stubborn too. I wish I knew why they did it. Which you will not learn from me, Lord, for I cannot know it. I might speculate if you wish me to. Baki looked sulky. Go ahead, I told her. We like to tease you upper people. You think you are vastly superior, and we do not matter at all. So we tease you, and if you prefer to say torment, go ahead. Usually we do no harm, and sometimes we help, especially when we think our help is going to surprise somebody we have been teasing. We fire elf, like to keep smiths and such, mostly, people like your armorer. We like them because they do the same kind of work we do in Aelfris. Are you saying Desiree enjoys tormenting others? I won't believe it. Baki stared at the ferns around her feet. Well, does she? Let's hear it. Not she, perhaps, Lord, but the rest of us do. Mostly we choose people who are alone because it bothers you more. You are not sure it is really happening. Was this bird told all alone? Yes, I nodded. In a hut in the forest. Well, naturally, then. That's exactly the kind we like to play with. I have met Fire Elf, Water Elf, and Brown Bodichon. I sighed, remembering Desiree. Also the Moss Elf, who have been very kind to me. Bucky stood, and suddenly she was so near that our cheeks touched. I would be very kind to you, too, if you would let me. Her long, warm fingers toyed with the cord of my cloak. I smiled, bitterly, I'm afraid. Now it's my turn, isn't it? I'm alone among trees, just like bold Berthold. You think I am going to pinch you and run? Try me, Lord. That is all I ask. I shook my head. There is a great deal we can do without lying down on this wet ground, you know. But look at how soft this fern is. It is wet, but we are wet already. Let us make our own fire. I pointed. I want you to go to the farmhouse I came from. Watch there. Watch all of them, but watch the younger brother most closely. Don't let anybody see you and be ready to tell me everything they did when I come back. As you wish, Lord. I waited until she vanished among the shadows of the trees, wondering whether she would do what I had told her, and whether I would ever see her again. Once she was out of sight, I called Gilf. Chapter 39 Magic in the Air it was Gilf who found me, not me who found Gilf. When I had gone so far into the woods that I had begun to think I might get lost, I heard him trotting behind me. I stopped and sat on a log. It was no wetter than I was, and motioned to him in a way I hoped was friendly. He was bigger than I remembered, but you could count his ribs. You mind? He came a step at a time, not too sure of me. I said, if I didn't want you, I wouldn't have called you, would I? And I smiled, and he came up to me then and let me scratch his ears. After a while I said, I know I tried to leave you behind before I got on that boat. I'm sorry I did that. Maybe I've apologized already, and if I have, I apologize again. You must have thought I was doing the same thing when I didn't come back to look for you. But I didn't know you were waiting in Alfris. I thought you had probably gone back to the boat. I went there, and after I did, I couldn't get back to Garseg. Did he tell you what happened? 
Gilf shook his head. Maybe he didn't know. I thought about that. Garseg was as smart as anybody I had ever met, and he knew a lot. But when somebody's like that, you can overestimate them, and maybe you convince yourself they know everything. Not even the Valfather knows everything. I said, I used to think he had arranged for me to meet Kulili, and for you and me to get split up the way we did. I can't be sure, but now I think that's probably wrong. Think so. Do you? I thought about that for a minute or two. It seemed like Gilf had been waiting down where the Kelpies were for quite a while after Garseg and I got separated, and if Garseg had come back there, Gilf might have heard something. Finally, I started telling about the ogre, just because it was on my mind a lot and I wanted to talk it over. I told Gilf how it had hurt Duns and scared Nukara. I don't believe it's really a ghost at all, I said. Why would a ghost run from Duns? It could disappear. Baki can disappear pretty well, and she's not even a ghost. People may think that all the ogres are dead, but there were still giants in the north, lots of them. I think this is a real ogre, still alive, and safe because everyone thinks the last ogre died a long, long time ago. It took a while before Gilf nodded, but he did. I didn't come out here to look for it. I came to look for Desiree. But maybe I should have. It must live in these woods. Gilf shook his head. It doesn't? How do you know? Smell. Gilf yawned and lay down at my feet. Of course you don't smell it. How could you? It's still raining. And it was raining hard. Rain washes smells out of the air. Everybody knows that. Gilf stayed quiet, but the way he looked up at me showed he was not convinced. Look here, I said. Everything fits, and you ought to be able to see it. The windows were open because of the hot weather. The ghost, or ogre, I think ogre, could get in just by climbing through a window. Gilf shook his head again. You think it's too big? It jumped out one when Duns chased it so it could climb in one. Gilf was too polite to say anything, but I could tell how he felt. A big thing like a snake, shaped like a man. That's the way Duns described it, and Duns should know. Maybe we could come back when the weather's better. Then you could track it for me. Gilf put his head down between his paws and closed his eyes. I said, Am I putting you to sleep? I hope you're not scared of it. No, Gilf said very distinctly. Because I'm scared of you. That's why I tried to leave you behind before we crossed the Uring. He pretended not to hear. I like going around telling people how brave I am. What a jerk. I told that woman back at the farm that there wasn't a knight in Shearwall I wouldn't cross swords with. Maybe it's the truth. I know I thought it was when I said it. But I saw how you changed when we fought the outlaws, and it scared me half to death. I wasn't scared when Desiree changed, or when Baki did just now. I wasn't even very scared about Garseg and what the sunlight showed he really was, even if I was scared of him later in Muspel. But what you did was different. Gilf laid his head on his paws the other way and sort of groaned. I'm sorry. I don't want to make you feel bad. I'm sorry, too, that I didn't have more guts. I'm a knight, and we're not supposed to be scared of anything. Besides, you're the best friend I've got. Dog. He looked up at me. He had brown eyes, set deep in his brown face, and most of the time I did not notice them much. But when he said dog, they looked straight at me, and I knew he was begging me to understand what he was and how he felt. Yes, I said. You're my dog, and nobody ought to be afraid of a friendly dog. A knight shouldn't for sure. Desiree said a dragon had the sword called Eterni. Somebody like Garseg, I guess. How am I supposed to fight a dragon if I'm afraid of my own dog? Gilf only looked up at me, his eyes saying he could not make himself any smaller than he was. It was really pretty big, a lot bigger than any other dog I ever saw. I'm supposed to fight Kulili, too. I wanted to hide my face in my hands as soon as I said that. I gave Garseg my word, and look at all he did for me. But I don't want to kill Kulili. The elf hate her because they're afraid of her, that's all. It's one of the things fear does to you. It make you want to kill things that haven't ever hurt you, just because they might. Like it made me try to leave you behind before I forded the Uring. I'm ashamed of that, too. 
I waited a long time for him to talk because I did not feel like talking anymore myself. Finally, I asked, Why didn't you come back to the boat? You went to get Garseg, but when he came, it was just him and some water elf. Why didn't you come with them? Chained me. That's right, the innkeeper's wife said you had a broken chain on your collar. I turned his spiked collar on his neck, and sure enough, there were two or three links of chain hanging off it. There was no catch or anything, so I just undid the collar and threw it away. I think it may have been ale skin, but the spikes were shark teeth. After that, I asked Gilf if he knew why Garseg chained him up. Afraid of me. There it is again. I took a deep breath and let it out with a whoosh. Well, I've apologized, and maybe Garseg will too eventually. He let you go free, though. Once he and I had separated, I'm glad of that. Broke it, Gelf said succinctly. And came to Forsetti to wait for me. Uri stepped from behind a tree. It was as if she had been waiting there since Mithgarther was made. He came to search for you, Lord. He came to this wood looking for you, and to a good many other places besides. Baki and I would catch glimpses of him now and again while we were watching you. I don't like your doing that, I told her, but since you were doing it anyway, why didn't you tell me? You did not ask. You scarcely spoke, save to tell us to steal your weapons back. I did not buy that. I've never noticed that you and Baki were shy about forcing your talk on me. Uri bowed the woman way, spreading a skirt she did not have. Because you are not sufficiently observant. We are diffident, Lord, whether you notice it or not. Then you must have a swell reason for elbowing in on me and Gilf. I do, Lord. Someone must explain to you that this is not the first time your dog has been in this wood. Far from it. You seem to think him newly come. No, Gilf said. It sounded a lot like he barked, but it was no. That he cannot wind this ogre you hunt because of the storm. The truth is that he has been here in many weathers. Have you ever winded him here, dog? Gilf eyed her with disfavor, but shook his head. I asked, Have you ever smelled him at all anywhere? No. Maybe you really have, I was testing him. Maybe you smelled a strange smell and you didn't know what it was. He shut his eyes. He feels it is useless to talk to you, since you will not believe him, Uri explained. Baki and I often feel the same way, so I recognize the symptoms. I stood up, swinging my arms to get warm. Well, it's possible, isn't it? It is not, Lord. He do you know? Because he has said that he did not. I trust his word, and so should you. Perhaps this ogre is a ghost. I cannot say. I have never seen it or smelled it either. But if it is a ghost, it is not in this wood. I would know. What about Desiree? Is she here? I should have asked you before, and Gilf too. Have either one of you seen her? Gilf rose, shaking his head. Hungry? No, Uri said. I cannot declare she is not present, for her arts are greater than my own, but I would be as surprised if she were to step from behind a tree as you were when I did. Go home to Elfris, I told her. Wait there until I call you. She nodded and walked away. When we find this ogre, I told Gilf, I'm going to fight him by myself. I'd like any help you can give me finding him, but once the fight starts, you leave him to me. Gilf looked unhappy. I've got to prove myself to myself, I said, and it was only when I was through that I realized I had not said it out loud. Did I really like Kulili? Kulili was just a bunch of worms, something worms made when they got together. Maybe I just told myself I did because I did not want to fight her. When I beat Sir Niter, was that one of those crazy things that happen when a team down in the cellar beats the division leader? I knew I was no good with a lance. Was I good at all? I did not know, and not knowing was so bad I was ready to risk just about anything to find out. By then the rain had stopped. The sun came out, 
and it was not the enemy sun that had pounded down on Pauk and me earlier that day, but a beautiful sun of new gold. East a rainbow leaped in glory, the bridge that the giants of winter and old night had built for the overkinds so they could climb up to sky. There's magic in this air, I told Gelf. I love it. He did not say anything, but I started whistling. Chapter 40 A Citizen of Cellars Supper was fresh bread hot from the oven with butter and big bowls of good vegetable soup. Nukara had cleaned out a spare room for me, put clean blankets on the bed, and so on. While we ate, she told me how nice it was. I shook my head. I've promised to get Master Augur's horses home tonight, and I know the Duke wants me to spend every night at Shearwall till he lets me go north. I thought the storm would give me a good excuse for staying here with you, but it's over. Pauk and I will have to say goodbye as soon as he gets our horses ready. She stopped smiling. She had really wanted us to stay. I said, I think I may get a crack at your ghost just the same. If we're lucky, he may be gone forever by the time Pauk's finished loading our pack horse. So quick? I could see she did not believe me. I nodded and passed some bread down to Gilf. If you'll lend me Uns, will you? She looked at Uns, and so did I, but he just looked down at his soup. He's shy, she said. He still would not look up. You're not. Will he get killed? Or hurt the way Duns was? I shook my head. I'm going to fight the ogre if Uns and I can find him. Uns won't get hurt. Pauk cleared his throat. I'd main like to watch, sir, with your permission. I was soaking bread in the soup for Gilf. It gave me an excuse to think things over before I answered. Finally I said, You've got work to do. Uns and I will be going out into the fields to look for the ogre. Maybe into the woods. You'd probably get lost trying to find us. I think you'd better stay here. Dunn said, Be dark soon, sar able. I told him I was pretty sure the ogre would not show himself by daylight, so we had plenty of time to sit and talk and blow our soup. When it's over, I said, Pauk and I can ride home by moonlight. There'll be a good big moon tonight, and when we get there, the sentries will let down the bridge for us. I kept waiting for Uns to say something, but he never did. I left the house with Gilf trotting beside me and Uns lagging behind us. Knowing nothing better, I followed the narrow path that had taken me between fields and into the wood, the path Duns and Uns must have used when they cut firewood. When we came to the first trees, we stopped. I remember that the moon was just clearing the eastern peaks then. When Uns caught up, I told him, I didn't come out here to hunt your ogre, and I know as well as you do that he's not here. I came so you and I could have a private talk. I waited for him to speak, but he did not. I'm pressed for time. You know about that. It'll save some if you tell me everything now. I don't want to hurt you, and I'll take it as a favor. He opened his mouth, hesitated, and shut it. After a moment, he shook his head. Whatever you want. After this, you're to ask nothing from me. I gave you fair warning, so you get no favors. Gilf growled low in his throat. Before I came here, I said, a couple of friends of mine came to wait for me. They call themselves my slaves, but they're really friends. With his crippled back, it was hard for Uns to look up, but easy for him to look down. He took the easy way now, staring at his muddy feet. Gilf couldn't find a trace of your ogre in these woods. Gilf's my hound. I think I told you. He has a fine nose. Uns nodded. But there really is an ogre. Your brother wrestled it, and was laid up for a year. I don't know if I believe in ghosts, but I sure don't believe in ghosts that act exactly like they were alive. I got one of my friends to watch in your house while I was away. Do I have to tell you what she saw? This is your last chance, Uns. Uns turned and ran. I nodded to Gilf, and he brought him down before he had gone ten yards. She saw you go into the cellar and talk to the ogre, I said, while Gilf crouched over Uns, snarling. 
That's where it hides, I guess. I suppose it steals food from your mother's kitchen. You wanted me to sleep there. Was it so your ogre could kill me while I was asleep? Or was it to stop it from stealing for one night? Un said, Get him off! In a minute? It's a live ogre. It has to be, if it's an ogre at all, is it? I don't know. Guess so. Uh. That was the first time he had admitted anything, and I thought it would be better to pretend I had not noticed. I pulled my chin and asked what it said about that. Don't talk much. But it does talk. A little, I learnt him. I smiled, although I certainly did not feel like it. I guess you caught him young. What's his name? Org. Get him off or I won't talk no more. I told Gilf to let him go, and Gilf backed away, still growling. Uns waited a minute, not sure Gilf would not take off an arm if he got up. Finally he did. It was not easy for him because his bad back made it hard to keep his weight over his feet. I said, Maybe I sound like I know everything. I don't. What's important to me is that I don't know if I could beat your ogre in a fair fight. You can't tell me that, even if you think you could. Did you catch him young? Didn't catch him at all, Uns muttered. Da Ma was dead, laying in the woods with arrows all over, and her and Org starving. I ought to let him. I knew. Only I a mop ton wanted him, and I took him home. You hid him in your mother's cellar? Yes, sir. There's a old storeroom Ma's forgot, and that's Org's place. I see. Uns craned his neck to look up, seeking understanding. He stinks, he do, from sleeping in his shit, and sometimes I wants to turn him out. Only he'd get stuck. That got his ma killed, so I don't. Only I want to, and I will to, and day. I waited, pretty sure that he would keep talking if I gave him a chance to think about things. Learned him to talk a little, sar. Tried to teach him to say ogre, cause he is. Only he says org. So org's what I calls him, sar. He says yes and no nuns. Little words like that. I nodded. I suppose knowing you had him, a monster in the house that nobody knew about, made you feel like you were better than your brother, maybe better than your mother too. Made me good as damn, that's all, sar, ma. Go on. She's my ma, that's all. And sometimes it's like I's still a mop. And it's her farm. And she'll give it to Duns when she passes. I nodded to myself. Sa org means account ta. Can you get him from the cellar and bring him here without being seen? Uns hesitated, gnawing his lip. You going to kill him, sir, Abel? I'm going to wrestle him, if he'll wrestle me. Maybe he'll kill me, breaking my back or my neck. If he does, Gilf growled. You have heard the same noise, but you thought it was distant thunder. You and Gilf and Pauk will have to sort things out, or I may kill Org the same way. We'll see. You're going to wrestle him fair, sir? Yes, without weapons, if that's what you mean. Can you bring him? Don't let anybody see you. Uns bobbed his head. Yes, sir, out of da cellar door, sir. They won't know. Then bring him. Bring him now, and I'll do my best to see that no serious harm comes to him. Gilf wanted to go with Uns, but I would not let him. When Uns had gone, I took off my boots and my sword belt and laid them aside, with sword breaker and my dagger still in their scabbards. After that, I took off my clothes. They were still pretty wet. But I found I was a lot colder without them than I had been with them on. I had put my sword belt on my boots to keep it off the wet ground, sticking sword breaker and my dagger into the boots. Now I piled my clothes on top of everything, trying not to get them any wetter than they were already. When I had stripped, I stretched the way they teach you to in gym, leaning right and left as I touched my toes. The swing of the sea was strong in me and I called upon it as I loosened up my muscles. I was a big man, thanks to Desiree, 
a head taller than almost everybody, with big shoulders and arms thicker than most men's legs. I knew I was going to need all that, and the sea surge most of all. The big waves pound and drain away. They are strong, not stiff, and they swallow everything you throw at them and throw it back at you harder. Gilf snarled, and from the sound of it I knew Org was coming. I took a good deep breath and let it trickle away. Then I folded my arms and waited. This would be the test, and I had no idea how it would come out. Chapter 41 Org He bites, sir, I ought to tell you that. And he's bigger now than when Duns catched him. I said okay, feeling a little sick. Standing in back of Uns in the clear moonlight, the ogre did not look much taller than he was, but its shoulders were huge. As well as I could tell, its head was twice as big as his, but on those shoulders it looked too small. I could see the arms were so long they touched the ground, but I was too dumb to realize right away that it was walking on its knuckles. Quick toss are able, Uns sounded proud. You watch out, sir, don't dink he slaw, just cause he's so big. He's fast, and he'll hit with his hands fast. Slap at ya. Only they don't feel like no slaps. I said, You sound as if you fought him too. Not like Dunn's done, sir. He beat me easy. Only I made him see he had to have me. Somebody to take care of him. I dink he was going to eat me, though. Well, he doesn't have to have me, I stepped a little closer. He can eat me if he can. Org's left hand slashed faster than any sword I have ever seen. I tried to duck, but the edge of it got the back of my head. I was half stunned, but knew I had to get inside those long arms before I was knocked out. I went in hard, slamming my shoulder against his great bow belly. It was like hitting a boulder. I drove my fists into it, short jabs with the strength of big comers behind them, right and left, and right and left, again and again. His scales were ripping the skin off my knuckles, but I did not feel it until later. What happened next was that he picked me up and threw me. I ought to remember flying through the air, but I do not. When I came to, I was lying on wet grass and feeling like I had swallowed soap. I knew I had gone to sleep when I ought to have been doing something else, something really important, but I could not think what it was. Pretty soon bold Berthold would come and see I had not finished the job, and he would be too nice to say anything, and I would feel like I ought to just kill myself and get it over. But maybe I could see what the job was if I could just sit up. And if I could, I could start doing it and be hard at work when he came, and that would be better. Then I heard a dog, and I thought it was sheep or something. I had promised to watch sheep for somebody and fallen asleep, except that it was dark, just moonlight all around, and probably the sheep ought to be in a pen someplace, and I had not penned them, and had gone to sleep before the sun went down. The dog sounded as big as a bear. Old Berthold was most likely dead, Desira was dead too, and I had given little Osar to the Bodachon when they gave me Gilf. I got up, dizzy and near to chucking. The grass was barley, high already, but nowhere near ready for harvest. When I found Org, Gilf had him by the throat, and Gilf was black and as big as a horse. He was shaking Org like a rat and Org was trying to get loose while a two-headed snake of fire and brass struck at his face. I yelled at the snake until it quit and changed into Uri and Baki in a cloud of smoke. I made them help me get Gilf to let go. I do not think I have ever done any work rougher than that. Baki and I kept trying to pry his jaws apart, with him throwing us around when he shook Org, and the sticks Uri found for us breaking. When we finally got him off, Org fell down limp, and I knew just exactly how he felt. I told him I was sorry, that I had wanted for us to have a fair fight, and he had won it and I knew it. 
Maybe I should have offered him my armor and the horses, but I did not think of it then, and he was not a knight anyway. I said that I would never claim to have won, and whenever anybody asked I would tell the truth. Gilf did not want to go back to dog size, but I made him, and I helped Org get up and promised Gilf would not go for him. I'm ready to fight again if you want to, I said. I knew it was not true, but I thought Org probably felt worse than I did. If you need a few minutes to catch your breath, that's okay, but we can't take too long because I've got to get back to Shearwall Castle. I have had some big surprises in my life, and that was one of the biggest. Org got down on the ground again and crawled over to my feet on his belly. Or he said, He yields, Lord. That is his surrender. I said, Is that right, Org? Are you saying you give up? He moaned and put my foot on his head. It was colder than any rock. Baki said, He wishes to join us, beautiful naked lord. Uri laughed at that, and I wanted to run off and hide in the barley. These two elf maidens call themselves my slaves, I explained to Org. I had my hands over my privates, and I felt like the biggest fool in the world. They think you want to be my slave, too. I stopped for a minute, still dizzy and wondering whether he understood any of it. Finally I said, That's what they want us to think they think, anyhow. Is that what you want? He grunted twice. There, Baki sounded like she had won the lottery. You see, Lord, it says, aha. Uh -huh. I got mad. No, I don't, and I don't know what he said. I don't believe you do either. I found my sword belt and put it on. I was not sure I could crack that skull with Swordbreaker, but I was willing to try, and I could not stop thinking about what the people back at Shearwall would say if I killed the last ogre. With him lying on the ground the way he was, it was a terrific temptation. So I made him stand up. He did, sort of crouching. Uri ran her fingers up and down my back. You have not accepted him, Lord. He fears that if he stands, you will take it as a gauge of battle. I had my hand on Swordbreaker's hilt. If you're my slave, Org, I can sell you. Do you understand that? I can and I probably will. Is that what you want? He shook his head. The motion was not really right, but close enough that I knew what he meant. I said, What do you want, then? I can't let you go back to Nukara's house. I promised her I'd get rid of you if I could. If I let you go free, well, Uns was afraid you'd kill cattle and sheep, but I'm afraid you'd kill people. Will you? he muttered. I did not know what to say, so I got Baki to hold my sword belt while I pulled on my wet clothes again. When I had my cloak back on, I said, You mean like Pauk? It's going to be really hard for me to keep people from killing you. Org dropped down again and crawled over to the new place where I was standing. Will you, master? Okay. You can be my servant. I said that before I really thought about it, and there were times afterward when I wished I had thought it over more. Only listen here. If you're going to serve me, you've got to promise you won't kill anybody unless I say it's all right. You mustn't kill livestock either unless I say you can. I was not sure he understood livestock, so I said... No horses or cattle or sheep or donkeys, no dogs and no cats, no fowls. He looked up. I saw his eyes glow in the moonlight, and I think he was deciding whether I meant it. After a moment or two, he nodded. You'll get hungry, but your hunger isn't going to get you off the hook if you disobey me, understand? Or he said, I suppose you will want us to carry him off to Eofris and nurse made him for you whenever he is in your way. Well, you can whistle for it. No shit. I hitched my sword belt around so I could get at sword break or quick if I wanted her. I guess you're not my slaves after all. Bonky tried to look humble. We will do whatever you ask, Lord. We must. But I doubt that we could take him to Aelfris with us. He is too big. Uri nodded, putting a lot of energy into it. Besides, he is too stupid. Once we had him there, we could not control him. We could not do it here even with Gilf helping. I said, okay. You have not asked my advice, Uri said, but I will offer it just the same. I knew some of these creatures when they were common. 
They are stupid, lazy, and treacherous, but they are very good at hiding themselves and sneaking up on people, because they are of whatever color they wish to be. If you order this one to follow you without letting himself be seen, few would catch even a glimpse of him. I will not say no one would, because much would depend on where you went and how good the light was. Just the same, I think you might be surprised at how few did. I shrugged, wishing I could ask Gilf's advice. All right, we'll try it. But first, I want to take him back to the house and show him to Duns and Nukara, and find out what's become of Uns. After that, I'll introduce him to Pauk, I suppose. Pauk will have to do most of the watching and feeding. I only hope Pauk doesn't become ogre food himself. Or he smiled. He did not eat Uns. No, but it might be better if he had. Go back to Ale for— What is it? Pocky asked. Go back and tell Queen Desiree, if you should see her, if you can find her, I mean, how much I'd like to be with her, how much I love her, and how grateful I am for all the favor she's shown me. They said they would, and disappeared into the shadows. I turned to Gilf. If you're not an elf dog, and I have to admit you don't act like one, exactly what are you? Gilf only looked doleful, lying down and resting his muzzle between his paws. Can't you tell me? Come on, Gilf. Are you really one of the Valfather's dogs? That was what they said. He looked at Org significantly. He counts. Is that what you're saying? You won't talk while he's around? Gilf nodded the way he had when I had first gotten him. Another disadvantage. Well, maybe there are advantages to having you too, Org, but I haven't found out about them yet. I hope so. I started back to the house, motioning for them to follow me, and they both did. Desiree was watching us then. I know that because of something that she gave me when we got here. Not a drawing, although I thought it was a drawing at first, but a cutout of black paper glued to blue paper. A knight swaggering along with his hand on the hilt of a short sword. A monstrous thing behind him, taller than he is, shambling on bowed legs with one scaly hand upon the knight's shoulder. And a big dog that looks small because it is following the monster. I have put it where I see it every day. It has not made me wish to go back to Mythgarther, but I know it will some day. The kitchen windows looked bright and cheerful when we caught sight of Nukara, Duns, and Pauk at last. I did not really feel like I was coming home, but it was like that. I would be able to eat, I had not eaten much before the fight, and to warm myself in front of the fire. Right then it seemed like everything that anybody could ever want. All that counted, but it was not just that. I had been talking to Gilf and Uri and Baki, and even to Org, which was okay, but the voices I heard through the greased skin in the kitchen windows were human, all of them. Sometimes that can make a big difference. Pauk opened the door when I knocked. There you are, sir. Missed you, I did. No, you wasn't. He had seen the ogre behind me. I said, This is Org, Pauk. You're not to harm him. If he misbehaves, tell me. Pauk stood there frozen, with his mouth open. I do not believe he had heard a word I said. Org, this man is Pauk, another servant. He will see to it that you're fed and otherwise cared for. You must do what he says exactly like you would do what I said. Org grunted and looked at Pauk, and Pauk took a couple of steps backward. Maybe I ought to say here that Org did not snarl or anything, ever. He did not smile and he did not frown. His eyes were like two black beads. They looked small in a big face that was mostly mouth. It was not a human face or anything close to that. A dog's face or a horse's face is a lot more human-looking than Org's. I went on into the house, and Org came in behind me. Gilf went around us to lie in front of the fire. Duns and Nukara had been sitting at the table with Pauk, or that was how it seemed. They had stood up probably when Pauk went to the door. Now they looked every bit as out of it as he did. Here's your ghost, I told them. A solid one. Hear the floorboards creak? If you'd like to touch him, go right ahead. 
Duns tried to talk three times before he could say, You fought him? I did, and I didn't like it either. He beat me, and then he surrendered to me. It's kind of a long story, and I'd rather not get into the whole thing just now. Where's Uns? Nakara asked. Where is my son? I don't know. He went with me and helped me, and I was thinking of taking him on to work with Pauk for a while if you wanted. But when Oregon and I fought, he disappeared. Run off? Pauk had recovered himself somewhat. I didn't see him go, so I don't know. If he did, I can't blame him. I felt like running, too. Gilf growled at Org, who seemed not to hear him. I'll have a word with him, Dunce was saying. When he gets home... You don't have to chew him out, I said. He doesn't have it coming. Pauk had drawn his knife. We're going to kill that now, sir. Kill him after he gave up? I shook my head. If you'd been paying attention, you'd know what we're going to do. We're going to take him back to Shearwall with us, and you're going to take care of him. Pauk nodded. We'll do for him there, sir, and have a hundred to help us. They'll do for him, you mean, if we don't stop them, and he'll kill ten or twenty of them first. We've got to find a way to keep that from happening. Ikara gave me bread and cheese and more soup. She found the carcass of a sheep for Org, and had me give it to him. He ate it bones and all, and seemed to be satisfied. After that we left. I kept thinking about my fight with Org, and what I was going to do with him. Pauk probably asked questions, but I doubt that I answered them. Then we topped a hill and saw Shearwall with the full moon behind it, the high square towers crowned with battlements. Later I saw Utgard, which was a whole lot bigger, so big it scared you, and Thor Tower, which was taller and prettier. But sheer wall was sheer wall, and there was nothing else like it, not for me. I think it was a little after midnight by the time we got there. Master Augur had told me the password, even though I told him we should get back before sundown. Now I saw that he had been right. I yelled for the sentries, and when they challenged me, I gave it to them, and they loosed the pall. I had never seen the drawbridge let down before, and wished I could have seen more of it. As it was, about all I saw was the big chain moving and the stone counterweights going up. Shearwall had a good wide moat and a narrow bridge without railings. I was a little scared and cantered across just to look like I was not. When I got to the other side, I called the sentries over so I could talk to them. In another minute, something will come across your bridge that you won't believe, I told them. I'm not going to ask you to promise not to tell anybody about it. If you think it's your duty to report it, you ought to do your duty. I will ask you not to gossip about it. Can I have your word on that? They say I could. Good. Like I said, you can report it if you think you should, but I'm ordering you not to fight it or try to stop it from crossing over. If you do, you'll have to fight me too. Just let it come across, and I'll be responsible for anything it does. The older sentry said, Good enough for us, sir. I sort of grinned at him. You haven't seen it yet. I was about to call to Pauk to tell Org that he could come across when I heard more horses on the bridge. It was Pauk riding his and leading the rest, with Gilf trotting in back to make them keep up. I said, I thought I told you to stay with Org until I yelled. Aye, aye, sir, Pauk let go of the pommel long enough to touch his cap. I'm trying to stay with him, sir. He's in here, sir. In this here bailey, sir. You mean he crossed without me seeing him? No, sir, not over this bridge here, sir. He swam the moat. Pauk was staring around the dim courtyard beyond the portcullis. Then he come around behind like. I see, but I don't see him, do you? Pauk hesitated, afraid of getting me angry. No, sir, not this minute I don't, sir. Only I think I know where he is, sir, and if you want him I'll try to fetch him out. Not now, I turned back to the sentries. I won't report this. You can do whatever you want to. The older one cleared his throat. We're with you, sir, sir. 
Abel of the High Heart. Sir Abel, long as you're with us. I'm on your team, and I'm going to put that servant Pauk should have kept with him in the dungeon. The younger said, That's good, sir. I thought you'd like it. I was grinning again. I'll have to find the head man there and talk to him, I guess. But it can wait till morning. He's probably in bed, and I'd like to be in bed myself. Who should I ask for? Master Casper, sir. He's under Master Augur, sir, and he's chief warder. You know where the marshal's tower is? I'm staying there. Well, sir, you get on the stair in there like you would, only go down instead of up. First door you come to will be his taberna, sir. Thanks. It was not until I got off my horse that I knew how bone-tired I was. Pauk, take them to the stable, all of them, unsaddle them, make sure they get water and oats and clean stalls. Aye, aye, sir. You know where my room is? Pauk nodded. Aye, sir. Good. I wanted to slump, but I knew I must not. I stood very straight instead, with my shoulders back and my chest out. I'll be there as soon as I've seen about Org. Take our bags up there. Everything we had on the boat, and what we got off, sir, whatever it was. If the grooms give you a hard time, tell them it's my order. Aye, aye, sir. The moat stunk, and the filth splashed by my boots was horse piss and droppings, but I did not care. I headed for the darkest corner of the bailey, knowing what I wanted to do, and knowing that after I got it done I could go to bed. I was a woman in a dirty bed in a stuffy little room. An old woman sitting beside my bed kept telling me to push, and I pushed, although I was so tired I could not push hard, no matter how hard I tried. I knew my baby was trying to breathe, and could not breathe, and would soon die. Push! I had tried to save. Now I was only trying to get away. He would not let go, climbing on me, pushing me under water. The moon shone through pouring rain as I made my way down the muddy track. At its end the ogre loomed black and huge. I was the boy who had gone into Desiree's cave, not the man who had come out. My sword was Desiree's grave marker, the short stick tied to the long one with a thong. I pushed the point into the mud to mark my own grave and went on. When the ogre threw me it became such a sword as I wished for, with a golden pommel and a gleaming blade. I floated off the ground and started back for it, but I could no longer breathe. Chapter 42 I Am a Hero I woke up sweating, threw off my blanket, and looked at the window. Gray light was in the sky. Sleeping, I decided, was worse than getting up, and I glued down my choice by pouring water in the cracked wash bowl and scrubbing every part of me I could reach. When I lived with Bold Berthold, we washed by swimming in the Griffin. That had been a lot better, in warm weather anyhow, and I wondered if the Duke got baths half as good. Pauk was snoring on the other side of the door. I could hear each snore clearly, and I thought sure the noise I made washing and getting dressed would wake him up, but it did not. For a minute I wanted to pour my wash water on him, but I carried it to the window and threw it out instead. Then I stuck my head out and looked around. The castle might be called Sheer Wall, but the wall was not really straight up and down. The big, not-quite-square stones were rough, too, and were not set exactly even. I had done a good deal of climbing on the western trader, and now I stuck my boots in my belt, in back, where they would be out of the way, and went over the sill. In one way it was a tough climb, and in another it was not. I kept hitting places where I could not go down any further without sliding, and the wall was steep enough that a slide would not have been much different from a fall by the time I got to the ground. So I would have to give that spot up and go sidewise or back up and try someplace else. But it was good hard exercise, and there was never a time when I really thought I was going to fall. Taug climbed around on the wall of Utgard once, pretty much like I did that morning on the Marshal's Tower, and when he told me about it, it reminded me of this. Only there were vines, some kind of ivy on Utgard. I will write about that when I get to it. 
Once I was on the ground, the smell of bread baking steered me to the kitchen without a lot of side trips. I was good and hungry, and that helped. You're not supposed to be in here, sir, a cook told me. Breakfast in the hall when you hear the horn. When I did not say anything, he added, Fresh ham today, sir, and cheese with it. Bread and butter and small beer. I knew because I had eaten there twice the day before. How about eggs? Have you got any? What about apples? He shook his head. No, sir, we do the best we can, sir. That's good. I patted his shoulder. Since you do, you won't mind if I take this. It was hot loaf. Good heavy bread with a lot of barley and spelt in it. A nice lady fixed a swell supper for me last night, I explained to the cook, but I knew I was going to have to fight, and I didn't want to eat a lot and slow myself down. You don't mind? No, sir. His face showed he did. Not at all, sir. Good. Come out into the hall for a minute. I have more bread to... Seeing the way I was looking at him, he hurried out. The hall was a lot bigger than the kitchen, maybe a hundred paces long and fifty wide. There was a dais for Duke Martyr and his wife and special company. For the rest of us, long tables of bare wood, benches and stools. Some serving women were setting places for breakfast, a greasy trencher and a flagon for everybody. I said, Master Casper eats here, doesn't he? Where does he sit? I work in the kitchen, the cook said. I have no way of knowing, but Maud Good could probably tell you. I let him go. I bet you're right. She will, too. We're old buddies. She bowed woman fashion. I'm glad you're so much better, Sir Abel. So am I. I turned to the cook. You've got more bread to bake. Get to work. Maud Gouda showed me where Master Casper sat. He had a chair. That proved something, although I was not sure what. I sat down in it to eat my bread and told Maud Gouda to fetch a flagon of beer. He... He'll be angry, Sir Abel. Master Casper will. She looked about ready to die. Not at you, and not at me, because I'll get up as soon as he comes and let him sit down. I just want to be sure I don't miss him. By that time, a few people were straggling into the hall. I tried to guess which ones might be warders and work in the dungeon. Madguda was short enough, and I was big enough, that she did not have to bend down to whisper in my ear. Everybody's afraid of him, sir, even you knights. I had a mouthful, which gave me a good chance to think before I said anything. Everybody can't be, I said when I had swallowed and had a sip of beer. I'm not, so how could it be everybody? He's the master of the dungeon, sir. You wouldn't want to go there, sir, but if you— I shook my head. That's exactly what I do want. I was down there last night, but I had no flashlight, no torch, I mean— and couldn't see much. I'd like to go again and have Master Casper show me around. That's one of the favors I'm going to ask him for. Right then, somebody in back of me said, Ask who for? It was a big guy who liked black. I asked if he was Casper, and he nodded. Matguda had run while I was turning. I got out of his chair and held out my hand. I'm Sir Abel of the High Heart. He said, Huh. I just sat here so I wouldn't miss you when you came to breakfast. I've got something to talk to you about, and I thought it might be a good idea to do it while we ate. Say it now. He sat down hard. I eat with my men, not with you. There were half a dozen warders in black clothes around us by that time, some pulling out stools and sitting on them, and some just standing there to listen in. I began, Okay, I'll go to your dungeon. Most do. The one sitting next to Casper laughed, and it was not just some guy laughing at the boss's joke. Everything he was planning to do to me some fine day was in that laugh of his. I knocked him off his stool, and when he started to get back up, I picked it up and hit him with it. The whole place got very quiet, fast. Somebody had set a platter of fresh ham in front of Casper. I pulled it over and took a piece and got my bread, and ate a little of that, too. You're the fellow that crippled all the other nights, Casper said. Three or four, maybe five, that's all. I picked up my flagon and took a drink. 
He nodded. Pass the pork. I did. It would be better if you were to say, Pass the pork, please, Sir Abel, but I'll overlook it this time. He grunted. I want us to be friends, Master Casper. A servant of mine is staying with you, and I'd like you to take good care of him. He turned to look at me, still chewing ham. So I thought Waddit had come over while I was talking, and he broke in then. Fighting in the great hall is forbidden. Master Augur wants to see you after breakfast. I'll be happy to talk to him, I said, but we weren't fighting. We're talking about a private matter. Waddit squatted to check out the warder on the floor, feel for a pulse, and so on. What about this? Oh, him. I don't think he's hurt very much. If I'd hit him hard, I would have killed him, but I didn't. Waddit got up. You'd better see Master Augur as soon as you leave here. Otherwise, he shrugged. Casper said, Otherwise you're mine. I'd rather see the Duke, I told Waddit, but since Master Augur wants to see me okay, tell him it will be a pleasure. You want to come with me? I'll make a place for you at the table where we knights eat. I know where it is, but I've got to talk with Master Casper just now, and then Master Augur after that. Waddit went back to the knight's table, and somebody a couple of tables over started talking a little bit too loud, and pretty soon everybody was talking and eating like they always did. Madguda brought a round of cheese on a big trencher, and I got out my dagger and cut a slice. I have always liked ham and cheese, even if we had been getting it just about every meal. We brand our prisoners sometimes, Casper said. It depends on what the Duke wants, troublemakers, thieves. You ever been branded? I was chewing, but I shook my head. I have. He pushed back his hood so I could see the brand on his forehead. I didn't like it. I swallowed. Nobody likes a headache. We get them just the same. Casper chuckled. He had a mean chuckle. You say you've got a fresh prisoner for me? I thought about a friend of mine who had gone away to boarding school, and I said, More of a boarder. You don't have to lock him up, but he'll be living with you until I go north to take a stand at some bridge or something. He'll be living with us. Yeah, I nodded. I know you must feed your prisoners. They'd starve to death if you didn't and they don't eat in here. All you've got to do is set out a plate of food for the servant of mine. I stopped to think about some things Uns had said. Every other day might be enough. Just leave it out where he can find it, and if he hasn't eaten it in a couple of days, try someplace else. I ain't going to have people running around loose in my dungeon. Casper sounded like his mind was made up. He's there already. All you've got to do is feed him. Casper's face got red, and his eyes got small. I put him in there last night, and I told him to stay there. He promised he would, and as long as he gets enough to eat, I think he will. I had been hoping Casper would relax a little after that, but he did not. You might find droppings, I guess, but in a dungeon that shouldn't matter. Casper wiped his dagger on his sleeve and stuck it back in the scabbard. He's there right now. That's right. I was glad he was finally getting it. I put him down there last night. You were asleep, and I didn't want to wake you up. A friend unbarred your door for me and barred it again after I left. I tried to remember whether I had really heard Uri put the bar back. I could not be certain, so I said, or anyway, I told her to. I'm pretty sure she must have done it. This is a different friend, Casper said slowly. This isn't the one you left for me to wet nurse. Right. The man I had knocked down was getting back on his feet and going for a big knife on his belt. I caught his wrist. If you draw that, I'll have to take it away from you. You'd better sit down and eat something before all the cheese is gone. Casper stood up when the man was sitting down. You might get to know Hob better before long. That's good, I said. I'd like to patch things up if I can. Meanwhile, you'll take care of my servant, won't you? 
I know I'm asking a favor. He turned and stalked out of the great hall. Master Augur was standing with his back to the window when I came in. He nodded, cleared his throat, waited as though he were going to talk, then cleared it again. Good morrow, Sir Abel. Good morning, Master Augur. What is it? They had told me to stand up straight the first time I had been there, and I was careful to do it again. Sir Abel, I... I said, yes, Master Augur? Augur sighed. I cannot conduct our conversation like this. Please sit down. He motioned toward a chair. Bring that over here, please. He sat in his usual chair behind stacks of reports and ledgers. I carried the chair over and sat. Fighting in the Great Hall is strictly contrary to His Grace's command. Did you know that? I nodded. Yes, I do. I did. Yet you struck one of the warders with a stool. That is what has been reported to me. I didn't see it myself. With my fist first, Master Abel, with the stool when he started to get up. Hugger nodded. I do not believe I ever saw him looking cheerful, and he certainly did not look cheerful then. Why did you do that, Sir Abel? Because I had to talk to Master Casper. I knew if I let that warder get up, he would interrupt us. What I had to say was hard enough without having to tell him to put a cork in it all the time. I took a deep breath, feeling like I was going to make things worse, but that I had to do it. Let me say this, and then you can say anything you want. I'm not going to try to defend what I did, but I don't think it was wrong. Sometimes you've got to make an exception, no matter what the rule says. You're going to punish me for it. I know that, and it's okay with me. I'm not blaming you. I apologize for raising a ruckus and giving you trouble, but if the same thing happened again, I'd knock him down again just like I did. Augur nodded. Nothing in his face had changed. For those of less than knightly rank, such as I am myself, the customary punishment is dismissal. For knights, it is banishment for a period of months or years. Fine. I've been wanting to go north anyway. How long should I stay gone? Augur rose and went to his window, where he stood looking out for so long that I began to think he was waiting for me to leave. When he finally sat back down, he said, There have been fights in the Great Hall before, but they were simple matters. This case is fraught with complexities. In the first place, Sir Abel, a few of our knights still maintain that you are not one of them. You must be aware of that. I said I was. They resent your eating at their table. If I punish you as a knight, they will resent that still more. Don't look like that, please. I'm not going to dismiss you like a servant. I feel that I've proved myself. So do I. So does His Grace. I'm simply saying that if I give you knightly punishment, the resentment will be that much greater. There will be none from me, Master Augur. You need not fear my resentment. I fear no man's resentment in any case, Augur told me, but it is my duty to maintain order among you knights, to do that and a great many other things, he sucked his teeth. That is the first complication. The second is that when these fights have erupted in the past, they have most often been between knight and knight. I can recall one in which two menials fought. That is the sole exception. I dismissed them both, but I've given my word that I will not dismiss you like a menial, Sir Abel, and I won't. Yet if I banish you, the knights will be up in arms, some because you received a knight's punishment, or the rest because a knight was banished for striking an insolent churl. They will protest to his grace at the very least. I will not. I said. No, I realize that. But there are seasoned knights here of whom his grace thinks highly. Should they join the protest, and they may... Augur shrugged. I'm very sorry this happened, I told him. I really mean that. Thank you. Lastly, but by no means least, the warders are hated and feared, not merely by all the knights, but by everyone. 
I don't want to offend your evident modesty, but I feel quite certain that you are regarded as a hero by nine-tenths of those who know of what took place this morning. I am a hero, I told him. I don't mean for knocking a warder down. That was nothing. He smiled a little bitterly. Perhaps you're correct, Sir Abel. In fact, I believe you are. But now that I've outlined the difficulties, I'd like to hear everything you have to say in your defense. If you've a speech in you, this is the time to give it. I don't. I thought about what had happened and how nobody on the Western trader would have cared. I know you won't pay much attention to this, Master Augur, but it really wasn't fighting. I hit him with my fist and afterward with the stool, but I wasn't really fighting him because he never fought me. Go on. I hit him because he was going to threaten me and keep on threatening me until I did. His grace's ban on fighting is a good idea when everybody acts decently. Is it really worse to have a fight now and then than to have people like him people who like to hurt other people when they can't fight back, spitting in somebody's face while he's trying to talk to somebody else. I take your point, Master Augur said. Anything else? I shook my head. Then I have something else, Sir Abel. Before I begin, let me say that I like you. I would be your friend insofar as my office permits. I would like you to be mine. I am, I told him. I know you've done a lot for me. I owe you. I locked away your weapons after the fight in the practice yard, your bow and quiver, and that, that false sword you're wearing now. I had to, or they would have been taken. His grace told me to return them whenever you asked for them. You may recall it. I waited, sure I knew it was coming. Yesterday it struck me that you had never asked, and I went to look for them, intending to have a page take them to you. They were gone. Today I see that you are wearing your sword belt. I take it you have your bow back as well, and the arrows, because I no longer have them. They're up in my room, I winced a little, remembering the dreams my bowstring had given me the night before. Can you tell me how you got them? I shook my head. We'd only fight because you wouldn't believe me. Try me, Sir Abel. I'd like to know how you got into my cupboards. Do you believe that I was knighted by Queen Desiree? Augur did not answer. Somebody was running outside, and we both heard him at once. He was heavy and running pretty badly, because the footsteps were not regular. We heard him stop at the door and gasp for breath. The sentry will send him away, whoever he is, Augur said. But the sentry did not. Before Augur had finished what he was saying, the big oak door banged back and Casper stumbled in and fell down at my feet. Chapter 43 The Warway Out of all our long trip north, the night I remember best was the one on which we separated. Svan took care of the horses, making Pauk do most of the actual work, but watching to see that it was done right. Gilf had gone hunting, and I sat at our fire, looking into the flames and thinking of Sir Ravd, of Muspel, and of nights at our cabin in the woods. How you and I had gathered sticks, building a big fire in the little stone fireplace, and roasting weenies and marshmallows. And wondering, to tell you the truth, how the heck I had gotten from there to where I was now. Augur had told me that if I hurried and had good luck, I could be in the mountains in six weeks. When he said it, it had not seemed possible that it was going to take that long. We had met in a big, pleasant room in the Duke's private quarters, we being Augur, Casper, the Duke himself, and me. I would have liked to have Hob there, too, and in a way he was, because he was what the rest of us were thinking about. Org had killed and eaten him. This pet of yours, Martyr said to me, this ogre you put into my dungeon is the least of our troubles. So let us deal with it first. Can you send it away? To send him away would be to doom him, Your Grace, I had argued the whole thing out with Augur already, 
before we went in to see Martyr. You're going to say that he should be killed, and so is Master Augur, Master Casper too. All right, maybe the three of you are right, but I've accepted him into my service. I can't send him out to die. Martyr fingered his beard, and Augur tried to pretend that none of this had anything to do with him. Finally Casper said, We got to get it out of there, your grace. Get it up in the bailey where the knights can get at it. Martyr shrugged. I had never seen him look so tired and old. Sir Abel will not order it out of the dungeon, knowing that he would be sending it to its death. I can send knights into the dungeon and have them kill it there. Casper shook his head. No way. But I could not guarantee their success. From what you say, they might not even be able to find it. Augur repeated something he had said already rephrasing it. If this ogre is Sir Abel's servant, Sir Abel should have given it the strictest instructions, emphasizing that his protection would be lifted if it disobeyed. I ordered Org not to hurt anybody, I said, and he promised he wouldn't. I think he must have heard that I'd hit Hob. He must have thought Hob was my enemy and it would be okay. Martyr nodded, I suppose mostly to himself. Hob would have been if Hob had lived. Everyone in your castle is afraid of the warders, your grace, except me and you. I don't know what's behind all that, but it's got to be more than ugly faces and black clothes. If I go down in your dungeon, Master Casper and his men will do everything they can think of to see I never come out. I know that. But if you want me to... Your grace, Casper had jumped up. I swear he... Sir Abel, don't... Martyr shut him up by moving his hand about an inch. I said, I'll go anyway if you tell me to, and I'll make it clear to Org that he shouldn't kill anybody else, not even Master Casper. Martyr hid his mouth behind his hand, but I saw his mustache twitch. Only I've got a better plan, if I can just get you to agree to it. This will solve all the problems we've been talking about. It gets Org out of your dungeon, and it will be my punishment too, one none of your knights can resent or argue about. Martyr sighed. It will get you killed, you mean. The more I see and hear of you, Sir Abel, the more reluctant I am to lose you. I hope not, Your Grace. You were going to send me out to make my stand. We talked about that outside my room. He nodded. I recall it. Then you remember you said you might send me to fight the Angerborn. Do it. Do it now. I don't know exactly how they go when they come into your duchy, Augur said. I'll draw you a map of the warway. He did that too afterward. I nodded to show I had heard Augur. But there can't be a lot of roads through the mountains. Let me take my stand some place they have to go through. I'll take Org along, and I'll stay there until snow blocks the passes. We talked about that for a while. Martyr, saying that as long as I did not come back before there was ice in the bay, he would take my word that I had not left until the passes were closed. Augur sent Casper for a page, then sent the page to that armorer back in Forsetti to tell him he had to hurry up with all my work. Then Martyr said, There is another difficulty whose solution I see in this, Sir Abel. That was Svan. I remember looking up from the fire that night to get a good look at him, and seeing he was asleep and that Gilf had laid a dead hare pretty close to his head. I got it and skinned it, and stuck one haunch on a long stick, the way you do, and held it over the fire. It was getting brown when Svan sat up. Are you going to eat all of that, Sir Abel? I held up the rest. There's more here. Take whatever you want. Good of you. We've been on short commons, eh? I reminded him that he had bought extra food for himself when we had stopped at inns or in villages. It was easy, too easy, to tell you the truth, to get mad at Svan. Maybe it was even as easy for us to be mad at him as it was for him to be mad at us. When I thought about it, I understood him well enough. He was still a squire when there were a lot of knights younger than he was. I was one of those myself. He went off to cut a stick. 
When he came back, he put the other haunch over the fire, too. I could eat it raw like your monster, Sir Abel, but I'm a man, so I'll try to soften it up. I stayed quiet, knowing he was trying to get me mad. Your ogre, I ought to have said, I don't like him. I had another look at my meat and turned the stick. I had a nice nap until I smelled this rabbit. Have you slept at all? I said no. Because you're afraid to sleep without your dog and your monster to guard you? Isn't that right? You're afraid I might stab you? I've been stabbed before, I told him. His lips tightened. Not by me. No. Allow me to tell you something, Sir Abel. I know you won't credit it, but I'd like to say it whether you credit it or not. I won't stab you, not while you sleep at any rate. But your pet ogre will turn on you some day, asleep or awake. Would you defend me if he did? How am I to take that? Am I to say yes, so you'll have something good to say of me when we return? I shook my head. You're supposed to take it seriously, that's all, and answer it honestly, even if it's just to yourself. I was trying to get the meat I had been cooking off the stick without burning my fingers. When I did, I took a bite. It was hot enough to burn my tongue, and tough, too. It tasted wonderful. You always tell the truth, correct? My mouth was full, but I shook my head. You know, you try to give that impression, he pointed his forefinger at me. That impression itself is a lie, I chewed some more and swallowed. Sure, since you're awake now, go see to the horses. He ignored it. You told His Grace that you had guided Sir Ravd and me in the forests above Ringsmouth. Another lie. The scream of some animal made us both jump up. Svan took a deep breath and grinned at me. Your pets killed somebody else. I walked around the fire and knocked him sprawling. He may have touched Pauk when he fell, because Pauk sat up. He stared at Svan, blinking and rubbing his eyes. I picked up the stick Svan had dropped and passed it to him. Here, the meat's got ashes on it, but they won't hurt you. After that, I went over to where our baggage was piled and got my bow and quiver. Svan sat up. Maybe he thought I had gone. I had found out already that I could be hard to see sometimes ever since Baki. He fingered the back of his jaw and the side of his neck, which was where I hit him. At it coming, Pauk told him. Svan said, I ought to cut off his baseborn head, and I stepped back a little farther. I did not want to kill him, and I knew that if he saw me I might have to. Pauk had been looking at the meat I had given him. He decided it needed more cooking, and held it over the fire. Wouldn't try, not if I was you, sir. I am a gentleman, and gentlemen avenge any wrongs they suffer, Svan said stiffly. Had it coming, Pauk repeated, so it ain't wrong. You couldn't know you were asleep. I turned to go. Behind me I heard Pauk say, I knows him, sir, and I knows you. I'll kill him. Very faintly. If I thought you meant it, sir, I'd kill you meself. Chapter 44 Michael if I had known where I was going when I walked away from the fire, I would tell you. The truth is that I did not have any idea. I wanted to get away from Svan, and I wanted to get away from Org. That was all there was to it. I wanted to find a place where I could rest and get my head straight before I had to deal with them again. I could have built a fire where I stopped, but working in the dark it would have taken a long time. I was tired, and it was not really very cold at all then, even at night. I suppose it was about the end of June or early July, but I do not know. Anyway, I just closed my cloak around me the way you do and lay down. I did not even take off my boots, something I heard about from Uri and Baki later. They found me while I was lying there asleep, and so did Gilf, who went back to our fire and tracked me by scent. All three stayed around to protect me. I am not sure from what. When I woke up, the sun was high and bright. As soon as I was awake, Gil flicked my face. 
He had been waiting his chance, and it was something he did only when he thought I needed bucking up. I kind of grinned and told him I was okay, and when he did not say anything back to me, I knew somebody else was around. Baki waved from a shadow when she saw I was looking her way, and Uri waved from under the same tree. We fear that you might come to harm, Lord. All three of us were afraid for you. Thanks. I stood up and looked around for a stream, hoping I could get a drink and splash some water on my face, and maybe even take off my clothes and take a sponge bath after they had gone. There was not any, so I asked where I could find Pauk and Svan. I do not know where they are now, Lord, Uri said, but Baki and I will search for them if you wish us to. Baki said, Gilf might know, but he shook his head. Uri drifted toward me, a pretty girl about as slender as girls get, dark red but transparent in the sunshine. Think of a naked, coppery red girl in a stained glass window. Why did you go into this forest alone and by night? Surely that was foolish? It would have been foolish to stay where I was. Is there any water around here? No, Uri told me. Not for a league or more. But Gilf nodded. You had water where you camped, Bucky pointed out. It was in your water bottles. If I had stayed there, Svan and I would have fought, I explained. Besides, I knew Org had killed, and I wanted to see what it was. Baki said, Oh, we can tell you that. It was a mule, Uri said. A woman came up the road on a mule, and Org rushed at it. I do not think he was going to kill her. Baki added, But she thought he was. The mule reared and threw her, then Org got it. That was what you heard. He ate it, too. A lot of it, anyway. I thought that over. The woman escaped? Yes. A cloud passed between us and the sun just then, and Baki came forward, very real. She had a sword, but she ran just the same. I cannot blame her for it. Who would want to fight Org in the dark? I would, I said, or at least I did. Maybe I'll want to again some day. I don't suppose you know where he is right now. Both shook their heads. Then find him for me, or find Svan and Pauk. When you've found somebody, come back and tell me. They faded to nothing. You said you knew where to find water, I told Gilf. Is it very far? He shook his head. A nice pool. Please lead me to it. He nodded and trotted away, looking over his shoulder the way dogs do to see if I was coming. I had to trot, too, to keep up. Nobody else is around, are they? You can talk? I did. Did Uri or Baki know about this water of yours, too? Uh-huh. But they wouldn't tell me. It can't have been because they wanted me to die of thirst. This is a forest, not a desert, so it can't be very hard to find water. Why didn't they want me to know about this water of yours? A god's there. That stopped me dead for a minute. Parka was the first thing I thought of, then Thunor. He was one of the overkinds that people talked about a lot. Nobody calls the overkinds gods, I told Gilf. Nobody around here, anyhow. Was this Parka? Do you know who Parka is? He did not answer, and by that time he was almost out of sight. I took off after him, running as hard as I could, but I never caught up until he got to the pool and stopped. I looked for a god then, but I did not see one, so I knelt down and washed my hands and my face. I was sweating a lot, and had a good long drink. After that, I splashed more water on my face and spooned some up with my hands and poured it over my head, and while I was doing that, the sun came out again. Sunlight turned the drops that rained from my fingertips to diamonds and struck deep into the pool. At the bottom, way, way down, I could see Uri and Baki. They were in a room that seemed to be about the size of an airport. It had swords and spears and axes all over the walls and in stands and long racks, so that you saw the gleam of steel everywhere you looked. They were talking to something big and dark that writhed like a snake. Uri turned back into a chimera while I was watching. 
Soon it faded out. The sun was still bright, but was not shining straight down any more, or that is what I think. As soon as it was gone, a cloud came, or what seemed like one, and Gilf said, The gods here. He got excited sometimes, and he sounded excited then, but quiet and polite, too. I looked up, and there was no cloud. It was a wing, so white it glowed, and a lot bigger than the western trader's biggest sail. It was coming from the back of a man in armor sitting at the edge of the pool. I could not believe that the wings, there were four, really belonged to him. Just by looking at me, he knew that I could not, so he folded them around him. When he did it, you could not see his armor. He looked like he was wearing a long robe of white feathers. He said, I, too, have been sent away. You, too? I was so surprised, I really did not know what I was saying. I've been banished from Duke Martyr's Court until there's ice in the bay. Thus I come to you. He sounded like he knew all about it. My jaw dropped so far it almost hit the buckle of my sword belt. I do not, yet I know you better than your mother ever could, because I hear your thought. He raised his right hand. Later I got to know King Arnthor, and he would have loved to be able to raise his hand like that, but he could not. No human can. Your mother never knew you, he said. I, who know so little, know that now. I make mistakes, you see. I am near perfection. I was on my knees with my head down by then. You have my thanks, he said, but you must stand. I have not come for your worship, but to your aid. I, too, am a knight in service to a lord. My name is Michael. All I could think of when he said that was that it was a name from our world. It seemed like a miracle then. It still does. He had a name from Earth, and he had come to Mythgarther to help me. By putting my knowledge at your disposal. I was so happy I could not think of anything to say. I stood up, remembering that he had told me to, and stared at him while he looked at me. There was no white to his eyes, and no black dot in the middle. It was like I was looking right through his head at sky. You think of sky of the third world. You believe I have been dispatched from the castle you see there. It was not easy to nod, but I did. I... I hope so. I have not. I am of the second world, called Cleos. The world of fair report. I didn't even know the name of it, my lord. I just about choked, realizing that I was talking to him the way I had to Thunrolf. I... I'd like to get to that castle if I could. Is that wrong? It is a higher ambition than most. Can you... I remembered Ravd and knew I was putting my foot in it. Will you tell me how? Michael studied me again. It seemed to take a long time. Finally he said, You know the rudiments of the lance? I nodded, too scared to speak. You have been taught by one skilled with it? Michael snapped his fingers, and Gilf came over and lay down at his feet, looking very proud. Yes, I said, by Master Thopi. He was wounded too badly to practice with me, but he could tell me things— and one of his helpers would joust with me. That made Michael smile. It was such a little smile that I could hardly see it, but it seemed like it made the sun brighter. It does not trouble you that your dog prefers me to you? No, I said. I prefer you to me, too. I understand. Master Thopi is skillful with the lands, but he will never reach the castle of which we are speaking— what lies beyond skill? I started to say something dumb, then I stopped. I do not even remember what it was. When you know, you will go there, not before. Have you more questions? Ask now, I must soon depart. How can I find Queen Desiree? There was no smile at that. Pray, rather, that she does not find you. I felt like I had been kicked. Very well. I myself am less than perfect, as I have learned at cost. 
Learn to summon her or any of them, and she must come to you. Uri and Baki come sometimes when I call them, I told him. Is that what you mean? No, Michael stroked Gelf's head. You must call her or any of them as those you call overkinds would call you. Will you teach me? Michael shook his head. I cannot. No one can. Teach yourself. So it is with everything. He closed his eyes, and a one-eyed man with a spear came out of the trees, knelt and laid his spear on the ground at Michael's feet. Gilf fawned on this one-eyed man. Then he was gone, and the spear too. You see, how could I or anyone teach that? I looked around at the bright pool and the sunlit glade. I was really looking for the one-eyed man. Okay, for the Valfather, because that is who it was. But even then I knew I never could forget them. That was right enough. Later, when I forgot about everything, even desiree for a while, I still remembered them. If you have no more questions, Sir Abel, I will go. I have more, Sir Michael. It was terribly hard to say that. May I ask them? Three more, if... If that is not too many, ask. One time I was on, on a certain island, the island where Bluestone Castle used to be, he nodded. And I saw a knight there for just a moment, a knight with a black dragon on his shield. Did I call him the way you called the Volfather? He called you, Michael stood. His wings opened a little, and I could see the gleam under the white glow. I said, Can you fly in mail? Something that was not very far from a laugh showed in his sky-colored eyes. That was not your second question? No, I was going to ask who the knight I saw was. Yes, I can. But I have come here to descend, not to fly. As for the knight you saw... I tell you that there was no one on that island, save yourself. I don't understand that at all. Your third question is the wisest. Things always fall out so. Ask it. It was what question I should ask. The smile returned. You should ask whence came the tongs that grasped eternity. Notice, please, that I did not say I would answer you. Farewell, I go to Aelfris, to seek that far-famed knight, Sir Abel of the High Heart. With that, Michael walked over the water to the middle of the pool and sank out of sight. Chapter 45 The Cottage in the Forest I spent the rest of that day doing something I had never done before, something I would have sworn on a stack of Bibles that I would never do. I had seen a stone table at Shearwall where they sacrificed before a war or battle, and I built one as much like it as I could beside that pool, carrying stones all day while Gilf hunted, and fitting them together sort of like a puzzle. I got it finished just before dark. Next morning I collected a lot of dead wood, enough for a really big fire. That was a lot easier than the stones had been. I could break most of the pieces I found over my knee, and if I could not, I laid them down so that they could not move when I hit them, and whacked them with sword-breaker. Then Gelf and I went hunting together. He had brought in a partridge and a marmot the day before, but we were after something big for the sacrifice. Just about the time the sun touched the treetops, we got a real nice elk. No antlers, of course, at that time of year, but it was a big bull just the same. If it had been in antler, they would have been good ones. I saw it on a ridge about two hundred yards away. My bowstring had about driven me crazy the night before, giving me other people's dreams, and I had been thinking of throwing it away. When I saw the elk, I got glad I had it very fast. My arrow flew like lightning, catching the elk in back of the shoulder about halfway down. It ran like the wind at first, but Gilf got out in front and turned it, heading it back toward our table until it fell the last time. I am big, thanks to Desiree, and lots of people have told me how strong I am, but I was not strong enough to carry that elk. I had to drag it, with Gilf pulling with his teeth over the tough parts. 
Finally, I gave up. I told Gelf we couldn't do it, and we would have to take part to eat and leave the rest. Then he got big and black, and picked up the elk like a rabbit, and carried it for me. The funny thing was that I could tell, even when he was big like that, that he was afraid I would be mad. I was not. Scared, sure, but not mad. We got the elk up on the wood on the table and covered it with more wood. Then we praised the gods of Cleos, both of us, and I set the wood on fire. It was only Gelfin to me, but I had never felt as good about anything as I did that night. When I finally got to sleep, it was the same thing it had been the night before. I was somebody, then somebody different, and then somebody new. Sometime I was back with you and Jerry, only all of us were older. To tell the truth, I was glad when Uri woke me up. I knew I should be mad, but I could not hack it. She said, You spoke while you slept, Lord. I thought this best. I told her yes, I had been a little girl that they were going to operate on, only I knew the anesthetic would not work on me and I would feel everything. Okay, what is it? Baki bowed. We have done as you bid us, Lord. Uri nodded. I have found your servant Svan and Baki, your servant Pauk. I said that was swell and I would go in the morning. To your servant Svan, Lord, or to your servant Pauk? They're separated? Even so, Baki pointed. Your servant Pauk is two days' ride north along the road we followed until you went alone into this forest, Lord. I knew I was going to have to leave the pool, I had known that all along, but I did not like it. Where's Org? I asked. Uri said, Your servant Org is with Svan Lord. I see. Master Augur gave me a charger, a chestnut stallion called Magnice. Where is he? Baki said, I know him well, Lord. He is with your servant Pauk, Lord. All the horses are. Then I had better go to Pauk first. Which way to the road? Will I find him if I follow it north? I cannot say, Lord. He will travel the faster, I believe. But no doubt he will halt when he reaches the mountains. He'll halt a lot sooner than that, I said, if you tell him to. Find him again and tell him I said for him to turn back south. Both shook their heads. He will not believe us, Uri declared. He has not seen us and will in no way trust us. Baki said, He will chant spells against us that may well destroy us, Lord. Will you send us to our deaths? I laughed. Are you telling me that Pauk, Pauk of all people, knows spells that will work against you, Elf? Uri looked around to make certain no one was listening, and spoke in a guilty whisper. He is ignorant, Lord, and ignorant people are dangerous. They credit their spells. Baki added, He is of the old gods, Lord, even as you. His kind has not forgotten. You've got to obey us. It was a new thought for me. Yes, Lord, even if we have fed you, we must, as you obey the overkinds, Lord. That was a barbed remark, if there ever was one. We obeyed the overkinds mostly, only when we were afraid we could not get away with not obeying. I had been here long enough to see quite a lot of that. The upshot was that I told them to go south and stay in Mythgarther with Svan and Org while Gilf and I went after Pauk and the horses. Then I went back to sleep and slept like a baby. While we were tramping through the woods next morning, Gilf wanted to know how it was that Pauk got all the horses. He and Svan fought, I said, and Pauk won. He let Svan keep his money and his weapons, but he took the horses, Svan's included, and the camping gear. No sword. I shook my head. Right, Pauk doesn't have one. But there's a woman with him. That's what Uri and Baki said, and she's got a sword. She had the point at Svan's neck after Pauk knocked him down. That's what they said. I stopped for a minute to think about that, and then I said, I believe she must be the woman who had the mule that Orgate. Gilf grunted. Why's she here? Uri and Baki didn't know, or if they did, they weren't telling. 
Gilf did not ask about the things I had seen when I had looked into the pool. I do not believe he had seen them, and I had not told him about them. I asked Uri and Baki, though, and they had admitted the dark thing I had seen was cedar, calling him Garseg to make him sound less threatening. He was a new god, they said, and they had to obey. We reached the warway a little after noon, and walked up it all afternoon without seeing anybody, and camped beside it that night. About the time sunrise should have come, it started to rain, and the rain woke me up fast. I was cold. It was the first time I had been cold in quite a while, and wet and shaking, and hungry with nothing to eat, and gilf gone. I piled sticks on our fire and cussed the smoke and tried to get as warm and dry as I could for quite a while. Finally it got lighter. I put out the fire and went off down the road in the rain, knowing Gilf would catch up. Which he did after two or three hours. But the weather got worse and worse. It rained all the time, sometimes a little and sometimes a lot. The rain washed away the smells of the animals, so Gilf could not catch anything. After days of that, I stopped being hungry and started getting weak, and I knew we had to hold up and hunt, and get something too, or we would die. The next day we did, a young aurochs, the first I had ever seen. Gilf pinned him, and I ran up and stabbed him in the neck with my dagger. They look a little like a bull and a little like a buffalo. The place where he died was about as bad as it could possibly be, a thicket at the bottom of a steep little hollow. I could have asked Gilf to carry the aurochs like he had the elk, but I did not. I hacked off a haunch and carried it to the place where it might be possible for us to build a fire if we were really, really lucky. That haunch probably weighed about a hundred pounds, or maybe a hundred and fifty, but it felt like two tons by the time we found the place and I finally set it down. We built our fire and ate as much as we could hold, and listened to the wolves fighting over the rest. A storm got me up the next morning, a real howler with driving rain and thunder walking from hill to hill. Trying to make a joke, I told Gilf I was afraid Mythgarther was going to be dismasted. Like home, he said. Our fire was out, but his eyes glowed crimson every time the lightning flashed. I said, what do you mean home? We never lived any place with weather as bad as this. My mother, my brothers my sisters, too. I wanted to know where it was, but he stopped talking. All right, I knew he meant Sky, but I wanted him to talk about it. He never would say much about Sky. We sat out the whole day, waiting for the rain to stop, and when it got dark I heard them. I think that was the only time I ever did until I got to Sky myself. I heard the baying of a thousand hounds like Gilf, and the drumming of the hooves as the Valfather's wild hunt swept across the sky. Gilf wanted to follow them, but I would not let him. The weather was a little better the next day, but we could not find the warway again. I knew we had turned west when we had left it to hunt, so we tried to walk east or northeast, but you could not see the sun, so a lot of it was guesswork. Then, too, there were about a hundred things in that forest to make us go south instead, or north, or even west. Thickets, tangles of briars, creeks high and fast with rain water, and gulches. Finally we hit a pretty good path and decided to follow it as long as it was not clearly going wrong. It ended at the door of a stone cottage that looked like it had been empty for years. Half the roof had fallen in. The shutters had fallen off or been blown off and were rotting in the grass and weeds. The door was open, hanging by one hinge. Nobody lives here, I told Gilf. Let's stop and build the fire and hunt around for something to eat. Maybe we can get dry tonight. Path, he said. You're right, somebody made the path, but he doesn't live here, he couldn't. Probably he just comes around sometimes to look at it. I had no idea what for, but Gilf did not ask me. Knock, he told me when I got to the doorway. It seemed silly, but I did, tapping on the ruined door with the pommel of my dagger. There was no welcome and no challenge from inside. I knocked harder to show my heart was in it and called, Hello? Hello? 
Gilf had been sniffing. He said, Cat. I looked around, surprised. What? Stinks. Cat's in there. I stepped inside and said, So am I. Gilf came in after me, and a big black cat at the far end of the room hissed loud enough to scare you and ran up the wall into the loft. The fireplace was full of dead ashes, but there were a couple of dry logs beside it, and some dry leaves and sticks in the kindling box. I stood one log on end and hit it with swordbreaker hard enough to split it. Good one, Gilf growled, and right when he said it, it seemed like somebody else said, Food. I looked around, but I did not see anyone. I arranged the wood in the kindling and got everything to burning good with my flint and fire steel. We had a little meat left from the aurochs. I got it all out and laid it on the hearth. Take whatever you want, I told Gilf, as long as you leave a couple pieces for me. After that, I went out into the rain again to cut a green stick. Chapter 46 Money Cutting a stick probably did not take me very long, but standing out there in the rain and the cold when I knew there was a fire in the cottage, it seemed like forever. I got one and ran back in, and it seemed to me I could hear somebody talking that shut up as soon as I came through the door. Two of the pieces of meat I had laid on the hearth were gone. I picked up one of the others and put it on my stick and held it over the fire, trying to dry myself at the same time. Gilf came over and lay down, and I said, Who were you talking to? He shook his head and went over to the dry corner and lay down there. You know, I said, sometimes I wish you were just a regular dog that couldn't talk. If you were, I'd never be mad at you for not talking, like now. You know there's somebody else in here with us, and I know it too, only you won't tell me. He did not say anything. I would have been surprised if he had. When my meat was about done, I said, I know there's somebody in here. I'm a knight, and my word means a lot to me. Whoever you are, I don't want to hurt you. If you'd like this nice piece I barbecued, just come out and say hello, and I'll give it to you. Nothing. I looked around carefully after that, the room being lit up by the fire and a whole lot brighter than it had been when we came in. There was nobody there but Gilf and me, and no furniture or anything that somebody might be hiding behind. I bit off a piece of meat, chewed, looked around some more, and thought. Nobody was out on the path. I put my head out the one little window and looked around, and there was nobody there either. A dark doorway led to a little back room. There was an old string bed in there falling apart with nothing on it but a bundle of dirty rags. If there wasn't anybody here, I said out loud, my dog would talk to me. But since you want to hide, I'm not going to look for you. I'd like to eat and dry my clothes. Is that okay? As soon as the rain lets up, we'll go. No hard feelings. Nobody said anything, but Gilf went to the door and wagged his tail, which meant that he would like to leave right now. I said, You're not tied up, are you? If you want to go, I'm not about to stop you. He went back to his corner. Is this somebody who might hurt us? I asked him. He shut his eyes. Up to you. I put the last piece of meat on my stick. You won't talk to me. All right, I'll stop talking to you. That meat was just about done when somebody whispered, Please? I looked around. If you'd like some of this, come and get it. You used to say that when you were dishing up, remember? Please? That time I knew where the whisper was coming from. There was somebody in that back room after all. I took the meat in there. Are you too sick to walk? Nobody answered, but the bundle of rag on the bed moved. I held out the meat, and all of a sudden I was as scared as I had ever been in my life. I thank you, you kind to an old woman. Here there is something I know you will never believe. It was the rain outside talking. The way the drops hit made the words. They said, Her blessing, wherever. 
I crouched down beside the bed, thinking I was letting the whole thing spook me, that there was somebody there, that there had to be, who needed help. I bless, curse. I said, how about if I pull off a little piece for you? Never die. I thought that might be a yes, so I pulled off a little bit of the meat. A mouth, a hole really, opened in the rags. I put that little piece of meat into it. Her head came out of the rags after that, only her head. It rolled to a place where the strings were broken and fell through onto the floor, and that piece of meat I had pulled off fell out of the mouth. I will never forget that. I wish I could. I have tried to, but no go. It is always there. Picking up that head was as hard as anything I have ever done. Or almost. I did it just the same. The skin was like old leather. It did not feel dirty or anything like that. I carried it back into the other room to show Gilf, and because of the firelight I had a better look at it in there. There were still a few dirty gray hairs on it, but the eyes were gone. This was talking to me too, I told him. I don't think it's going to talk any more, though. When I put some meat in its mouth, it found out it was dead. Or anyhow, that's what it seems like. So it's gone, and you can talk now. I really thought he was going to. That was why I said it. But what he really did was get up and go out into the rain. I had been going to throw the head into the fire. That had been in the back of my mind all the time, but I did not do it. I set it down on the hearth and went to the door so I could wash my hands with rain, and I just kept going, out into the rain with Gilf. It finally stopped a little before sundown. I took off my clothes and wrung them out. They had been pretty dirty, but the rain had given them a good washing and washed me too. My armor's going to rust, I told Gilf, but there's nothing I can do about that. Sand will take the rust off, if we ever find any, and oil will keep it from rusting more. Oil or grease, if we can't find oil? I was shivering. Fire. That was the first time Gilf had talked since he had clammed up in the cottage. If I can find stuff dry enough to burn, I'll look. I'll hunt, Gilf told me. I said go ahead, but keep an eye out for the road. He started to leave, and an idea hit me. Wait, you weren't talking to that dead person, were you? Because if you had been, you'd have told me when I brought in the head. So who was it? He would not look at me. I thought that's who it had been, but the voice you talked to was inside. When she talked, the voice was outside, the raindrops talking for her somehow. Besides, the voices weren't the same. Okay, if you weren't talking to the dead person, who was it? Gilf had left before I finished. I cussed a little, calling him a stiff-necked fool dog and so on, and when I finally shut up, somebody who sounded scared sort of whined. It was I. I grabbed for Swordbreaker, but there was nobody around. You have wonderful muscles, the new voice said. Do you stretch a lot? I nodded, still looking around and not seeing anybody. So do I. I can show you a kind of tree that will burn when it's wet. Would you like to see it? I had been trying to decide whether it was a woman or a man, but the voice could have been either one, and there were tones in it that did not sound like a real person at all. I said, Yes, we could really use wood like that. Please show me where it is. It's not much farther than you could roll a ball. The soft voice had gotten fretful like a tired little kid. Do you think we could dry ourselves in front of the fire? I said, Sure. I'm going to put my boots on, but I'll leave my armor and clothes here. Is that okay? He did not say anything, so I said, Listen, you don't have to do this if you don't want to, but could you maybe let me in on what you and Gilf were talking about back there? He doesn't like me. I was pulling on my boots. That is never much fun, but now my feet were wet, and so were they and it was flat mean. When I got the left one on, I said, I'm sorry to hear that. How do you feel about me, I mean? 
It was a purling, puling, mewling sort of a voice, and sometimes it reminded me of seagulls. I did not like it much, but I had the feeling I would get used to it pretty soon. Besides, it was going to show me that wood, so I said, Really friendly. If you're right, and this kind of tree you're talking about will burn for us, hey, I'll be your friend for as long as you want me. Do you mean it? It was a little closer now. Absolutely, I was getting my other boot on. You were kind to the witch, but I'm not dead. I didn't know she was dead till afterward, I said. I didn't know she was a witch either. Gilf and I thought she was still alive because of the path. Oh, she got up and went out sometimes. That shook me, and he saw it. He laughed. It was not a nice laugh, and was not like any other laugh I ever heard in my life. When I stood up, he said, It's called Pitch Pine. Did you mean that, about being friends? You'll have to whittle some shavings first. I never promised you wouldn't have to do that, you know. No problem. About being friends, he asked. Was that serious? You bet, I said. You and me are pals for life. Well, I need a new owner, and a knight might be nice. But you've got that big bow. Did the string get wet? The string's in my pouch here. I picked it up and showed him. It's probably still pretty dry, but I'm not about to take it out to sea. You wouldn't like me. I said, I do like you, honest. To eat. Possibly you hate us. Many men do, and your dog does. I tried then to think of something I really hated. When I had been where they kept the ropes on the ship, I had hated the rats, but after a while it came to me that it was crazy. They were just animals. I tried to kill them, sure, because once or twice they bit me when I was asleep. But there was no point in hating them, and I quit. Finally I said, I try not to hate anything, even rats. I am not a rat. I never said you were. The limbs of a bush over to my right trembled a little, spilling a few drops of water. When I saw that, I figured he was pretty small. In a way that was right, but it was wrong, too. I said, Are you invisible? Only at night. Follow me. I can't see you. Follow my voice. I did the best I could, leaving the glade where I hoped to build the fire and tramping through the wet forest. I felt like I was going to freeze solid. Over here? That was the first time I saw him, except it was really the second. There had been something black on a fallen log, but it was gone before I got a good look. Right here? See the little tree? I said, I think so. Break a twig and smell it. Remember the smell. The sap will get on your hands and make them sticky. The little knife I had carved my bow with was in the pouch with my bowstring. After I had broken a twig, like he said, I got it out and cut off eight or nine branches. See how the sap runs wherever the tree is hurt? Sure, I said. Will it burn? Yes, it will. So will the needles. I carried everything back to where I had left my sword belt and so on, and whittled away at the branches until I had a big pile of shaving and pine needles, with everything soggy with sap. By the time I finished, my knife was black, so were my hands. I don't like it either, his soft voice told me. But it's a nice color. The sap color, you mean. It only looks black because dirt sticks to it. I was rubbing my hands with wet leaves, which hardly helped at all. Black is the boldest color and the best, the most dramatic. I said, okay. If this stuff burns good, I'll love it no matter what color it is. I quit rubbing and got out my flint and fire steel. The first good shower of sparks got me a hissing, popping yellow flame. See? I sure do. I was picking up dead wood to throw on my fire. You know, you're a really nice cat. You saw me? Yeah, when you ran up into the loft. That was you. You don't hate us? Many men do. The cat 
popped up out of some wild flowers on the other side of the glade. It was awfully small for a person, and it was a darned big cat, maybe the biggest I ever saw. I like you, I said. I'd like to pet you. I mean, when I get my hands clean. You could lick them, couldn't you? The cat did not seem very sure about that, but was willing to try it on me. My name's Monty, by the way. I'm Sir Abel of the High Heart, I said. Pleased to meet you, Monty. By the time I had a big fire going, Monty was rubbing up against my legs. Chapter 47 Good Master Crawl Rabbits, best I could do. Gilf dropped them near my head, but I found it. I sat up, rubbing my eyes. You found the warway? Yep. That's wonderful. Gilf grunted and lay down. I could tell he was tired. People, too. I was cutting off the head and paws of the biggest rabbit so I could skin it. Nice people? Tried to tie me up. I see. Were they woodcutters or something? He took his time with that one. Finally he said, Don't know. I was busy pulling off the skin. Cook for me? Sure, the whole rabbit if you want it. You caught it after all. From a limb about ten feet up, Monty said, You might pass that head if there's no call for it down there, Gilf growled. I picked the head up by the ears and tossed it into the leaves where Monty could grab it. Monty's our friend, I told Gilf. He just shook his head. I think you'd better get over this business of not talking while he's around. It's not like he's a man or a woman or even one of the elf. He's an animal like you, and he's heard you already. In fact, you talked to him when I wasn't there. Right. Thanks, I rubbed his ears. You're the best dog in the world, you know that? You're my best friend, too. From up on the limb, Monty said, Do you know some ale? That sounded like it. Yes, and when we met I thought you might be one. But there was a little sunshine while we were building the fire, and you didn't dodge it. I'm a cat, Monty explained. Gilf curled his lip. I get it. Gilf, how about if you tell me what you and Monty were talking about when I came into the cottage? Is it something I ought to know? He shook his head until his ears flapped. Nope. Are you ashamed of what you said? We all say stuff when we're mad that we're ashamed of afterward. He was quiet. We say it, I said, but it takes a big dog to admit it. I felt kind of silly then, but to tell you the truth, I would a lot sooner talk to animals than to most people. He's ashamed of having spoken to me, Monty explained, exactly as I am ashamed of having spoken to a dog. You will recall the meat you left in front of our fire. That reminded me of the rabbits, and I got back to work. He was gobbling it, Monty continued, when I, being famished, skillfully snatched a piece from under his greedy nose. I see, I got up to cut a green stick. He called me names, dog fashion, vile epithets. I pointed out that he himself was a mere vagabond who had entered my mistress's home without the least invitation or exculpation in law. He informed me, I omit his insults, that he was the dog of a noble knight giving your name. I put the rabbit I was going to cook for Gilf on my stick. I noticed that you didn't try to steal any meat while I was cleaning this. I hope to persuade you to cook some fraction of one of your remaining rabbits for me, Monty said politely. But you're still eating the head, I said, positioning the rest of the rabbit over the fire. True, I thank you for that. So Gilf gets the first piece. After that I get a piece, because I've never had any yet. But I'll give you another piece when we've gotten ours. I am confident of your generosity. Will you talk when there are other people around? Gilf won't. Good news. Let them come and silence him. Monty let the rabbit's skull fall. As for me, it will depend on who they are, I suppose. How they feel about cats and so forth, I'll have to see. He began to wash his paws. 
So will I. Do you object to a test? He did not reply, and I took his silence for agreement. I called, Uri, Baki, I need you. I was expecting one or both to step out of the darkness of the surrounding trees, but neither did. Uri, Baki. Mani coughed politely. Yelling like that could bring us unwelcome guests, if I may say it without offense. They're mad at me for making them stay up here when the sun is out, I explained. Sunshine doesn't really hurt them much unless they stand in it, but they don't like it. Uri and Baki are of the elf, I take it? Watch that meat of ours, please. I did. Do you really know elf? I mean, are you on friendly terms with them? Normally? I'm not as friendly as I'd like to be with one of them, I said. Mani wanted me to explain, and I did a little, but I did not like it, and when he saw I did not, he shut up. We cooked the rest of the rabbits, sharing them between the three of us, but there was not a lot said after that. There was still rain on the grass when we struck the warway next morning. Gilf ran in front to show me the way. When Mani was not riding on my shoulder, he trailed behind to stay away from Gilf. Half an hour's fast walking got us in sight of some pavilions where sleepy servants were tidying up and seeing to a hundred or more horses and mules. A man-at-arms with a partisan stepped into the road to make a stop. "'I'm Sir Abel of the High Heart,' I said, "'a knight of Shearwall Castle who's been lost in this forest. If you'll lend me a horse, I'll be very grateful, and I'll return it as soon as I rejoin my servant who has my own horses.' The man-at-arms bawled for his sergeant, a somewhat older man-at-arms who had a steel cap and a hard leather shirt. I explained all over again, and the sergeant said, You'll have to ask Master Crawl, sir, that your hound? Yes, his name's Gilf. We seen him last night and tried to catch him, but he give us the slip. Good hunting dog? The best. Well, you come along with me, sir. The sergeant patted Gilf's head, which Gilf tolerated to show there were no hard feelings. Had any breakfast? I shook my head. We ate a couple of rabbits last night, and to tell the truth, I was really glad to get them. But that was supper for Gilf and me, and for my cat. I didn't get as much as I wanted, and they didn't either. You got a cat, sir? The sergeant looked around without seeing Monny. Somewhere, I could not help smiling. He's only invisible at night, so I suppose he's hiding till he finds out if you're friendly. I ain't, sir. I'm a dog man myself. What's a cat good for, anyhow? Gilf barked softly. Well, I said, I talk to mine. You can learn a lot from a cat. A servant carried a big tray loaded with steaming food into the nearest pavilion. The sergeant said, That'll be breakfast for Master Crawl. And them other upper servants, sir. Let's see if Master Crawl wants to talk while eaten. If he does, maybe you'd get a bite, too. I said I hoped so. Master Crawl's a cat man, I guess. He's got a dozen back at the castle, anyhow. Might be best if you left the hound with me, sir. I won't hurt him. I know you wouldn't, I told him. But I'm going to take him with me just the same. If Master Crawl objects to him, I'll walk. The sergeant grinned and touched his steel cap. Wait here, sir. Shouldn't take long. It took quite a bit longer than I hoped, but that gave me a chance to rub Gilf's ears and look around at the camp, which was big. There had to be close to fifty servants of one kind or another, and a bunch of archers and men-at-arms. He'll see you now, sir, the sergeant said when he came out. When he was closer, he lowered his voice. I told him about your dog. He said it was all right. The inside of the pavilion was dark after the sunshine outside, but I could see three men eating at a small table. Good Master Crawl. The man facing me motioned me to come closer. You are Sir Abel, one of Duke Martyr's knights? I said I was. Lost, and you'd like something to eat? Most of all, I'd like you to lend me a decent horse, I said, but I'd like a bite to eat, too, if it's not too much trouble. What if it is? I could not tell whether he was looking for a fight or making a joke. I said, then let me borrow a horse, please, and I'll be gone. He clapped his hands. 
We must get you something to sit on, Sir Abel. Does that hound eat as much as I think? Gilf wagged his tail, so I said, More. I'll have them bring something for him. One of the other men got up. I've had enough and had better see to business. You may have my seat, Sir Abel, if you want it. I said thanks and sat. I've got a cat, too. He seems to be hiding just now. I understand. I'd like a little food for him, too, when I find him. A serving man came in, and Carl told him to take away the dirty trencher the other man had been eating from and bring me a clean one. And bones with meat on them. I'm Master Papounce, the man across the table said. The servants are my charge. Master Eager, who just left, has the baggage train and the muleteers. Sir Garvayon has our men-at-arms and archers. Crawl added, They're in the big pavilion. Can you use that bow? It was what Master Augur had asked me once. I can shoot as well as most men, I said. We might have a match tonight, Papounce suggested. Sir Garvayon's a fine bowman. I'll be far ahead of you. I said, if I can get a horse. That's up to Master Crawl. He's Lord Beale's herald, and he's in charge of everything save Sir Garvayon's men. Crawl shook his head. His lordship must see him, I... Two serving men came in, one with a clean trencher for me, butter, and a basket of rolls, the other with a big bowl of scraps and bones for gilf. When they had gone and Gilf was cracking bones, Crawl tugged at his beard. It was a black spade beard, as I could see by then. The face above it looked old enough to make me wonder whether that black was not a dye job. He said, You are not of noble lineage, Sir Abel? I shook my head and tried to explain that our father had run a hardware store. When I saw that was going to get me into more trouble, I said that my brother Bold Berthold had raised me, and he had been a peasant. Papounce asked, But aren't you a knight? That's what we were told. I am, I said. I'm a knight in the service of Duke Martyr of Shearwall. My own parents were peasants, Crawl said. I became a man-at-arms. My father was proud of me, but my brothers were jealous. Bold Berthold would have been proud of me, I know, I said, and if he were well and young again, I would have him in a mail shirt and a steel cap as quick as I could work it. I've never known anyone as brave as he was, and he was strong enough to wrestle bulls. You're strong yourself? Crawl's teeth gleamed between the black beard and his black mustache. I shrugged. He reached across the table. Let's see you squeeze my hand while I squeeze yours. I missed my grip, and Crawl's hand, bigger even than mine, closed on mine like a vice. I kicked the pain out of my head, if you know what I mean, and I became the storm pounding the cliff Garseg and I had stood on, wave after wave, with boulders flying in them like ping-pong balls. Enough. I let go. If I were Duke Martyr, I'd have knighted you myself. What Lord Beale may make of you, I don't know. Have you had enough to eat? We can go over and see if he and his daughter are up. Propounce leaned toward Crawl and whispered long enough for me to grab another bite of ham. I won't mention your father or your brother, Crawl told me. If you didn't mention them either, that might be wise. I won't, unless Lord Beale... Something big, heavy, and soft hit my lap, and Monny's head, bigger than my fist came up over the edge of the table to look at my trencher. I could not help grinning at him, and Crawl and Papounce laughed, and then a big black paw put out claws big enough to hook salmon and latched on to the rest of my ham. Crawl said, We'll stay a minute or two longer, no harm done. Thanks. I wanted to say that I'm not ashamed of my family. It may hurt me here, like it did in Shearwall, but nothing anybody says will make me ashamed of them. As for Bold Berthold, I told you about him. I told Sir Roft once, and his opinion was pretty close to mine. Papounce said, He's a doughty knight, from what we hear. He's dead, I told them. He died four years ago. I pushed my little stool back and stood up.
Chapter 48 Too Much Honor Beale's pavilion was the richest. The walls and roof were crimson silk, and the ropes were braided silk cords. The poles were Turner's work, of some dark wood that looked purple when the sun hit it. The men-at-arms guarding it saluted Crawl as three maids came fluttering out like a little flock of sparrows. The first one was carrying a basin of steaming water, the second one towels, and the third one soap, sponges, and what may have been a bundle of laundry. "'We'll have to wait a bit,' Crawl remarked as one of the men-at-arms wrapped a pole. But a serving man with the face of a sly mouse popped out of the door to tell us to come in. Beale sat at a folding table on which a platter of quail smoked and sputtered. His daughter, a doe-eyed girl about sixteen, sat beside him on a folding chair. She was picking bits from one of the quail. Beale himself, a middle-aged man so short you noticed it even when he was sitting down, studied Monty, Gilf, and me, smiled just a little, and said, "'You bring me a witch knight, I see, Master Crawl, or a wild knight, perhaps. Which is it?' Crawl cleared his throat. "'Good morrow, your lordship. I trust you slept well,' Beale nodded. "'I thought it would be better for Sir Abel to fetch along his dog and cat, your lordship, because your lordship was bound to hear about them. Then your lordship would have wanted to know why I hadn't let your lordship see them for yourself, and quite right, too. If they offend, we can take them away, your lordship.' The thin smile returned as Beale spoke to me. I usually see no one but my herald with a cat upon his shoulder. It's a novelty to see somebody else wearing one. Are you as fond of them as Crawl is? I said, Of this one, my lord. Sanity at last. He has a score, I swear. His favorite is white, though, and nothing like the size of that monster. Would he like a bird, do you think? Beale held up a quail, and Monty jumped from my shoulder to the tabletop, accepted it with both front paws made Beale a dignified little bow, leaped from the table to the ground, and disappeared behind the tablecloth. "'Which wizard or warlock?' Beale muttered. "'Leave us, Master Crawl. "'But your lordship—' Beale silenced him with a gesture, another sent him hurrying away. "'Is that a glamour, Sir Knight? "'Are you, in fact, an aged crone? "'What form would you show if I were to lash your face with a witch-hazel wand?' "'I said— I don't know, my lord. I'm really a boy about your daughter's age. Maybe you'd see if you did that. I can't be sure. The smile flickered and died. I know the feeling, Sir Abel, is it? You are a knight. That's what everyone tells me. Yes, my lord. I'm Sir Abel of the High Heart. Do you wish to travel with us to Jotunland? That's what I gathered from the man I talked to. No, my lord. I only want to borrow a horse so I can catch up with my servant. Just then it struck me that Pauk might have passed them on the road, and I said, Have you seen him? A young man with a big nose and one eye? Beale shook his head. Suppose I give you a horse, a good one. Will you leave us? At once, my lord, if you're willing I should, and I'll return it as soon as I can. We're travelling north, and won't halt until we reach Utgard. Will you follow us there, to return my horse? I'm going to ride ahead of you, I explained. I'm supposed to take my stand at a mountain pass and challenge all comers. Before we engage, I'll return your horse and thank you. Beale's daughter giggled. Her father gave her a look that would have shut up almost anybody. I am on the king's business, Sir Abel. I said, a great honor, my lord, I envy you. But you'll fight me just the same? I'm honor-bound to do it, my lord, or to fight your champion if you designate one. Beale nodded. I have Sir Garveon with me, the bravest of my knights and the most skilled. Will he do? No problem, my lord. When he breaks your head and a few other bones, will you expect us to stay our errand to nurse you? I said, of course not. You don't fancy yourself invincible? I ask, because I was told you were. No, my lord, I've never said that, and I never would. I didn't say you said it. Only that I had been told you thought it. Yesterday Sir Garveon mentioned that one of his men had driven off a crippled beggar. He waited for me to talk after he said that, so I said, I hope he gave him something first. 
I doubt it. I had Sir Garveon's man brought to me. I expect beggars in King's Doom, not in the wild. And I asked him what the beggar was doing out here. He'd told Sir Garveon's man that he was searching for a most noble knight, Sir Abel by name, who had promised to take him into his service. You look surprised. I was, and I admitted it. Who was this beggar, Sir Abel? Have you any notion? I shook my head. Beale's daughter said, You must have given him a few coins and a kind word once. Her voice was soft, and it made me think of a guitar that some girl was playing alone in a garden at night. I waited for her to go on, because I wanted to hear more of it. But she did not. Finally I said, If I did, my lady, I've forgotten it completely. A noble knight. Beale said it as if he were talking to himself, although I knew he was not. My grandfather was his majesty's grandfather as well, Sir Abel. I bowed, not really knowing whether I should or not. It's an honor to me just to talk to you, my lord. My father was a prince, the younger brother of his majesty's father. It is no small distinction. I know that, I said. I myself am a mere baron, but my older brother is a duke. If he and his son were to perish, I would be duke in my turn, Sir Abel. I did not know what to say, so I just nodded. A mere baron. And yet I have my cousin's confidence. Thus I am sent to the king of the Angerborn, bearing rich gifts in the hope that my protestations will terminate his incursions. I do not tell you all this to boast, Sir Abel. I have no need to boast or even to impress you. I tell you, so that you will understand that I know whereof I speak. I nodded again. I don't doubt it, my lord. I could name to you every knight of noble birth, and not the names merely, but the family connections and deeds of valor as well. Not of some, not of most, of all. I understand, my lord. I am equally familiar with every young man of noble lineage who would be a knight. There is no nobly born knight in all Celadon named Abel, nor is there any nobly born youth of that name, whether aspirant to knighthood or not. I should have caught on before that, but I had not. Now I finally got it. I said, I'm not of noble birth, my lord. I guess that beggar said I was, but he probably doesn't know anything about me. Crawl, thought you noble? Did you sense it? I shook my head. I told him I wasn't. He did. It was apparent in his behavior. Your lofty stature, your physique, and your face. Your face, most of all, might support a claim to nobility. Well, I won't make one. I felt like I did sometimes in school then, and it was hard not to fidget. I was tempted to invite you to sit when Crawl brought you in. I am tempted still. That got me a nice smile from the daughter that meant she would not have minded. Beale coughed. I will not, however, Sir Abel. I ought to inform that, as a matter of policy, I almost never sit with my inferiors. It's your table, I said. So it is. Sitting encourages familiarity, and I am forced to punish men whom I myself have corrupted. Beale shook his head. I have done that once or twice. I did not find it pleasant. I said, I bet they didn't either. True, but the daughter interrupted us. May I pet your cat? As soon as she said that, Monty came out from under the table and jumped into her lap. I asked the man I questioned whether the noble knight of whom the beggar had spoken thought himself invincible. I would have expected Beale to be angry then, but he was smiling while he waited for my answer. It seems like a funny question, I said. I doubt if there's any such night anywhere. Here I have to stop to say that Beale's pavilion was divided into halves by a curtain, more scarlet silk, but not as heavy as the outside stuff. I have to say it because Bucky peeked around it and grinned at me. I agree, Beale was saying, but my question only seems odd. I asked it because of something one of the sons of my kinsman Lord Ober had told me the day before. I can be pretty stupid sometimes, but I got that one. 
Squire Swan? Yes, I think you know him. He's my squire, my lord. Peel shook his head. Not if he has deserted you. He said that he had not, but it seemed to me otherwise. He didn't. I suppose that should have been hard to say, but it was not. I knew it was the truth, and I wanted to get it out. I am delighted to hear it. You are going to the northern mountains to take your stand in a pass. For how long, Sir Abel? Till there's ice in the sea, my lord, ice in the Bay of Forseti. Mid-winter, in other words, Beale sighed. I would not have been astonished if you had told me Svan deserted you. I shook my head. He didn't. Beale sighed again and turned to his daughter. He is a connection of your grandmother's, a younger son of Lord Ober's. Ober is your great-aunt's nephew. She nodded. Young Svan told me certain things. It is unpleasant to question the veracity of those nobly born. But his... he... I waved it away. I get it. So does Idden, I'm sure, Beale said, and turned back to her. He was squire to a certain Sir Ravd, a knight of high repute. He is said to have deserted him on the field of battle. I am not saying he did so. I doubt that he did, but his character is such that the lie could be believed. You understand? The daughter, that was Idden, said, You must have known him better than my father, Sir Abel. Do you believe it? I said, No, my lady. I don't believe things like that unless I see proof and nobody seems to have any. Beale's thin smile was back. I asked him what he was doing among these unpeopled hills, as anyone would. He told me a great deal, not all of which I credited. For one thing, he told me he had been made squire to a peasant now called a knight. He waited for me, but I stayed quiet. You are, of course, of gentle birth, Sir Abel. I'm not. I won't go into my family. You wouldn't believe me if I did. But basically, Svan's right. Beale's eyes got just a little bit wider. I want to say this, though. Please listen. I really am a knight, and I haven't told you a single lie. I didn't lie to your herald either, or to the sergeant that brought me to him. Gilf pushed against my leg then to show that he was on my side. This puts things in a new light, Beale clapped, and the mousy-looking serving man scampered in right away. We've kept Sir Abel standing much too long, Swert. Fetch another chair, the serving man nodded and ran off to get one. Beale said, I want to make certain there is no mistake. Your father was a peasant. My father sold hammers and nails, things like that. He died while I was young, so I have to say I never really knew him. But I know what my brother said and what other people have said. If we were back home, I could show you where his store was. Good. Good. And how did you learn the secret arts? May I ask that? Who taught you? I said, Nobody, my lord. I don't know anything about magic. Idden giggled. I understand. One takes certain oaths, Idden. Oaths one dares not break. Beale smiled at me. I'm an adept myself, Sir Abel. I will question you no more if you do not question me. I might say, however, that young Svan himself had noticed certain irregularities is too strong a word, perhaps, certain phenomena, while in your company. The serving man came back with a folding chair, very pretty, with silver fittings. He opened it up and set it at the table where I would be across from Idden. Beale nodded, and I sat down, taking it easy because I was not sure the chair would hold me. Gilf lay down next to me. I spent much of my boyhood in a peasant's house, Beale told me. It was my nurse's outside my father's castle of Coldcliffe. When my older brothers were at their lessons in the nursery, my nurse would take me home so that I might play with her own children. We had great games, and ran through the wood, and fished and swam. Doubtless it was much the same for you? I nodded, remembering. Yeah, I did all that and I lay on my back in the grass sometimes to watch the clouds. I don't think I've done that since I came here. Beale turned to Idden. 
It's good for you to hear all this, though you may not think so now. She said, I'm sure it is, father. You see our peasants plowing and sowing, and their women spinning and so forth, hard work that lasts from the rising of the sun until its setting in many cases. But you need to understand that they have their own prides and their own pleasures. Speak kindly to them, protect them, and deal fairly with them, and they will never turn against you. I'll try, father. He turned back to me. I must explain to you what has been running through my mind. This hill country is by no means safe, and the mountains will be worse. We have Sir Garveon and his archers and men-at-arms to protect us, but when I saw you, I was minded to keep you with me. A young knight, and more than a knight, brave and strong, would be a welcome augment to our force. It's really nice for you to say that, I began, but... Examining you more closely, however, I feared you might prove overly attractive to Idden. I felt my face get hot. My lord, you do me too much honor. His thin smile came again. Of course I do, but so might she. He glanced sidelong at her. Idden's blood was royal not so long ago. Now it represents the cream of the nobility. Soon she will be a child no more. Thinking how it had been with me, I said, For her sake I hope she stays right where she is a while longer. As do I, Sir Abel. When I had considered those things, I thought to give you the horse you asked of me and hurry you on your way. That's... But a peasant. Beale's smile was wider than it had been. A peasant lad could not hold the smallest attraction for the great granddaughter of King Falsung. Eden's left eyelid sort of drooped when he said that. He did not see it because he was looking at me, but I did. Therefore, Sir Abel, you are to remain with us for as long as we have need of you. Sir Garveon's pavilion will hold one more cot. It must, and Garveon himself will welcome a companion of his own rank, I know. My lord, I can't. Can't ride with us and eat good food and sleep like a human being? Idden added her acoustic guitar to her father's gargly tenor. For me, Sir Abel? What if I'm killed because you weren't with me? That made it rough. My lord, my lady, I promised. No, I swore that I'd go straight to the mountains to take my stand, as his grace Duke Martyr and I had agreed. And stay there, Beale said, until midwinter. Nearly half a year, in other words. Tell me something, Sir Abel. Were you riding swiftly when you came to us? Did you gallop up to this pavilion and leap from the saddle to stand before me with Master Crawl? My lord, you had no horse, isn't that the fact? You came to me to borrow one. Not knowing what to say, I nodded. I am offering to give you one, not a loan, a gift. I will give it on the condition that you will travel with my daughter and me until we reach the pass you intend to hold. I ask you this single question. Will you travel faster by riding with us or by walking alone? Because you must do one or the other. Monty poked his head above the table to grin at me, and I wanted to kick him. Chapter 49 The Sons of the Angerborn Upward, always upward, sloped the land that day and the next, and as day followed day I came to understand that we were among the towering rocky hills, which I had glimpsed a time or two from the downs north of the forest in which I had lived like an outlaw with bold Berthold, and that the true mountains, those mountains of which we had scarcely heard rumors, the mountains that lifted snow-covered peaks into sky, were still before us, and still remote. Then I left the warway and Beale's lumbering train of pack-horses and mules, and rode up one of those hills as far as the white stallion he had given me could carry me, and dismounted when my stallion could go no farther, and tied him to a boulder and scrambled up to the summit. From there I could see the downs, and the dark forest beyond them, and even glimpse bits of the silver thread that was the griffin. Tomorrow I'll find the spring it rises from. I promised myself, 
and drink from the griffin in honor of bold Berthold and Griffinsford. I did not say that to Gilf, because Gilf had stayed behind to guard my stallion, or to Monny, because Monny was riding with Idden, tucked into a black velvet bag, generally with his head and forelegs sticking out. I would have said it to Uri and Baki if I could, but I had not seen either of them since Baki had peeked around Idden's curtain. I said it to myself, as I said, and even though I knew how foolish it was, I did not laugh. The wind was cold enough up there to make me wrap myself in the gray boat cloak Curl had kept for me and pull up the hood, and blowing hard enough to make me wish the thick wool was thicker too. But I stayed up there for more than an hour, looking, and thinking about the kid I used to be, and what I was now. I was all alone, the way I used to be when I told bold Berthold I was going hunting and wandered off hunting memories through the forest, and sometimes out to the edge of the forest and onto the downs, for I always sighted elk, but the elk were always too far. All right. I was not going to write this, but I will. When I had been up there a long time, and settled everything in my mind, I remembered Michael, and I tried to call Desiree to me, the way he had called the Valfather. It did not work, and I cried. The sun was low in the west by the time I got back to Gilf and the stallion. They went on, Gilf said, and I knew he meant that the last mule and the rear guard, I was supposed to be bossing the rear guard, had passed him on the road below a long time ago. I said I knew it, but that we would catch up to them pretty quick. Want me to scout? I thought about that while I rode down the hill. I had been alone for quite a while and had enough of it. I wanted company and somebody to talk to. But I knew Gilf pretty well by that time, and I knew he did not volunteer to go hunting or protect something or anything else unless he was pretty sure it ought to be done. So he had heard something or seen something or most likely smelled something that worried him. Naturally, I started listening and sniffing the wind and all that, even though I knew perfectly well that his ears were sharper than mine and I might as well not have had a nose. Want me to? So he was really worried. Yeah, I said. Go right ahead. I'd appreciate it. As soon as I said that, he was off like an arrow. It was a brown arrow at first, but a black arrow before it had gone very far. Then I heard him baying as he ran, that deep bay you hear from clear up in the sky, when the lead hound is all alone out in front of the pack, and even the Valfather on his eight-legged hunter cannot keep up. He woke the thunder. You will say no way, but he did. It boomed way off among the real mountains, but it was there and getting closer. I wanted to spur my stallion then, but he was still picking his way among the rocks. Finally, just to make myself feel better, I told him, Go as fast as you can without breaking your legs or mine. I don't think a broken leg's going to be much help out here. He nodded like he understood. I knew he did not, but it was nice just the same. Monty liked to brag, and he liked to argue, and right then I liked my white horse a lot better. Hey! I said. I get to do all the talking. Cool. His ears turned to me. I think it was his way of saying that he was a good listener. As soon as he had grass under his hooves, I gave him the spurs, gilded iron spurs that Master Call had found somewhere for me, and he galloped hard until we got to the war way, and harder after that, up and up through a cleft that seemed just about as high as that hilltop I had been on, and then along a narrow gorge until I caught the rumble of stones. I pulled up sharp when I heard that, because I already had a pretty fair idea what it might be. The side of the gorge was a shorter climb than the hill had been, but I was tired already. It was cold, and the first stars were coming out. I could not see handholds, and when I did, they were usually just shadows or something. I had to feel my way up, and it seemed like it was taking hours. The stones rumbled again when I was about halfway up. Then it got quiet. Somebody gave a wild yell. That must have been quite a way off, but it seemed closer because of the way it bounced from rock to rock. The moon rose. 
For some crazy reason I looked at it, and when I did the flying castle passed in front of it, black against the white face of the moon and looking like a toy. Back then I was not even sure it was the Volfathers, which it is, but seeing it like that helped a lot. I know you will say there is no sense to it, but it did. I was the sea, and I was looking up at the moon and that six-faced castle, and reaching for it with big foaming waves like white hands. And bang! I was at the top with my fingers all torn up and the blood running off them a little, and there was war in the wind, and it was too dark to shoot a bow. I sprinted down that way, jumping over cracks and down little cliffs, and nothing in the world was going to stop me. Then a hairy hand, about as big as the blade of a spade, did it. Two hands picked me up, but my left arm was free, and I stuck my dagger into that big man's neck before he could throw me over the cliff. When he fell, it was like a tree falling, and we both ended up too close to the edge, with him bleeding and thrashing around and trying to get up. I got up first and hit him in the head with swordbreaker, and heard the bone break under the blow. He fell back down after that, and he never moved again. Down below, someone was shouting, Fine field! Fine field! I guess I recognized Garveon's voice, because I knew it was him and figured it must be the name of his manor. I did not have one, so I yelled, Desiree! Desiree! So Garveon would know I was up there helping. After that, Desiree was always what I yelled whenever I fought. I may not remember to write that down every time I talk about fighting, but that was the way it was. When I got to Sky, let me say this before I forget, I did it there too. Finally, all of it asked what it meant, and I could not remember. After that, I tried and tried. It hurt way down deep. Naturally, when I was running along the top of the cliff, I did not know any of that. Pretty soon I came up to three of the biggest men I had ever seen. They were rolling a boulder to the edge. Swordbreaker got the first one in the forehead. That was about as high as I could reach, when he turned to look at me. A rock hit my steel cap and knocked it off. I think I sort of stumbled around a little after that. Somebody grabbed my wrist, and I cut with my dagger, and he let go. I remember seeing his knee as high as my crotch, and hitting it with Swordbreaker for all I was worth. Somebody else threw a spear. It did not go through my hauberk, but knocked me down. We both grabbed for it, and he lifted it up and lifted me too, because I was holding on to the shaft. I kicked him in the face, and he dropped it. I jumped up and hit him pretty much like I was playing football, and knocked him over the edge and just about went over myself. When I got my balance, I looked down, and he was still bouncing off rocks. He bounced out of the moonlight, and right after that, I heard him hit bottom. I had dropped Swordbreaker and my dagger. The dagger's blade was polished bright and shone in the moonlight, but I had to grope around for Swordbreaker. I straightened up, and there was a great big man, more than tall enough for the NBA, coming at me with a club. I crouched. I guess I was going to rush him as soon as the club came up. But something black and a lot bigger than he was grabbed him. All of a sudden, he was not a big man at all, only another little man that had walked around a while and was going to die now. He screamed when the jaws closed on him. I could hear his bones breaking. It always sounds terrible. Gilf shook him like a rat and dropped him. You better clear out of here, Lord. It was Uri, and she was right at my elbow, with a long, slender blade. I had never seen her come or heard her either, but there she was. On my left, Baki whispered, You will be killed, Lord, if this goes on much longer. You can see in the dark better than I can, I said. Are there any more around here? Hundreds, Lord, the way you're going? I told them to follow me. When the fight was over... The dead horses and mules had to be unloaded, and their loads put on the ones we had left. Then we had to put the dead people on top of the loads. We got going again around midnight, and we traveled until it was light with Garveon out in front, and Gilf and me out in front of Garveon, 
maybe a hundred or a hundred and fifty paces. The sun came up right about when we came out of the gorge and on to a mountain meadow that had thick green grass and even wildflowers. It slanted like the deck of a ship, with the wind hard abeam, but it looked really good to us by then anyway. We stopped and unloaded the animals and put up the pavilions. Most of us went to sleep then, but Garveon and a dozen men-at-arms stood guard, and Gilf and I went back to where the battle had been. Monty went with us, riding on my saddlebags. We stayed in that meadow all day and all night. The next morning Beale sent for me. The table was up, just like before, and there were two folding chairs. Sit down, he told me. Breakfast should be here in a moment or two. I said thank you. You climbed the cliffs to fight the mountain men, so I've been told, and once I caught a glimpse of you up there myself, or so I believe, I nodded. I'm gratified, my lord. Great stones fell among us. Beale sounded like he was talking to himself. And bodies, too. The corpses of our foes. While the mules were being reloaded, I amused myself and Sir Garveon as well by examining them by lantern light. Perhaps you did the same, Sir Abel? No, my lord. I had to go back for my horse. I would have passed on breakfast just then if I could have gotten up and gone out of that pavilion. I see. Normally I breakfast each day with my daughter, Sir Abel. She is not here today. You will have observed it, I feel sure. I nodded. I hope she's not sick. She is well and uninjured, thanks to you in large part, I believe. I'd like to believe that, too. Beale made a steeple of his fingers and sat looking at me until the food came. Help yourself, Sir Abel. You need not wait on me. I said I would rather wait, and he took a smoked fish and some bread and cheese. I like to breakfast with my daughter. I nodded like before. She must be good company, my lord. It gives me an hour or so in which to speak with her. I am busy often all day. I said, I'm sure you are, my lord. There are many of my rank, and of higher rank than I, who do little work, Sir Abel, little if any. They lounge about at court and lounge equally on their estates. Their stewards manage their estates on their behalf, just as mine does for me. Should the king try to persuade them to fill some office, which, as a sensible man he seldom does, they beg off on one excuse or another, I have endeavored to be a man of a different stamp. I will not trouble you with all the offices I have held under our present majesty and his royal father. They have been varied, and some have been onerous. I was first lord of the exchequer for near to seven years, for example. I know it must have been a hard job, I said. Beale shook his head. You may think you do, Sir Abel, but you really have no idea. It was a nightmare that seemed it would never end. And now this. I nodded, trying to look sympathetic. Breakfast gives me one hour a day in my daughter's company. I have tried to be mother and father to her, Sir Abel. I will not say I have succeeded, but I have tried. Beale sat up, straightening his shoulders. He had not eaten a bite. I sent her off this morning to breakfast with her maids. She was surprised and pleased. I said, she can't really have been pleased. I had not eaten either up to then, and I decided I might as well start. Thank you, Sir Abel. She was, however. I sent her away because I wanted to speak with you. Not as a knight, but as a son. For I wish with all my heart that the overkinds had vouchsafed me such a son as you. I did not know what to say. Finally I said, That's a great honor, my lord. I am not trying to honor you, but to speak the truth. Beale paused, I think, to see how I felt about what he had said. Men like me, noblemen high in His Majesty's councils, have no great reputation for truth. We are careful about what we say and how we say it. We must be. I have lied when my duty demanded it. I did not enjoy it, but I did it to the best of my ability. I said, I've got it. Now I am going to tell you the truth, and only the truth. I ask to be believed, but I ask more. I ask you to be as honest with me as I am with you. Will you do it? 
Of course, my lord. Beale got up and went to a chest, opened it, and took out a roll of parchment. You have a manor, Sir Abel? Where is it? No, my lord. None? I said, no, my lord, again. He sat back down, still holding the parchment. Your liege sends you to take your stand in the mountains of the mice for half a year. I hadn't heard them called that. But yes, he does. It is the designation the Angerborn use. We name them the Northern Mountains for the most part, or merely instance some individual range. Why do you think the Angerborn speak of them as they do? I put down the slice of bread I had been about to eat. I can't imagine, my lord, unless it's because there are many mice here. There are no more than in most places and fewer than in many. They name it as they do because of the men that you fought last night. They are the sons of the Angerborn, sons that the Angerborn have fathered upon our women. I see that I have surprised you. Chapter 50 Who Told My Daughter? I took a bite of bread, chewed it, and swallowed. I hadn't known such a thing was possible, my lord. It is. Beale paused, his fingers drumming the table. I suppose it must be painful for the women, at first at any rate. I nodded. The Angerborn raid our country for women as well as wealth. It is my task to stop those raids if I can. If I cannot, to diminish their size and frequency. King Gilling is not always obeyed, and the more remote his people are from Utgard, the freer they think themselves. But if it is seen that he disapproves of their incursions, we will be subject to fewer, and they are apt to bring less strength. I wish you luck, I said, and I mean that. King Gilling has indicated that he will accept me as his majesty's ambassador, at least. But I was speaking of the mice, as the Angerborn call them, of the huge men who attacked us. They are born into the households of the Angerborn, the sons of their masters by their slave women. Often they try to remain in Jotunland after the deaths of their fathers. They may offer to serve his legitimate sons, for example. I nodded to show that I understood. Sometimes they succeed for a while. They are then slaves like their mothers, swineherds or plowmen. The pigs and cattle of the Angerborn are no larger than our own, as I understand it. For a time, you said. Eventually they are driven out, or killed. A king's son, the son of a free woman, would not be treated so, but these are. Those who live pass from place to place, hunted like rats, or like the mice whose name they bear, until they reach these mountains where the Angerborn themselves do not dwell. There are many caves. The Angerborn call them mouse holes. The mice live in them like beasts, and are less than beasts. What do you intend to do today, Sir Abel? I was taken aback. Travel north with your party, I suppose, my lord. Beale shook his head. We will not travel today. We're all tired, and we must discard some supplies so the mules will not be overburdened. The responsibilities of men who died must be assigned to others, and we must find a way to carry our wounded that will not give them too much pain. Then I'll sleep this morning and go looking for the source of the griffin this afternoon. You got little sleep last night, I imagine. Few of us got much. I had slept, but by the time I turned in it had been a day, a night, and a day. I was still groggy, and I said so. I see. Would you be willing to do me a favor, Sir Abel? Of course, my lord, anything. Then sleep this morning as you had planned, but give up your hunt for the source of the griffin for one day at least. It would be a hazardous undertaking in any event. Have you given thought to the dangers you might encounter, wandering alone through these mountains? I have, my lord, I smiled. Also to the fact that they would encounter me. That is well said. Nevertheless, I ask you to abandon your hunt for my sake. Will you do it? Of course, my lord, gladly. You are a good bowman? Yes, my lord. No beating around the bush. I like that. 
For the first time that morning, one of his thin-lipped smiles tugged at the corners of Beale's mouth. Master Papounce has been after me to stage a match between you and Sir Garveon. Garveon is a famous bowman. Everybody says so, my lord. He is seconded by Idden, who hunts. She shoots well for a woman. The thin smile turned bitter. I refused because I felt our time might be better spent in travel. But we will not move on until tomorrow, and such a match might lift our spirits. The men who attacked us? It may suit giants to call them mice, but would seem ill from me. Were high above us on the mountain. They hurled great stones down on us, and we shot arrow after arrow up at them, often seeing no more than a moving shadow. The need for expert archery can rarely have been made plainer. I drained my flagon and refilled it from the pitcher. You will do it? Of course, my lord, I said I would. If you lose by but a narrow margin, no harm will be done. But should you lose badly, you may be ridiculed. It might be well for you to prepare yourself for that. It might be well, my lord, for those who would ridicule me to prepare themselves for me. We cannot afford the loss of a single man, Sir Abel. Please bear that in mind. I will, my lord, provided they do. I see. Well, I've told Papounce and Garveon that I would do this, so I suppose I'll have to go through with it. Try to restrain yourself. I will, my lord. Beelt gnawed his lips while I finished a piece of smoked sturgeon. When I wiped my mouth, he said, You may depart, Sir Abel, if you've had enough to eat. I shook my head. You didn't send Lady Idden away so we could talk about shooting at a mark, my lord. What is it? Beale hesitated. I nearly raised this topic when we first met, when Crawl brought you in. You remember that day, I'm sure. Sure. Beale sighed. I spoke of Svan, then. He is a distant cousin of mine, as I said. I nodded, wondering what was coming. He seeks to become a knight. No higher distinction lies open to him. Beale left his seat to go to the doorway of his pavilion and look out at the rocks and snow-mantled peaks. He was still holding that roll of parchment. When he turned back, I said, I have never stood in his way, my lord. He quarreled with your servant. He told me so. Your servant beat him and drove him off. Did I tell you that? I knew it, your lordship. I don't believe I learned it from you. Perhaps you learned it from Svan himself? I shook my head. You learned of it from another traveller, then? Yes, my lord. This is awkward, and I am by no means certain I can do justice to it. You have seen my daughter Idden? Yes, your lordship, a beautiful young lady. Precisely. She is very young and delicate of form as a feature. Could your servant beat her, if he chose? I had to think about that one, not about the answer, but about where he was going with it. Finally I said, I hope he would never do such a thing, my lord. I know Pauk well, and he's got his faults, but he's not cruel or brutal. He could do it if he chose. Of course, my lord, if I were not there to prevent him. Pauk is twenty or so, and strong and active. Just so. Let us suppose it has occurred. My daughter would feel deeply shamed at having been beaten by a churl. But she would feel no shame at all because the churl had been able to defeat her. No sensible person would suppose that a delicate girl like Idden could enter the lists with an active man of twenty. I nodded. When Svan was a boy of ten, he might have felt the same way and been justified in his feelings. What troubles me? One thing that troubles me is that Svan appeared to feel so now. He would be a knight. If Duke Martyr were to offer him the accolade, the golden spurs and the rest of it, he would accept at once. How would you feel if this servant of yours were to beat you? I tried to talk. It seemed like I was choking. Exactly. I am no warlike man, Sir Abel. While you were learning the craft of knighthood, I was learning to read and to write, history, languages, and the rest of it. If Sir Garveon, let us say, and I were to come to blows, I should feel no shame about being beaten. But a servant? I would wet my sword and seek a second encounter. I'm glad Svan didn't, my lord. 
Are you? For Svan's sake? You shame me, my lord. He was, he is, my squire. I've got a duty to him. Beale nodded, making a steeple of his fingers. I have told you this because I feel you are a man of honor. It may be that Svan will return to you. If so, you may be able to do something. I hope so. I'll try, my lord. Just how it might be done, well, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. I got up. Beale indicated the folding chair. Since you chose to remain, we have other matters to discuss. I will try not to keep you from your bed too long. I sat down again. Svan told me that you had set a demon on his track. Are you surprised? I am, my lord. I... I believe I know what he means by that, but I did no such thing. May I explain? I invite it. I have another servant, my lord. His name is Org. He is no demon. The thin smile returned. One meets neither demons nor dragons in the worlds above Aelfris or Abel. That's one of the things I learned while you were being taught to manage a shield. I did not say Svan was pursued here by a demon, only that he had said he was, and said you had done it. I didn't, my lord, but I have reason to believe that when Svan left, Org went with him. He might be an unpleasant traveling companion, my lord. Is this Org a large, strong man, big shoulders? I sort of picked my way among words. He's big and very strong, my lord. He's bigger than I am, and his shoulders are wider than mine. You did not set him on, Svan? No, my lord. I wasn't there when Svan and Pauk fought and separated. May I try to guess? Please do. Maybe Org is afraid Svan will try to hurt me somehow, and he's following him to stop him. Beale nodded. That seems likely enough. Svan was going back to Shearwall, so he told me. He dined with us, bought a mount, and stayed the night. It would have been a fortnight ago, something like that. I nodded. That night one of our sentries reported seeing a very large man in the moonlight, some distance away. He called him a giant, an angerborn. You know how those fellows are. It seemed a bad time to say anything. When he told his sergeant, the sergeant went to the place and looked around. He said he found a footprint in mud, a very large foot, he said, bare, with long toes. He said there appeared to be claws on the ends of the toes. You can see why I'm curious. I sure do, my lord. Is that all you have to say? I nodded. All I'll say willingly, my lord. Very well. Svan has my sympathy. Don't stand up again, please, Sir Abel. I see you making ready to do it. But we are only just come to the matter I most wished to discuss. The steeple vanished. Beale leaned forward, anxious and thoughtful. My daughter and I were both in that accursed declivity when we were attacked. I remained with her every moment. There wasn't much I could do, but I was determined to protect her if I could. Naturally, my lord. Beale's voice sank to a whisper. She shall wed a king before all is said and done. She shall wed a king, and our blood will be royal again. I understand, my lord. She is precious to me, and so I kept her under my eye. At no time was she up on the cliffs where our enemies were. Naturally not, my lord. And yet, Sir Abel, she talks almost as though she were. Those cliffs, she has told me, are littered with dead, hairy men of monstrous stature slain by you and your dog. I find it difficult to credit a dog's slaying even one such man, let alone dozens. But that is what she says. You have boasted of your honesty in the past. Seeing how I looked, Beale changed it. Boasted is too strong a word, perhaps, but you've laid claim to truthfulness. You told me that you had not lied to me or to Master Crawl. Do you deny it? No, my lord. Can you make the same claim today? I can, my lord, I do. Then I would appreciate straightforward answers to a few questions. 
Beale fell silent, studying my face and his own hands. He had eaten nothing and drunk nothing. I like you, Sir Abel. I like you more than any man I have met since I met His Majesty. I hope that you are aware of it. I was not, my lord, but I'm very flattered. May I say I know you're a really good man, a loyal servant of the king, and the loving father of your daughter? Beale nodded. It's my daughter who concerns me now. I know it, my lord. I haven't hurt her or tried to. You see the curtain that divides our pavilion. She sleeps behind it, and I before it. I wash and dress here, she there. I've got it. Thus we cannot see one another. But we can hear one another perfectly. The curtain is of silk, which has small weight and occupies but a little space. It blinds us, if you will permit the expression, but it offers no resistance to sound. I nodded. Thus we often speak to each other when we lie abed. In the morning, too, while her maid dresses her and Swert dresses me. Okay. This morning she spoke of the battle, and she spoke as one who had been on the cliff tops, of broken heads and broken arms and legs, of men crushed and torn, too, as though by a lion's jaws. She said that you had killed many of these men, Sir Abel. Is that true? Yes, my lord. May I ask what weapons you employed? I got out my dagger and laid it on the table, and drew Swordbreaker and laid it beside the dagger. Beale picked up Swordbreaker to look at it, and I said, That's not a sword, my lord. I know it looks like one, but it's a mace. He felt the corners of Swordbreaker's blade, tried to flex it, and laid Swordbreaker down again. You are of low birth, I realize, but you are a knight, not a peasant, and a knight is entitled to wear a sword. When I've got the one I want, I will, my lord. What sword is that? Eternity, my lord. Softly he said, The perfect blade is a legend, Sir Abel, nothing more. I don't think so, my lord. Wizard, witch, or warlock, he sighed, which is it? I have some knowledge of the art myself, although I boast no great power. I did not say anything. I confess it in order that you may know I am not your foe. You may confide in me as a fellow adept. All I can confide is that I don't know a thing about magic, my lord. Wizards never tell. It was a saying of my nurses, but I didn't know there was so much truth in it. You've been on those cliffs, Sir Abel. It was you who slew our foes there? Yes, my lord, some of them. Most of them were killed by my dog. The arrows of your archers killed some, too. Did you take my daughter up there, after the battle? No, my lord. Did you see her there when you were there yourself? No. If she's been up there, I know nothing about it. This is the deed to the manor of Swiftbrook, Sir Abel. Beale held up the parchment. Did you speak to her without my knowledge, telling her of the battle? No, my lord. Who was with you on the cliffs? Anyone? My dog and my cat, my lord, you've seen them. Who was it who told my daughter of the scene there, the men you slew, and the way they died? It wasn't me, my lord. Don't you think you want to ask her? He got quiet, and I knew there was not a lot I could say then without making it worse. Besides, I had things to think about myself. I buttered bread, laid smoked sturgeon on it, and folded it over. At last, Beale said, You're hoping that I will send you off to find your servant. That's right, my lord. I won't. You had better get some rest, if you're to shoot against Sir Garveon. I nodded, stood up, and returned Swordbreaker and my dagger to their scabbards. You're still willing to contest with him? Any time, my lord. I did not say it, but my bowstring was putting me through hell every night. It seemed to me then that it was high time I got something for it. I will judge your contest, I nodded. Sure, my lord. I will do my utmost to judge fairly, Sir Abel. My honor is at stake in that. I understand, my lord. You may go, Beale sighed. As I was stepping out of his pavilion, he added softly, Yet I hope Sir Garveon has the victory. Chapter 51 Archery 
In the dream I had that morning, I was, myself for a change, but very young, much younger than I had been when I came out of Parkus Cave. I was sitting in a little boat and paddling up the griffin. Bold Berthold stood watching from the bank, and Cedar swam beside me, spouting water and steam like a whale. Up the river, Mother was waiting for me. Pretty soon Bold Berthold was left behind. I saw Mother's face among the leaves of a willow and in a hawthorn, beautiful and smiling, and crowned with hawthorn blossoms. But the griffin wound on, and when the hawthorn was passed I saw her no more. From time to time I glimpsed a griffin of stone, from whose mouth the river issued. I tried to reach it, but came instead to an opening in a tube of thick green glass, and emerged at once, mounted on a grey war-horse and gripping a short lance from which a pennant fluttered. The stone griffin stood before me, tall as a mountain and more stern. I couched the lance and charged, and was swallowed up at once. It was past noon when I woke. I yawned and stretched, thinking about Mother's face in the willow leaves and in the hawthorn blossoms. She was only a girl, and although there was a lot of sleep in the thought, there was more sorrow than sleep. She was still a young girl, not a great deal older than Shaw, when she went away. You're awake just in time. I trust you slept well. Monny was sitting at the foot of my cot, washing his face with his paws. I yawned again. I thought you'd be with Idden. Your dog wanted to catch food. Since I'd had more than enough from her ladyship, he enlisted me to stand his watch. I put my feet over the edge of the cot. I'm glad you two are speaking now. Oh, we understand each other perfectly, Monny said. He thinks I'm detestable, and I think he is... Doubtless we're both right. You've been talking to Idden. Monny's eyes, very beautiful green eyes that seemed to glow, opened wider. How did you find that out? Was it supposed to be a secret? Well, she wasn't to tell anybody. I made her promise. I had found my clothes. I laid them out on the cot and looked into the corners of Garveon's pavilion to make sure there was nobody around except Monny and me. She told her father, and he reported me to you. Isn't that it? No. I tied my underwear and straightened out a fresh pair of socks. She told her father things she'd heard from you, and he's been trying to find out how she learned them. Oh. Monty stretched, throwing his tail into S-curves. Did you tell him? No. Probably for the best. You don't mind if I tug your blanket a little? Try not to tear it. I pulled on my socks. All right. Money tugged. His claws were big, sharp, and black. This is going to sound pretty silly, but I didn't know you were going to talk to anybody except me. Because your dog doesn't? Money yawned. He could talk to some other people, too. He just doesn't want to. Are you mad because I talked to her ladyship? You didn't tell me not to. I... no. I told her you were my owner, he grinned, and I said a great many other complimentary things about you. She was quite taken with you already, and she lapped it up. I suppose I should thank you. Not necessarily. Ingratitude is my lot in life, and I became reconciled to it long ago. I had buckled my belt. Before I spoke again, I worked my feet into my boots. I'll try to make my gratitude a lot more tangible, but it may take a while. Well, you could let me keep talking to Idden. If you don't, I'll have to avoid her, and that's bound to be awkward at times. I pointed my finger at Monny's neat black nose. You know perfectly well that you'd talk to her even if I told you not to. I'd have to, wouldn't I? I mean, if she cornered me, she'd say, I know perfectly well you can talk, Monty, and if you won't talk to me, I'll have my father's archers use you for practice. Then I'd say, Oh, my lady, please, and the fat would be in the fire. Okay, I decided. 
You may talk to her when there's no one else around, except for me. You may talk to her when I'm there or Gilf. Monny made me a mock bow. My lord, don't do that. It reminds me of Uri and Baki, and I don't like it when they do it. Your wish is mine, great owner. I knew Monny was trying to get my goat, but it was hard not to laugh. I said, in return for being so nice to you, I'd like you to answer a few questions, will you? Anything more than divine master? You told me once you weren't from Aelfris. Do you stand by that? Correct. Are you from Sky then? I'm afraid not. Money began to wash his right front paw, a small and surprisingly neat pink tongue darting in and out of his large scarred face. Wouldn't it be simpler to ask what world I was born in? Then I do. I picked up my hauberk and wiggled into it. Just out of curiosity, do you intend to wear that when you shoot against Sir Garveon? Yes, I do. What in the world do— Well, all right. Back to the subject, Mani. I was born right here in Mythgarther, although I've been to Elfris a couple of times. Next you'll want to know how it is that I can talk. I don't know. Some of us can, though not very many. Some dogs can even, but not— all of you can understand us. My late mistress knew how to give a talking spirit, and she gave one to me. You're saying Gilf was born here, too? A man-at-arms thrust his head into the tent. They're about ready for you, Sir Abel. I'll be out in a moment, I told him. I'm not saying that, Monny said when the man-at-arms had gone, and I don't think it's true. I've never seen him eat his own droppings, for one thing. I put on Swordbreaker. I was once told that no one could travel more than one world from the one that he, or she, was born in. Monty nodded. One hears all sorts of things. I have learned since that it isn't true. You were a witch's cat, so you ought to know all about it. Will you tell me the truth? If you insist, first I ought to say that you shouldn't be mad at the person who told you that, he was just trying to keep you from getting in over your head, Monty smirked. Here are the facts. You can believe me or not, whatever you choose. I found my bow and strung it. Go on. In theory, Monty said smugly, anybody can travel to any of the seven worlds. You can't go lower than the first, though, or higher than the last, because there's nothing below or above to go to. I understand. In practice, it's hard to go up, but easy to go down, just like climbing a hill. Do you have much trouble getting to Elfris? My problem is staying out of it, I said. Exactly. You wouldn't have much trouble going from Elfris all the way down, either. But you might never get back. Nodding, I picked up my quiver and left the pavilion. Garvion met me. We've all shot except you, he said. You and I are to have five arrows each. Did Lord Beale tell you what the prize was? I shook my head. It's a helmet, a particularly nice one with a lot of gold trim. Not gilt. Gold. That's good, I've lost mine. I know, when we fought the big men. I nodded again. So his lordship thinks you're going to win, and has put up this helmet for you. We had been striding along, and had reached the crowd that had collected to watch us shoot, archers and men-at-arms, servants and muleteers. Beyond their milling ranks I saw the prize helmet atop a pole and Beale himself. "'So I propose a side bet between you and me,' Garvian was saying. "'A boon. If you win, I'll be honor-bound to do you whatever favor you ask. When I win, and I warn you I will—' You'll owe me a favor in the same way. Done, I said. We shook hands, smiling, and walked through the crowd shoulder to shoulder. There was an embroidered banner hanging from the trumpet, Master Crawl Blue, turning north, east, south, and west, and holding the notes so the silvery challenge of civilized war filled the mountain valley and echoed from rock to rock. When he finally took the trumpet from his lips, he shouted, Sir Garvayon of Finefield, Sir Abel of the High Heart. At this last, the string of my bow seemed to catch the sound, 
humming as the strings of a lute do when the orchestra speaks without her. I'm a knight, I thought. I am a real knight at last, and there's no one here who wouldn't swear to that. I stood a little straighter then, looked up and squared my shoulders, and for the first time really realized that I overtopped Garveon by a good three fingers, though Garveon's conical steel cap made him look taller than I was. There is the target, my good knights, Beale was saying. He pointed as he spoke. It was a round shield with an iron boss at the center. It hung from a scrubby tree at the end of the valley, at least two hundred yards away. You will shoot alternately until each has shot five arrows, Sir Garveon, Sir Abel, and Sir Garveon again, until ten arrows have flown, is that clear? Garveon said, Yes, your lordship. Those arrows that fall short will count for nothing. Those that reach the target but do not strike it will count for one. Those which strike it, two. Beale paused, looking from face to face. And those which strike the iron center, if any do, will count as three. Do you both understand? We did. Master Papounce stands ready to ride. Looking around, I saw him at the fringe of the crowd, on foot, but holding the reins of a nervous roan. If there is a question as to whether a shot reached the target, Master Papounce's testimony will settle the matter. A murmur of excitement swept the crowd. Sir Garveon, you are the senior. Step to the line. Garveon did, taking from his quiver a shaft fletched with gray goose and tipped with a war point. When he drew, he drew and let fly in a single smooth motion, the knock pulled back to his ear, the arrow disappearing like magic. His bowstring sang. All of us tried to follow the high arc of the arrow, as its faint whistle faded to silence. Down on the brown target it plunged, like a falcon on a rabbit. We all gasped. Garveon's first arrow had hit the target midway between the edge and the iron boss. It stayed there, sticking in the target. Sir Garveon has two, Beale announced. Sir Abel, will you shoot? As I stepped to the line, Idden appeared with Monny on her shoulder. She held out a green silk scarf. Will you wear my favor, Sir Abel? It surprised me so much I could not say a word. I took her scarf and knotted it around my head the way I had seen scarves, red, blue, pink, yellow, and white, tied around the helms of knights at Shearwall. Someone raised a cheer for Lady Idden, Caps were thrown into the air, and for half a minute or more, I thought about the way I would feel if my shot did not match Garveon's. It's up to me, I told myself. I direct the arrow, and it's not a matter of chance. There was a slight breeze, just enough to stir Idden's scarf. It was close to squarely at my back, but over so long a course it was bound to drift the arrow just a trifle to the left. I chose a long, pale shaft of spiny orange, one I had shaped myself and knew to be as straight as my eye and hand could make it. Seeing it, I remembered the wild swan whose feathers had fletched it, how proud I had been of it, and how good it had tasted when bold Berthold and I had roasted it over the fire that night. The arrow was at the knock already, as if the string had gone looking for it. Forget the people. Forget the girl with the cat. Think only about the target. They gasped, and I lowered my bow and took a good deep breath. That flat-flying arrow could never reach so far. I shut my eyes, knowing that in a second or two I would have to smile and shrug and get myself set for my next shot. A faint noise, like the noise that a pebble might make if it were dropped into a tin cup, reached us from far away. Chapter 52. To Pauk. Missed, somebody shouted. Hit. Hit the center. That too was contradicted, and I opened my eyes. Frowning, Beale had raised both hands for silence. If Sir Abel's shot struck the iron boss of the target, his arrow will have rebounded, and there will be damage to the point. The iron may be scarred as well. Master Papounce, will you investigate for us? Papounce was in the saddle already. At Beale's nod, he galloped away. Someone near me said, 
If it hit the middle, it would have bounced off and I'd have seen it. The distance was only a hundred paces when my archers and I were shooting against each other, Garvayan whispered. His lordship had it moved way back for you and me, but he wouldn't hear of Papounce standing near it and signaling any more. Armor and a few steps away, and he'd have been safe enough. I did not think so, but I nodded out of politeness. I was watching Papounce, who had reined up at the target and dismounted, seemingly to look at its boss. While I watched him, he walked behind it and seemed to look at the trunk of the tree from which the target hung. Going to win that steel cap, Sir Abel? It was Crawl, still carrying his trumpet. I tried not to smile. I doubt it. To tell the truth, I'll be happy if I don't disgrace myself. The king had one like it made for King Gilling, Crawl explained. Bigger than my wash basin. His lordship liked it so much he had one made for himself, Crawl gestured toward the helmet on the pole. That's it up there. King Gillings is on one of the mules. It will look good on you, Garvayon told me. But you'll have to beat me first. Papounce had mounted again and was trotting back to the camp. Idin caught my sleeve and pointed. Yes, I said. We'll know soon, my lady. She got up on tiptoe. I saw she wanted to whisper and bent so she could talk into my ear. Something's happened. He's not galloping. He needs time to think. I stared, then bent again. Your cat told me, and he's right, trotting with father's eyes on him. Something's afoot. Papounce dismounted and drew Beale aside. For at least two minutes they conferred, and I, I had been trying to edge nearer, caught Beale's incredulous, Split the rock? Then he raised his hands for silence. Sir Abel has three. There were murmurs and shouted questions, all of which he ignored. Sir Garvayon has the next shot. Clear the way for him. It missed the target, falling to the right. This time, Beale spoke to Crawl, who bawled, Sir Garvayon has three. I had shot my best arrow first. I picked a good one from those I had left and knocked it, telling myself firmly that I did not need to hit the middle again. If I hit the target at all, that would be enough. I shot, and Papounce was sent off exactly as he had been before, and there was another wait while he galloped to the target and looked it over. I unstrung my bow and made myself relax, trying to keep from catching the eye of anybody who might want to talk to me. I got another three. That made my score six. Garvion shot again. His third arrow hit near his first. I was starting to feel like I was cheating, and I did not like that. Instead of shooting at the target, I aimed for the top leaves of the scrubby little tree they had hung it on. I shot and watched my arrow fly true to aim. It passed through the leaves and hit the cliff face behind them. A few pebbles fell, then a few more. All at once the cliff face gave way, collapsing with a grinding roar. Gilf found me about a mile away from our camp and woke me by licking my face. I sputtered and sat up, thinking for a minute that I saw the old woman from my dream, the one who had owned the cottage behind him. It was very dark. Why, here, Gilf demanded. Because it's sheltered, and I hoped it wouldn't be quite so cold. It was a crevice in the rocks. Hard here, Gilf explained. Tracking. Hard sleeping, too. I'm p pretty stiff. The fact was that my teeth were chattering. Fire's back there. Food. I said sure, but I wouldn't have gotten anything much to eat before. Everybody wanted to talk to me. I told Lord Beale I'd meet him in his pavilion later. Give it to you. The pretty helmet? I stood up and stretched and wrapped myself in my cloak, adding the blanket I had taken from camp. I don't know, or care either. All asleep. Gilf wagged his tail and looked up at me hopefully. You want me to go back, don't you? It's nice of you to worry about me. Gilf nodded. But if I stay here... Me too. You'd keep me warm anyhow. I wish I'd had you here earlier. He trotted ahead to show the way, and I followed more slowly, still cold and tired. I had hoped to find one of the caves the Angerborn called mouse holes and was mad at myself for having failed. Gilf would have found one for me, and I knew it, 
or Uri and Baki probably could have, if I had called them and they had come. But that would have been Gilf finding it or them finding it. I had wanted to do it myself. The moon had not yet risen, and the camp looked ghostly, Beale's scarlet pavilion dead black, Garveon's and Crawl's canvas pavilions as pale as ghosts, the bodies of sleeping servants and muleteers like new graves, and the few tortured cedars like Austerlings come to eat the bodies. A picketed mule brayed in the distance. I'm going to send you to Pauk, I told Gilf. I had not decided until then. Not right now, because you deserve food and a good rest before you leave. In the morning, I want you to find him and show yourself to him so that he'll know I'm nearby. Then you can come back here and tell me where he is and whether he's all right. Gilf looked back and whined, and a sleepy sentry called, Sir Abel, is that you, sir? When I finally got to my cot in Garveon's pavilion, I found the gold-trimmed helmet on it. After I had adjusted the straps inside, it fit like it had been made for me. Chapter 53 Boons Next morning at breakfast, eating off by ourselves, because Garveon had told some of his archers and men-at-arms to keep everybody away, he and Gilf and I were joined by Monny, who got in my lap and ate whatever I passed to him, just like a regular cat. Lady Idden's just about adopted that tomcat of yours, Garveon told me. She may have him if he wants her. Garveon stared, then laughed. You're quite a fellow. The point of his dagger carried a sizable chunk of summer sausage to his mouth, and he chewed in a way that showed he was thinking about something. Can we talk man to man? May, I said. Sure, of course. I said man to man, but that's not exactly it. Garveyan could not quite meet my eyes. I'm a pretty fair knight. I can outshoot and outfight any man under me. I've won a few tournaments and taken part in seven pitched battles. He waited as if he expected me to challenge the number. Seven pitched battles, and I've lost count of how many skirmishes like that scuffle in the defile. But you're something else. I'm a lot younger than you are, I said, and a lot less experienced, I know that. You're a hero. Garveyan almost whispered it. You're the kind of knight they write songs and poems about, the kind that gets taken up to Castle Sky. I froze when he said that. You didn't know about the castle up there? It's where the Valfather lives. I did, I said slowly, but I didn't know anybody else knew. A few do. And they take... take us up there, sometimes? Garion shrugged. What they say. Have you ever known anybody who... who they took? Whom? Garveon told me. Not till now, but I know you and they'll take you. We were pretty quiet after that, I passing more food down to Gilf and Monny than I ate myself. Finally Garveon said, You've got a boon coming, you know. I have to give you anything you want. Remember our side bet? I shook my head. I didn't win. Ah, you know you did. We were supposed to shoot five arrows apiece. We only shot three. And you missed on purpose with the last one? He was right, and I could not think of anything I could say that would not be a lie. You didn't want to show me up in front of my men. You think I don't know? I got busy eating. Maybe you think I left the helmet on your bed. It was Master Crawl. Lord Beale told him to. I should give it back, Sir Garveon. Keep it. You need it. I wiped my dagger on my sleeve and put it away. I'd like to offer you a deal. You want to give me a boon. Garveon shook his head. I don't want to. I owe it. I'm ready to pay any time. Your honor makes you, you mean? Garveon nodded. I have honor, too. I know. I never said you didn't. Then let's take care of mine and yours together. I'll grant you a boon, whatever you want, and you can grant mine. How's that? May. Name it. I took a good deep breath. I want you to teach me swordcraft. I'm flunking there and I know it. Is that all? I think it's a lot. Will you? 
We can start tonight once we've made camp. Gilf got up, laid a paw in my lap for a second, and trotted away. Now I'm supposed to ask a boon too, Garveon said, only I don't really need it anymore. All right, if I tell you what it was going to be? Sure, I'd like to know. I was going to ask what made Lord Beale so sure you were going to win. Only I know now. Can I reserve mine? Absolutely. He wants to see you before we go, by the way. I was supposed to tell you. Beal and Idden were still eating when I came in. Monty jumped off my shoulder to reclaim Idden's lap. I bowed. You wanted to see me, my lord? Beal inclined his head. Yesterday you promised you would speak with me later. I tried to, my lord. You left the camp. I nodded. So I could come back without being seen, my lord. I waited too long, and you had gone to bed. I thought I'd better not disturb you. Idden asked, Did you come into our pavilion? Not into your half of it, my lady. I would never do such a thing. She smiled. What? Never? Beale jumped in. This was after dark, I take it? Just at moonrise, my lord. Idden said, I didn't hear you, and I slept badly last night. Do you know what I was doing at moonrise? He does, Beale told her. Look at his face. You went outside in your nightdress, didn't you? It was hard to talk after that, but I did it. You were looking at the moon, my lady. I thought it would be better if I didn't interrupt you. Monny grinned from Idden's lap as she asked, Did the sentries challenge you, Sir Abel? I didn't hear them. No, my lady. Beale frowned. You crept past them? Yes, my lord, past the sentries at this pavilion anyway. I knew they'd delay me. It should not be possible. I said, It isn't too hard for one man, my lord. In armor. I tried to change the subject. Yes, my lord, but without a helmet, because I had none. I have one now, thanks to your generosity. Beale ate a coddled egg without saying another word while Idden smiled at me. When his egg was gone, Beale said, The black cat suits you. Your dog would suit me better, I think. Where is he? I sent him to Pauk, my lord. Refresh my memory, please, who is Pauk? My servant, my lord. He went north to wait for me in the mountain passes. The servant who beat Svan. Yes, my lord. Will your dog do that? Go to someone whole leagues away just because you told him to? I don't know, my lord, but I think so. Idden was looking down at Monny. Your cat thinks this is very funny. I know, my lady. He probably hopes Gilf will get into trouble. I hope he doesn't. Will you ride with me today, Sir Abel? I should be delighted to have your company. I shook my head. I'm deeply honored, my lady, but I have to ride ahead to make sure we don't get dry-gulched by the mountain men again. Please, Sir Abel, as a favor to me? Beale cleared his throat. I want to ask you about your bowmanship. Yesterday, I nodded. I understand, but I could explain how I got past your sentries a lot easier than I could explain how I missed the target as badly as I did with my third shot. Idden smiled at Beale. Wizards never tell, Father, remember? Chapter 54 Idden The morning sun had driven off the last chill of the night, long before we broke camp. The mountains in which we had been ambushed gave way to a considerable valley, mostly wooded, through which a swift river flowed. Beyond it the warway rose and rose as far as my eyes could trace its winding curves, which vanished at last among peaks whose summits were lost in cloud. Pauk will be there, I whispered to the white stallion Beale had given me, and Gilf with him. I wanted to gallop then, but I was forced to settle for a quick trot. Tomorrow. I thought. Tomorrow we will be at the first of the high passes, but tonight almost certainly we will camp in the valley, where there is open ground and water. Had Gilf crossed the river already? It seemed likely. The trees, which had appeared a solid forest when I had looked down on them from the heights, were scattered groves when I reached them, too open at first for anyone to mount an ambush. 
I halted at the first such grove, and waited until I saw the sun glint on Garveon's helmet, then turned and rode again, trotting for a long bow-shot before I reined up and paused to listen. A score such pauses got me nothing more notable than the wind's sigh and the rustle of leaves, with a bird call or two. But at the next my ears caught the steady tattoo of galloping hooves. Thinking someone was hurrying forward to speak to me, I remained where I was. Instead of growing stronger, the sound faded away altogether. I thought then of stringing my bow, but I shrugged, loosened Swordbreaker in her scabbard, and rode on. The road wound about a huge gray boulder topped with stunted trees, the moldy skull of a hill, with more trees huddled around it. Beyond, the war way ran nearly straight for a league and more, and there in the middle distance a rider waited. It was an excuse to gallop, and I took it. Hidden smiled when I reined up, and Monny sprang from her saddle to mine. You shouldn't risk yourself like this, my lady. Hidden's smile widened. How is it best to do it? I took a deep breath, half-minded to offend her for her own good. By, by, oh, never mind. You wouldn't ride with me, so I decided to ride with you. I nodded. I lagged behind, back among the mules where I belong, and then when we got into the trees, I went off to the left far enough that they wouldn't see me when I passed. This is a lovely wood to gallop through. You knew who I was as soon as you saw me, didn't you? I nodded again. Because you didn't draw that sword thing. You just hurried to me. Now you're going to send me back. Take you back, my lady. It was hard to say, although not as difficult as the thing I had not said. Because you don't trust me to obey your orders. There was something heartbreaking in her smile. I'm a low-born boy, my lady. My father was in trade, and my grandfather was a farmer, what you'd call a peasant. People keep reminding me. Your great-grandfather was a king. I've no right to give you orders. Suppose we were married. A husband has the right to give his wife orders, no matter who her great-grandfather was. We'll never be married, my lady. I didn't say I'd obey, you'll notice. She stretched out her hand, and when I ignored it, she caught the strap that held my quiver. Are you really going to take me back? I've got to. Monty said, But you don't want to, do you? Doing things you don't want to do always ends in trouble. In laughed the sad something that had crept into her smile forgotten. I'd been wondering whether he'd talk to us when we were alone together. He's right, I told her. Doing what you don't want to do generally brings trouble, but there are times when you've got to and face the trouble. Idin nodded her agreement. That's why I won't separate myself again and ride south instead of north. Go back to Kingstoom. As if she felt some explanation was needed, she added, we have a house there. I tried to pull free, but she kept her sweating gelding beside my charger. That was what you were going to tell me to do, wasn't it? Go home to King's Doom? Just a minute ago before you lost your nerve? You would be a fool to take my advice, my lady, and worse to take your own. Or I could go to Thor Tower and tell the king some cock and cow story. You stopped my ladying me there for a moment. I wish the moment had been longer. Summoning all my resolve, I said, I've got to take you back to your father, my lady. Her laughter had gone. Sir Abel? Yes, my lady? Let me ride with you for an hour, and talk to you while we ride, and I'll go back to my father without any argument. I can't permit that, my lady. You have to return to him now. Half that. I shook my head. I have a fast horse, Sir Abel. Suppose he falls and I'm hurt. I caught the wrist of the hand that held the strap. I'll tell my father you laid hands on me. I nodded. It's the truth, my lady. Why shouldn't you say it? Don't you care for me at all? Monny intervened. Let me judge. I like both of you. If you'll promise to do what I decide, you won't have to fight. Wouldn't that be better? It nodded. You're his cat, so that gives him the advantage, but I'll agree to do whatever you say, even if I have to go back right now. 
Master? I shouldn't, but all right. Good. Monty licked his lips. Hear my judgment. You two have to stay together talking until you get to that big tree down there, the one that's lost its top. Then Idden has to ride straight back to her father, and she can't say you touched her or anything else to hurt you. Now you have to do it. You promised. I shrugged. That ride will take half the morning, I'm afraid, but I gave my word and I'll keep it. No longer than a dance, Idden declared, but before we get there the mountain men will attack. We'll be taken prisoner, all three of us, and spend the next ten years huddled in a frozen dungeon. By the time we're released I'll be ugly and no one will want me, but Mani and I will make you marry me, I snorted. When we're both old, bent and gray, and have thirty-three children, we'll come riding down this road once more. When we reach that tree, you'll ride up into the air or down into the ground and never be seen again. Meow, said Monty. Oh, yes, I get to keep you. I said, is this what you wanted to talk to me about? No, not really. It's just that I've gotten so used to making up stories like that to get my mind off things that I can't help it. I've made up about a thousand, but Monty and my old nurse back home are the only ones who've heard any of them, and now you. Have you ever seen one of the Angerborn, Sir Abel? Coming as it did, the question took me off guard. I scanned the glades to either side of the warway, suddenly conscious that I should have been doing it and had not been, ever since I had caught sight of Idden. I don't mean I see one. I never have. Have you? Yes, my lady, not for long. The mountain men were huge. That's what Monty said. As big as you? Much bigger than I am, my lady. And the Angerborn? As large as I'd be to a little child. Idden shuddered, and after that we rode on in silence. At last she said, Do you remember what I told you when we met just now? I said I ought to be in back with the mules. You didn't argue about it at all. Were you trying to be insulting, or did you really understand what I meant? I believe I understood, my lady. But that doesn't move you? Not at all? Feeling about as miserable as I had ever been in my life, I said nothing. Our supplies are on those mules, the food we eat every day, and the pavilions. But most of them are carrying gifts for King Gilling of Jotunland. I know. There's a big helmet in there, one just like the one you're wearing now. A helmet the size of a punch bowl, all brave with gold. Monty said, And silks and velvets, jewels. It nodded. We're trying to buy peace. Peace from King Gilling and his Angerborn. There's a war in the east, and the Austerlings are creeping into the south. As if the nomads weren't bad enough. Do you know about that? I said, Someone mentioned troubles in the south, when I was at Shearwall, my lady, Sir Waddit, perhaps. I didn't pay a lot of attention. I thought they couldn't be serious, since the south had been pretty peaceful when I was there. I thought that if things were really bad to the east, we'd be sent there to fight. If Martyr's knights were sent away, the whole of the north country would lie open to King Gilling. Bitterly, she added, We'd probably give it to him if he'd pledged to keep his people out of the rest of the king's lands. If he will not agree to peace, we should go into his lands and fight him and his people there. Bravely spoken. They're not supposed to have much to steal, though. Have you any idea how much one of those frost giants eats? No, my lady. Neither do I. I only hope I don't have to cook for mine. I did not know what to say to that. You've known all along, isn't that right? I shook my head. Not all along, my lady. Only since I learned that the mountain men, those big men the Angerborn call mice, were really their children by our women. But, but, but you couldn't imagine how such a thing could happen, like the mating of a knight's charger with a child's pony. Yes, my lady. Nor can I. No, I can. It's just that I can't talk about what he'd do to her and how she'd feel afterward. Idden squared her shoulders, tossing back her mane of long dark hair. It happened at Cold Cliff when I was small, Sir Abel. It really did. Cold Cliff's my uncle's. 
but we went there to visit. I had a little pony then, and I was wild about her. My father let me ride her. When we got home and her time came, the grooms had to cut her foal out. They found a mare to be wet nurse to it. They had to because she died. Do you think I'm making this up? No, my lady. I wish I were, because it would have a nicer ending. My father wanted me to ride him, because by the time he was big enough to ride, I was bigger too. But I never would, and eventually we sold him. Idden had begun to cry, and I urged my mount ahead of hers. When I reached the tree, I wheeled my stallion to look back at her. You're to go to Lord Beale now, my lady? That was our agreement. She reined up. I have not reached it, Sir Abel, not yet. When you came, I thought my rescuer had arrived. My lady, I've listened to you and learned more than I ever wished to know. I beg you listen to reason, if only for a minute or two. I owe a duty to my father, she spat out the words. That's what you're going to say. My father's the younger son of a younger son. Do you have any notion what that means? Very little, my lady. Her lovely voice fell to a whisper. We were royal not so long ago, almost within living memory. My grandfather was a duke, as my uncle is now. My big brother will inherit the barony. My little brother will be a knight, a knight at best, with a pokey manor house a week's ride from any place that matters and a couple of villages. Dropping her reins to her gelding's neck, she wiped her eyes with her fingers. It devours my father. It's as if he had swallowed a rat, and it were gnawing his heart. Hear me, Sir Abel. I nodded. He's served the throne faithfully for twenty-five years, knowing all the while that if only things had fallen out differently, differently by the merest trifle, he'd be sitting on it. But the king has not been ungrateful. Oh, no, far from it. Do you know what his reward is? Tell me, my lady. Why, I am. His daughter, the daughter of a mere baron, is to be a queen, the queen of Jotunland. I will be given to King Gilling like a cup, a silver goblet into which he may pour his sperm, so that when my father returns to Thor Tower, he can say, Her Majesty, my daughter. I nodded. I understand, my lady, but I wasn't going to speak of your duty to Lord Beale. I asked you to listen to reason. Duties like honor. It lies outside it. You want me to rescue you, you say. By rescue, you mean I'm supposed to carry you off to Candyland, where your every wish will be granted. I know no such place, and I wouldn't know how to get there if I did. Idden had begun to cry again, sobbing like the little girl she had been only a year or two ago. You don't think much of knights. Most of the knights at Shearwall didn't think much of me. Look at me. My armor is still rusty from tramping through the forest in the rain and sleeping wherever I could. Whiston's been instructing me in the best ways to get it bright. My own squire left me in disgust. Half my clothes have been borrowed from Sir Garvion and his men. Your father gave me this horse. I have no land and no money. And if I were to get one of those manors you think are miles beneath you, I'd be as happy as your father could ever be to see you a queen. Idden only cried, and I rode back to her, took hold of her bridle, and turned her gelding around, then gave its rump a good hard slap. It trotted off, with Idden still crying on its back. Before they had gone far, Monny sprang from my saddle-bow and slunk into the tall, coarse grass beside the warway. Chapter 55 Sword and Shield See how I'm holding my sword? Garveon said, with my thumb on top, I want you to hold yours the same way. What Garveon was really holding was a green stick that he had cut, and the sword I held was another stick. With an axe or a mace, what you want is power. You want to hit as hard as you can with it, because it won't do much damage unless you do. A good sword will do a lot of damage with just a light stroke, so what you want is finesse. You're not going to try to split the other man's shield. That's not what a sword's for. He paused to study my grip. A little farther forward. You want your hand up against the guard, not up against the pommel. I inched my hand forward. That's better. Sometimes you want to drop your shield and hold with both hands for a stronger blow. Like an axe? No. 
You still don't chop. You slash. Garveon took a step backward, looking thoughtful. I had a lot of trouble with that as a boy, with slashing instead of chopping, I mean. I used to get beaten for it, so here's what did it for me. When you chop, you expect your axe to stay there. Think about chopping wood. But when you slash, you expect your blade to go on by. The edge of your blade is going to hit the other man's neck, maybe a hand back from the point. Then the rest of the edge between that place and point is going to slide along the cut. After that, the point. The whole blade's going to come free, and you can slash again, backhand or forehand. I nodded, although I was not sure I understood. You try to put the weight of your arm behind the weight of your blade, but if you lock your wrist, you'll chop. Now, that tree right there is the other man. I want to see you go at him, and I want to see you slash. I tried. Faster! I wanted you to see what I was doing, I explained. I'll see it. Listen here. Garvan caught me by the shoulders. Speed isn't the main thing. It isn't the most important thing. It's everything. If you haven't got it, it doesn't matter whether you hold your sword right or how brave you are, or whether you know a couple of dozen tricks. I nodded, trying to look surer than I felt. Have you ever seen how a bull fights? A couple of really good bulls? I shook my head. They're fast. It takes your breath how fast they are. They stand off and paw the ground, testing it so they won't lose their footing. As soon as one starts, they come together like lightning. I said good bulls, understand? If they're good, they're fast, because if they're not fast, it doesn't matter how strong they are. If one's a little slow, the other will catch him in the side, and then it's all over. Now do it again, fast. I did, blocking imagined blows with the shield I had borrowed from a man-at-arms, and whipping the tree with my stick until I was panting and dripping sweat. That was a lot better, Garveon told me. Now let's see you come at me. I rushed him, but found his shield wherever my stick hit, while Garveon's stick tapped my knees and calves. When he had smacked both my ears with it, he stepped back and dropped his point. You're fast, but you're making a couple of bad mistakes. Every cut you make's a separate operation. I nodded. That's not how it's supposed to be. The next cut has to flow out of the last one. He showed me, his stick flying in fluid. This is easy because the sword's so light. When I practice back home, I use a practice sword that's heavier than Battle Witch. Reflecting that Swordbreaker was heavier than any actual sword I had handled, I nodded again. Now let's see you do it. Down, then back up. Left and right. Up and across. Keep your arm behind it. You're not waving a stick, you're cutting with a sword. He's wearing mail and there's a leather jerkin under it. You're slowing down. Don't. If you get tired, you'll die. That's better. The cuts became the surges of the clear sea of Aelfris, the green stick that was the green sword that was Eterni, curling like a wave and breaking like an avalanche, only to return to the sea and rush ashore again. That's it. That's it. All right. Enough. Gasping, I stopped. That was good. If you can do that every time with a real sword, you're a swordsman. Garveon paused, and for a moment his hard, narrow eyes grew vague. Master Tongue used to say a true swordsman was a lily blooming in the fire. He coughed. Master Tongue taught me when I wasn't any higher than your stick. Do you understand what he meant? Recalling the fight on the Austerling ship, I said, Maybe I do a little. Every overkind in sky knows I never did. Garveon laughed self-consciously. But he said it over and over, so it must have meant a lot to him, and he was a wonderful swordsman. And a good man. He must have been. If he hadn't been, you wouldn't talk about him the way you do. You're not a wonderful swordsman, Garveon told me, but you're coming along. Maybe if you can get to the bottom of that business about the lily in the fire, you will be. With his stick, he tapped my shield. I said you were doing two things wrong, remember that? What were they? You said, you said my sword wasn't like the sea, not like it enough anyway. I groped for another idea. And you said that I didn't say it. I'm not asking what I said, I'm asking what you were doing wrong. You got the first one. 
You've got to make your sword flow. Now what was the other one? I don't know. Think about it. Think back on our fight and the way you were fighting me. I tried. Garveon said, While you're thinking, I'll tell you a little secret. If you want to be good, you've got to think about your fights after they're over. It doesn't matter if they're real or practice, or what the weapons were. You've got to go back inside your mind and look at it. What did he do and what did you? How did it work? You kept hitting my legs, I said, and then you got my head. I was hitting your shield all the time. I didn't want to and I tried not to, but that's how it always was. Good enough. When you came at me, you came sword side first like this, Garveon demonstrated. That was because you were thinking sword, 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 when you ought to have been thinking shield, sword, shield, sword, shield. Your shield is every bit as important as your sword. Never forget that. He paused to look at his own. Sometimes I fought men who had never really learned it, and I've always known after the second breath. They go down fast. I swallowed. Like I would have if you'd had a real sword. That first cut to my ankle. Right. Now we're going to try something different. Switch your shield over to your right hand and hold the sword in your left. I want you to think shield, sword, shield, sword, understand? So I learned to fight left-handed. It sounds dumb, I know, but it was a good lesson. When the shield is on your right arm and the sword is in your left hand, you use the shield as much as the sword, and that is the way to win. Beginners are always thinking about how they are going to stab or cut. Seasoned fighters think about staying in one piece while they do it. What's more, they know you can make the shield your weapon and the sword your defense. But first of all, speed, which is what Garveon stressed over and over. If you cannot do it fast, you cannot do it. A young knight, as I was, has it in him to be faster than an older one like Garveon. I knew that, and so did he. But he kept on being faster just the same, because he had fought and practiced so much that it was second nature to him. I did not get a lot of lessons from him. I rode ahead into Jotunland before we had gone much farther. But I learned enough that when I got to Sky, some of the knights there, knights who were still famous in Mythgarther, said I was a better swordsman than most newcomers. Garveon was a simple man, and it was that simplicity that made him hard to understand although I am a simple man myself. He practiced with his men whenever he could, and he taught them to the best of his ability, which was great. He told me once that he was always afraid before the battle, but never afraid once battle was joined. That is the thing that makes men attack too soon sometimes. But if it ever made Garveon attack too soon, I never heard the story. When it was time to fight, he told them to follow him and waded into the thick of it. He took pride in his appearance and in the appearance of his men. He did his duty as he saw it, saw that most men did not, and was a little contemptuous of them because of it. He was the kind of fighting man who sees to it that none of the horses has a loose shoe. Chapter 56 Ashes in the Pass For an hour I had been in sight of the pass as we toiled up the warway. Now abruptly... There was someone, no, two people, standing in the road there, crimson against the cloudy sky. I wanted to spur the stallion, but he had been working hard all morning, and whatever reserves he had might be needed that afternoon. One of the figures was waving and pointing, hips thrown to counterbalance the graceful body. As it pointed, I realized it was not that they were sunlit against the lowering clouds, but that they were in fact red and women. Uri, Baki, is that you? Something bent and so dirty that it seemed to have been molded from the mud of the road rose from the ditch to catch my stirrup. Master, sorry, Abel, master, startled, I pulled up. Master, I found ya. I could only stare at the starved, grimy face. You was going to take me, to give me a place, master, you told me. I'm sorry, I said as gently as I could. Do I know you? Uns, master. I's uns, and I fought Org for ya after he threw ya in a barley. The farm wife's son, 
I was thinking out loud. The younger son. Yes, sir, yes, master. Org'd a killed you if it hadn't been for me. His watery eyes were exactly like those of a wounded animal. He hurt you, I said. I thought you'd run. Uns nodded frantically. Ma said. She said you was going to take me on, only you thought I'd run off. So I gone looking for you. I can't stand up straight, but I can walk pretty fast. Something like pride crept into Un's soiled face. They told me in a castle where you'd went, a scullion done master, and give me something too. How far twas and how bad, but I come anyways. I knew I'd find you, master, and it'd be all right. From the white stallion's other side, Uri reached up to tap my thigh. When you are through talking to that beggar lord, Baki and I have something of importance to show you. I looked around at her. Is it urgent? We think so. I'm going up there, Uns, I pointed as I spoke. Meet me there. Or if I've gone before you arrive, follow me just as you've been doing. I'll get you a horse as soon as I can manage it. Uri said, May I sit behind, lord? I ran down to you. I thought about how it would feel. No, you can't, I dismounted. But you may have the saddle to yourself. I'll lead him. I cannot ride while you walk, she sounded indignant. Then you must walk with Uns and me. I will climb the rocks, she decided. There is shade there. For a time we saw her slipping into crevices like a shadow or springing from point to point like a goat, dodging the sunlight whenever the sun broke through the clouds. Soon it seemed that she had faded into the wind. That's a elf, master, Uns declared. Her and her sister come snoopin' round couple times whilst I's on the road, only I wouldn't tell em nothin. It would have done no harm, I said. I'm glad they didn't hurt you, Uns chortled. Oh, they done what they might, master, only twasn't much. It's good that you can make merry about it, Uns. I don't think most people could. He grinned. He had crooked, yellowed teeth. Found ya, didn't I, sir? So all's fine, whatever it is. What do I care for them elves? If you're going with us, I said slowly, things are sure to be far from all right with you. We are already on the marches of Jotunland. Uns looked frightened. That evening we camped in the valley on the other side of the pass, in a place nearly level, where a tortuous path wound down a gorge to a foaming stream. I came to Beale's pavilion there and found him conferring with Garveon while Idden looked on. Sit down, Beale said when his serving man had fetched a folding stool. Sir Garveon and I have been discussing the dangers we face from this time forward. I was on the point of sending the sentry for you when he said you were waiting outside. You're our best bowman, and that may mean a great deal. But a poor swordsman, I smiled wryly. I was tired, so tired that I was very grateful for the stool on which I sat and wished it had a back. Garveon shook his head. Don't you believe him, your lordship? He's better with a sword than most and improving every day. What about a little practice when we're through here, Sir Abel? I'll do my best. Idden said, Shame on you, Sir Garveon. Look at him. He's drooping like a lily. Needs the fire to wake him up. Then he'll be at me like a lion. I cleared my throat. I'm tired, I admit, but I've had bad news today. Beale asked what it had been. I told you I'd leave you when we reached the pass where my servant waited, your lordship. I'm sure you remember? Idden said, I do. Yet we've come beyond it, and I'm still here. I think I also told you that I'd sent Gilf ahead to let Pauk know I was coming. Gilf's your dog, Beal inquired. Yes, my lord, Idden said. May I borrow your cat again, Sir Abel? I miss him. I spread my hands. I'd gladly lend him if I had him, my lady. Though he left you, he hasn't returned to me. Beal said, and your dog? My lord has run ahead of me. Gilf hasn't returned. Garveon said, You'd better tell us. I'll be as brief as I can, 
My man Pauk seems to have thought the pass back there a suitable place for me to take my stand, as I had pledged myself to do. He camped there, apparently, for several days. We found the remains of two fires, and even a spot where he'd pastured the horses. Garveon raised an eyebrow. We? It was surely not the time to introduce Uri and Baki. I said, My servant Uns and I. Uns was the crippled beggar one of your men-at-arms questioned. Separated from me, he's been forced to beg. I waited for someone else to speak, but nobody did. Now I'm forced to beg for him, my lord. He has no horse, and that's what I came to see you about. Can you spare one? Or a mule? Anything? You found your servant's camp, Beale said. Go on from there, please. I found it, but they weren't there. Neither my servant, nor the woman I'd been told was traveling with him. Neither was Gilf, or Monny, my cat, for that matter. They had gone north, Beale inquired. Yes, my lord, they must have. There is only this one road, this war way. If they'd gone south, we'd have met them on the road. So they went north. Garveon said, Into Jotunland. Beale shrugged. We ourselves are in Jotunland now. We entered it as soon as we left the pass and started down. No doubt we're in more danger now than we were yesterday, but I can't honestly say that it feels much different. Iden said, Do you think your servant, and this woman you say is such a mystery to you, would have gone north on their own? Pauk certainly wouldn't. What the woman might do, or might force or persuade him to do, I can't even guess at. Garveon grunted agreement. Who knows what a woman will do? Idden shot him a glance. Why, women do, sometimes at least. Beale muttered, This is no time to begin quarreling. I'm not quarreling, father. I'm explaining something Sir Garveon ought to have learned for himself. But I'd rather Sir Abel explained a few things to me. Can I ask you questions, Sir Abel? I sighed, sagging on my folding stool. Yes, my lady, you may. Then I'll ask a very obvious one. This man of yours, Pauk, would he have fought if the Frost Giants had tried to seize him and your horses? I doubt it very much, my lady. What about the woman you said was with him? Would she have fought? I smiled. I was told she had a sword, my lady, so possibly she would. You must tell Sir Garveon and me. Garveon said somberly, Some women would. Because there was blood, Idden continued. You found the ashes. Didn't you see the blood? Sir Garveon did, and he showed it to me. Beale sighed. I've told my daughter not to ride with the vanguard. Apparently I must also tell the vanguard not to ride with my daughter. Garveon said, My lady rode up while I was examining the campsite, your lordship. I'd dismounted, and no doubt she'd seen I'd found something. Naturally, she was curious. Idden smiled, as if to say, You see how Sir Garveon defends me. Beale's attention was on me. I saw the blood, of course, and the ashes and the rest. I found a footmark in those ashes, off to one side of the younger fire, where it was somewhat hidden by the shadow of a stone. Did you see it? I shook my head, too discouraged to speak. The paw mark of a very large wolf or dog. As for the blood, your servant may have resisted. It's possible you misjudged him. Or the woman may have, as Idden suggests, or they both may have. I said, I suppose so. It's also possible, unfortunately, that one or both may have been injured, although they did not resist. Or that the woman beat your servant, or that he beat her. We have no way of knowing. My lord? Yes, what is it? This isn't what I came for. I came hoping to get a horse for Uns. But you know something about magic. Would it be possible for you somehow to find out what happened to them? For a moment there was no sound in Beale's silk pavilion except Idden's sharply indrawn breath. At last Beale said, Perhaps I should have thought of that. It may tell us nothing. Let me be quite frank with you, Sir Abel. I fail more often than I succeed. But if you succeeded, my lord, we might learn something of value, perfectly true. 
His daughter smiled and leaned toward him, and he said, You want the excitement. Mountebanks feign magic as a show in pretending to swallow swords and toads. But magic, real magic, is not entertainment. Do you know how the elf came to be? She shook her head. No, father, but I'd like to, even if there aren't any. There are. What about you, Sir Garveon? Sir Abel, do either of you know? Garveon shook his head. I nodded. Then tell us. There's someone called Kulili in Elfris, my lord. Maybe I should have said in the world we call Elfris, because it doesn't really belong to the elf, it belongs to Kulili. I paused. I'm only telling you what I've been told, though I believe it's true. Go on. All right. There were disembodied spirits in Elfris then, creatures something like ghosts, although they'd never been alive. Kulili made magic bodies of mud and leaves and moss and ashes and so forth, and put the disembodied spirits into them. If she used fire mostly, they became fire elf salamanders. If she used mostly seawater, they're sea elf kelpies. Correct? Beal looked from me to Garveon and from Garveon to Idden. We're not like the elf. We're much more like Kulili, having been created as she was by the father of the fathers of the Overkinds, the god of the highest world. Here as there, he also created elemental spirits. As Sir Abel says, they're rather like ghosts. They are creatures both ancient and knowing, having the accumulated wisdom of centuries of centuries. Garveon coughed and looked uncomfortable. They hope that we will someday do for them what Kulili did for the elf. Or at least, that is how it seems to me. Then they may try to take Mythgarther from us, as the Elf have wrested Eofris from Kulili. I don't know. But in our own time, what is called magic consists of making contact with them, and persuading them to help the magician, either for a reward, or out of pity, as the Overkinds help us at times, or simply to earn our trust. Garveon said, it can be dangerous, so I've heard your lordship. Beal nodded. It can be, but I'm going to attempt it tonight, if Sir Abel will assist me. Will you, Sir Abel? Of course, my lord. We may find your dog, your servant, and even this mysterious swordswoman. If we do, we may learn things that will stand us in good stead in Jotunland. But the most likely outcome is that we'll learn nothing at all. I want you to understand that. I do, my lord. Sir Garveon may attend me or not, as he chooses. Idden declared, I'll attend you, father. You can count on me. I feared it. Garveon said, I'll be at your side, your lordship. You may rely on me always. I know it, Beale turned back to me. I'll talk to Master Eager about getting a horse for your beggar. Meet me here when the moon is high. Until then you're dismissed. Garveon rose too. Get some rest. Maybe we can have a little practice before it gets too dark. Chapter 57 Garveon Spoon Outside, the other pavilions had been erected as well. The kitchen fires were burning, although a dozen men were still fetching wood, and the ring of axes sounded from the mountain slopes. Muleteers led strings of braying, weary mules over the edge of the gorge and presumably down the precipitous path to the stream. In Garveon's pavilion, three men-at-arms were setting up cots. Mine was up already. The blanket Garveon had found for me had been laid on it, and Monny was seated on that. Well, well, I said, where have you been? Monny gave the three men-at-arms a significant look. All right, you spoiled cat, I sat down and pulled off my boots. You don't have to talk to me. If you don't want to, just let me lie down. Monty did, and laid himself so his head was at my ear. After that, I dozed off for a few minutes. When I woke up again, Monty said, I have news. Those elf girls found your dog. One of the giants has chained him up. I yawned and whispered, Can't they free him? They're trying. I wouldn't, but apparently they think you'd want them to. At any rate, that's what one told me, and she made me promise to tell you. 
she wanted to get back to getting the chain off your dog, or whatever the brute actually is. To give myself time in which to think, I asked, Which one was it? The ugly one, Monty whispered. I turned my head to look at him and opened my eyes. They're both quite pretty. You at least wear fur. Clothes, you mean. They could wear clothes, too, if they wanted to. But it's warm in Aelfris, so most of the elf don't. Clothes there are for... I groped for a word. For dignity, for kings and queens. Every cat is royal, Monty declared in a tone that said he would be mad if you argued. I am myself. The last of the men-at-arms was leaving the pavilion as he spoke, and I noticed he was holding two fingers pointed at the ground. You were overheard, your most high and catty majesty, I told Monty. Don't mock me. I won't tolerate it, Monty sat up and spoke a little louder. I apologize, it was rude of me, and I'm sorry. Then the incident is forgotten. And don't worry about those fellows. Nobody believes them anyhow. As for your elf girls, I admit the fire color is attractive, and they have fur here and there. When I say the ugly one, I mean the one who looks least like a cat. That would be Baki, I suppose. I'll not dispute it. Monny began to clean his private parts by licking them. Monny, I just had an idea. Really, Sir Abel? Amused, he looked up. You. Maybe not, but I thought of something. You must have seen a lot of spells cast, a lot of fortunes told, and so on. I've watched my share, Monty admitted. So you probably know a good deal about magic yourself. Tonight, Lord Beale's going to try to find Pauk by magic, Monty purred softly. I'll be there, and so will Lady Idden. I doubt that anyone will object if I bring you along. Will you come? He licked a large black paw, studied it, and licked it again. I'll consider it. Good. That's all I can ask. Watch what goes on, and if anything occurs to you, tell me. I don't know, Pauk, Monty said thoughtfully. Does he like cats? Absolutely. There was a cat on the western trader, and Pauk was very fond of it. Really? Really? I wouldn't lie to you about something like that. In that case, what was this cat's name? I don't know, but Pauk... I broke off as Garveon entered the pavilion. Ready for your next lesson, Sir Abel? Absolutely, I sat up. It's nearly dark already. Garveon sat down on his own cot. So I'd just like to talk about foining tonight. We won't have a lot of time anyway. You can see the moon above the mountaintops. What's foining? Stabbing with your sword, pushing the point, Garveon gestured. I have the feeling we may be fighting again soon. I could be wrong, but that's the feeling I have. I think so, too. Foining's one of the best ways of taking down your man in a real fight. People don't like to talk about it. I waited. I don't myself, because quite a few of us consider it unfair, but when it's you or him... I understand. It's not lawful in tournaments, not even in the melee. That's where the business of unfairness comes from. But it's not lawful because it's so dangerous. Even if you grind the point off the sword, you can hurt somebody pretty badly by foining. I got up. Can I show you my mace? That thing that looks like a sword. Sure. I drew Swordbreaker and handed it to Garveon. The end is squared off, see? Garveon nodded. I do, and I think I know what you're going to say. I hit another knight in the face once with the end. How'd it work? I had to think about that. He was as tall as I am, as I remember, but he fell down, and I had no more trouble with him. He kept his hands on his face after that. Garveon nodded and smiled. You gave yourself a better lesson then than I could ever give you. You probably knocked some teeth out, and you may have broken bone, too. But if you'd had a real sword with a sharp point, you'd have killed him, and that's better. He drew his sword. This is the best kind for foining, a little taper to the blade and a good sharp point. 
You want a light point for finesse, but you want some weight to your blade too, so it finds hard. Boning's the best way to get through mail. Did you know that? I shook my head. It is, and it's the best way to give him a deep wound, whether he's got mail or not. The Angerborn don't wear mail very much. I didn't know that either. I think they think they don't need it with us. Have you ever fought one? No, I saw one once, but I didn't fight him. I was scared stiff. You'll be scared next time, too. Everybody is. You see one, and you think you need a whole army. Have you fought them? Garvea nodded. One. Once. You killed him? Garvea nodded again. I had a couple of archers with me, and one put an arrow in his chin. He threw his hands up, the same way your man did when you got him in the face. I ran in and cut him right over the knee. Garvion's finger indicated the place. Right here. He fell, and I foined all the way through his neck. We brought his head back to show Lord Beale, pulling it behind two horses. Garvion smiled at the memory. It was about as big as a barrel. They're as big as people say, then. I know the one I saw looked terribly big. Depends on who the people are like always. But they're big all right. It's a jolt any time you see one. They aren't made quite like us either. Their legs are thicker than they should be. They're wide all over, and their heads ought to be smaller. When you cut one off like I did, it's so big it scares you. For perhaps the hundredth time I tried to visualize a whole raiding party of Angerborn. Not one alone, but a score or a hundred marching down the warway. I understand now why this road's so wide. The thing is, they're slow. I don't mean slow walkers. They'll get someplace a lot faster than you will, because their steps are so long. But slow at turning and things like that. If they weren't, we wouldn't stand a chance. Speed is everything, I said. Right. I've fought you. With those practice swords we use, I mean. You're strong, one of the strongest men I ever came up against, but you're not stronger than one of them, so you've got to be faster, and smarter. Don't think it's going to be easy. I never have, I said. I knew a man who fought them. Did he win? I shook my head. I want to ask you more about foining, but first, what do you think about what Lord Beale's going to do tonight? My honest opinion, between the two of us? Between the three of us, I smiled as I stroked Monty's head. All right, I doubt anything will happen, and probably we won't find out anything. I thought you were worried about it, I said. When we were in his pavilion, I mean. I was. Garveon hesitated and looked around. I've been with him before, when he's tried to do something like this. Usually nothing happens, but sometimes something does. I don't like things I can't understand. May I ask what happened? Garvion shook his head. His face was grim. I let out my breath. All right, I'll see for myself tonight. Do you think we ought to have a look at the moon? Not yet. I want to talk to you a little bit more, and it hasn't been long enough anyhow. We haven't been together very long, but I've been doing my best to teach you like I said I would. You'll allow that? Of course. We fought the mountain men together, too. I nodded. Yes, we did. So we're friends, and you owe me a boon. Monny, who had been ignoring us since it became apparent that there would be no more talk of magic, regarded Garveon with interest. You'll admit that, Sir Abel? Sure, I never denied it. I reserved my boon, and I wasn't going to ask it since you won. We both know it. I owe you a boon, I said. You only have to tell me what you want. For a second or two, Garveon sat studying me. I'm a widower. Did you know that? I shook my head. I am. It will be two years this fall. My son died, too. Vala was trying to bear me a son. I'm sorry. Darn sorry. Garveon cleared his throat. Lady Idden has never showed any interest in me. I waited, feeling Monty's claws through the thick wool of my trousers. Not until today. Today she smiled at me and we talked like friends. I've got it, I said. She's young, twenty-two years younger than I am, but we're going to be living in this frost giant king's stronghold. 
there won't be many real men around. You and her father, I said, your archers and men-at-arms, and her father's servants. Not you. Right, I won't be there. I'm going to find Pauk and get back my horses and the rest of my stuff. When I've done it, I'll take my stand someplace in these mountains. That's what I promised Duke Martyr I'd do, and it's what I'm going to do. You aren't going to stay? I'm not even going as far as King Gilling's stronghold if I find Pauk before we get there. Do you still want your boon? What is it? You're younger than I am. Sure, a lot. You're bigger, too, and you're better looking. I know all that. I'm a knight with no reputation at all, I reminded him. Don't leave that out. If you've wondered why I'm so hot to find Pauk, one reason is that he's got everything I own with him. You've got a manor called Finefield, don't you? Yes. A big house with a wall around it. And a tower, Garveon said. Fields, too, and peasants to plow and plant and herd your cows. I don't have anything like that. All the time we were talking, I was thinking about what Idden had said about Beale giving her to King Gilling, but I could not tell Garveon, and I would have been afraid of what he might do if I did. And underneath those things, I kept thinking over and over that if Idden really wanted to be rescued, here he was. Garveon said, You wish me to name my boon. This isn't easy for me. I think I can guess it, so you don't have to. I want you to give me your word, your word of honor, that you'll do nothing else to lessen me in her eyes. You're a better bowman than I, and everyone knows it. Let it be enough. I will. If she rejects me, I'll tell you. But until she does, and I tell you so, I want you to promise you won't try to win her for yourself. Chapter 58 Back to the Ashes You've got my word, I offered Garvey on my hand. He took it. His own was like he was, no bigger than most, but hard and strong. You want her naturally. I don't. She's beautiful. She sure is, I nodded. But she's not the one I'm in love with. She's the daughter of a baron, too. For a moment, Garveon looked ready to give up, his only daughter. You're right. Beale won't make it easy. Garveon squared his shoulders. I have your word, Sir Abel. What was it you wanted to ask about foining? What should I do when the other man foins? How can I guard against it? Ah. Garveon stood and picked up his shield. That's a good one. First you need to know that it's hard to guard against. If he likes it, you've got to take that very, very seriously. I will. Second, you need to know when he's most likely to do it. Do you still have that shield you used last night? I shook my head. I gave it back to Beaw. Then take mine. Garveon got out the sticks that were our practice swords. Don't we need more light? I put Monty down. We're not going to fight. I just want to show you a couple of things. You remember what I said about not coming at your man right leg first? Another reason is that if he knows much about foining, he can stick his sword in it. That's right, square up. Now I'm not going to put my point in your face or your leg, which is what I might do in a real fight. I'm just going to foin your shield. I want you to stay squared up, but back away until I can't foin your shield without taking three or four steps toward you. I took a couple of short steps backwards, still on my guard. That it? Get set. Before Garveon finished the last word, the tip of his stick hit the shield. He sprang back. Did you see what I did? I was leading with my left leg a trifle. I took a long step with my right. Add the length of my arm to the length of my blade, and it's as tall as I am. It was like magic, I said. Maybe, but it wasn't. You've got to practice that long step. It isn't as easy as it looks. Also, you've got to hold your shield up over your head when you take it. You're wide open to an overhand cut if your man's fast enough. I'd like to see that, I said. Garveon glanced at the doorway. It's brighter out there. I'll teach you how to make anybody back off. Then we'd better call on his lordship. 
With his shield on his arm, he demonstrated the thrust and had me do it. At the third, I felt Mani tugging my leg. Ready to go? Garveon asked. I should go back and dig out my helmet, I told him. Lord Beale will want to see me wearing it. Tell him I'll be along in a minute or two. Back in the pavilion, I stooped to talk to Mani. What is it? I ran over to Idens to watch the preparations, Mani explained, and he's going to do it right there. He ought to go back to where the ashes were. Tell him to put some ashes in the bowl, too. The front of Beale's pavilion was lit with a dozen candles. The stony ground had been smoothed and a carpet laid over it. Beale sat cross-legged on the carpet with a wineskin, a gold bowl, and a gold cup before him. Hidden was in a folding chair in front of the silk curtain, with Garveon standing beside her. "'There you are,' Beale said. "'Now we can begin.' I bowed. "'Would it be possible for me to speak in private with my lord for a moment?' Beale hesitated. "'Is this important?' "'I think so, my lord. I dare hope you'll think so, too.' Hidden said, "'Sir Garveon and I will wait outside, father. Call us when you're ready.' I will not order my daughter out into the night, Beale turned to me. If we go a short distance from the camp, will that be sufficient? We walked a hundred yards up the valley. Beale stopped there and turned to face me. You might begin by explaining why you would not speak in the presence of my daughter and my trusted retainer. Because I needed to advise you, I explained. As a mere knight, I understand what is it. You called me a wizard. I'm not but I've got a friend who knows a little about magic. And he, or she, has taught you a few simple things, I suppose. Your modesty becomes you. Thank you, my lord. Thank you very much. I looked around for Mani, but Mani was nowhere in sight. I have a question, Sir Abel. In the past, you have not been entirely disingenuous in answering my questions. Maybe not. I apologize. If I listen to your advice, this friend's advice, though I supposed that you came to me alone when you first sought the loan of a horse, will you answer one question fully and forthrightly, upon your honor, because I will not hear your advice otherwise? I shook my head. This is very important to me, my lord. All the more reason for you to pledge yourself. All right, I'll promise, but only if you take my advice as well as listen to it. You would command me. Never, my lord, but... Well, I've got to find Pauk. Won't you do as I advise? I'm begging. The choice is mine. Save that you will not pledge yourself unless I do as you wish. Yes, your lordship. Then let me hear you. When we returned to Beale's pavilion, he ordered horses brought for all of us. Another horse carried the carpet, the wineskin, and other things, and a sixth, his serving man. We are going back up to the pass, Beale told Garveon. You should ride before us, I think. Sir Abel can bring up the rear, which may be the more dangerous post. What it really was, I thought as I rode rear guard, was the loneliest. If that were not bad enough, I had to rein in my stallion every minute to keep him behind the sumpter that carried the baggage. The rocks and the occasional tree and bush to either side of the warway concealed no enemies that I could see, and although I listened hard, I could hear only the cold, lonely song of the wind and the clop-clop of hooves. The moon shone bright, and the cold stars kept their secrets. When I rode out on a rocky spur far up the mountainside and looked down on the camp, its dark pavilions and dying fires seemed every bit as far away as those stars. Chapter 59 In Jotunland Beale ordered the carpet spread between the ashes and asked everyone why there had been two fires. I shook my head, but Idden said, Sir Garveon will know. Wilt tell us, Sir Knight? They built their first fire here, Garveon pointed. That was because it offered the best shelter from the wind, which is generally in the west. The next night, or it could have been the night after that, one of them saw it could be seen from the north. And it was seen, Beale muttered. Now we will see what I will see myself if I see anything. I must caution all of you again that this may not prove effectual. 
He glanced down at the bowl his serving man held. Why, that's silver. Where's my gold bowl, Swert? I told him to bring this one, Father, Idden said. You charm by moonlight and not by day. This is my fruit bowl. I think it may bring you good fortune tonight. Beale smiled. Have you become a witch? No, Father, I know no magic. But I had the advice of a friend who does. Sir Abel, she shook her head. I had to promise I wouldn't tell you who it is. One of your maids, I suppose. Idden said nothing. Not that it matters, Beale knelt upon the carpet. The serving man handed him a silver goblet and a skin of wine, and he filled both bowl and goblet. Monty had crept up to watch. To get a better view, he sprang onto my shoulder. I ask all of you to keep silent, Beale said. Reaching into his coat, he produced a small leather bag from which he took a thick pinch of dried herbs. Half he dropped into the bowl, the rest into the goblet. Closing his eyes, he recited an invocation. In the hush that followed, it seemed to me that the song of the wind had altered, humming with words in a tongue I did not know. Mongan, Beale exclaimed. Dear maid, Serona, he drained the silver goblet at a single draught and bent to look into the silver bowl. So did I, crouching beside him. After a moment I was joined by Idden and she by Garveon. As through the mouth of a dark cave I beheld a forest of unearthly beauty. Desiree the Moss Queen stood in a glade where strange flowers blossomed, naked, more graceful than mortal women and more fair. Her green hair rose twice the height of her head, nodding and flowing in the breeze that stirred the flowers. The younger Taug cowered before her and I waited on my knees. With a slender silver sword, she touched both my shoulders. This is of the past, I murmured to Beale. Drop ashes into the wine. Beale regarded me with empty eyes, but Idden brought a pinch of ash and dropped it into the bowl, where it seemed to dull the luster of the surface. It became the gray coat of a thick-set man who walked a long and muddy road across a plain veiled by cloud. Towers, squat and huge, rose in the distance. With his staff, this man struck down a woman no larger than a child. A ragged figure who had been driving before them horses no bigger than dogs threw himself over her, offering his back for hers. The man in the gray coat struck him contemptuously, then nudged both with the toe of his boot. The toe of the black boot nudging Ulfa grew until it filled the bowl, which held only ashes floating on wine. Listen, Garveon rose. I rose too and listened, but I heard nothing except the moaning of the wind, an empty moan, as if the thing that had come into it was gone. Idden and the serving man were helping Beale to his feet. In another moment, Garveon was in the saddle and clattering away. Our camp is being attacked, I told Idden. I got Mani off my shoulder and handed him to her. I have to go. Stay here till I come for you. She shouted something as I rode away, but whether she had pleaded for me to stay or wished me good luck or begged me to keep Garveon safe, I had no idea. I wondered about it, and other things, as I spurred the stallion down the steep mountain road. For a minute it seemed trees were walking, where the camp had been. No fires remained, and no pavilions. My stallion shied as something large and loud hit the ground beside it. I got my bow and quiver from behind the saddle and slid off the stallion's back. Somewhere in the darkness, another bow sang. A second stone flew, hitting the white stallion. He screamed with pain and galloped away. Bracing the foot of my bow against my own, I leaned my weight on the supple wood and fitted the looped bowstring into the notches at the bowhead. I pulled an arrow to my ear and let fly. A hundred paces off, the giant who had been stoning the white stallion bellowed, a noise like thunder. I sent a second arrow after the first and a third after the second, guessing at eyes I could not see. The giant crumpled. 
Dawn found two weary knights making their way back up to the pass. My white stallion was lame, and I walked more than I rode, giving my saddle, a big armored one that weighed as much as some men, to uns to carry. Garvayon could have outdistanced us easily, but he seemed too tired even to urge his horse forward. The scabbard that had held Battle Witch hung empty. Then Idden waved to us from a point of rock not far below the snow line, and he drove his heels into his horse's sides and disappeared around the next bend. Ah, love, sighed an insolent voice not far from my ear. I looked around, surprised, and saw Uri on my stallion. You're back, she grinned at me. No, that is my sister. Aren't you afraid Uns will see you up there? He's not very far behind us. I care not a whit if he does, and I will leave anyway as soon as you are out of this shadow. I stopped, biting my lip while I stroked the stallion's muzzle. I told Lord Beale about you and your sister. I had to. She is not really my sister. We just say that. Aren't you angry? Uri grinned again. It will make a lot more trouble for you and for him than for us. Did you explain that my sister and I are your slaves? I shook my head. I called you my friends. I wanted him to come up here when he tried to see where Pauk was for me, and he promised to if I'd answer one question, a complete answer. I've forgotten the words he used, but that was what he meant. And did you? Yes, I kept my promise, and he kept his. He wanted to know why I couldn't use my own powers to look for Pauk, and I had to explain that the only way I had to look for him was to send you two after him. I paused. I didn't tell him your names. That is well, Uri smiled. I said I'd sent Gilf after Pauk, and now you two were trying to find out what happened to Gilf. Nothing complicated. A giant had caught him and had his slaves chain him up. We know all about chains, but we had to go back to Aelfris for tools and then come back up here and then find him again because they had moved him. Where's your cat, by the way? Have you lost that too? He's with Lady Eden. He isn't. Monty jumped to the top of a boulder. He was with Eden when she waved, but that other knight came running and I thought the least I could do was come down here to meet you. She didn't want me around right then anyway. Uri said, I'm surprised you knew it, meaning I'm intruding on a tete-a-tete -tete between you and my own dear, much-admired master, the renowned knight, Sir Abel of the High Heart. He has only to ask me to leave, and I'll vanish in a flash of black far lovelier than your own dingy whatever it is color. Master? You may remain if you choose. A lawful decision. It was Monty's turn to grin. The law being that the cat may do whatever he wants. You are his slave, young woman. I believe I overheard you say that. Yes. Well, I'm his cat. A much higher post. I motioned to Uri. Anz is coming around that last bend, so unless you really don't care if he sees you. She slipped off the stallion and stood under its head. Bach is returning our tools, and I came to tell you your dog is free. Is he coming back here? No, thanks for a hard task well done. I told her you'd be ungrateful. I'm grateful, very grateful, but I'd hoped to thank you both together, and we haven't much time. I'll run down and see to it that Uns falls over me, Monty suggested. Uri sneered. He cannot see two strides ahead. Just look at him. I did, and he was bent nearly to the ground. I'll put the saddle back on the horse when he gets here. He is a true man, at least, just as I am a true elf. Monty made a cat noise of contempt. But your dog is something more, Lord, and this cat is less natural than I. The Bodachan gave Gilf to me, I said. He says they raised him from a puppy. But was he theirs to give? They fear cold iron. A hundred steep strides down the warway, Uns called, 
Master, sorry, Abel. Wait up. Chapter 60 What Did You See? He had sounded out of breath, and it occurred to me that he might have been calling like that without my hearing him for an hour or more. I'm waiting, I yelled, and we'll put that saddle back on him when you get here. I looked around for Uri. She skedaddled, Monty told me, though I wouldn't be surprised if she's hanging around to spy on us. I wanted to ask her whether Gilf was coming back, I explained. As a matter of fact, I did ask her. She just didn't answer. I can, Monty declared. Ask me. You can't possibly... I looked down the road again, but saw only Uns. All right, I will. Is Gilf coming back here? Of course not. I know you won't take my information seriously, but no, he isn't. I just stared at him. You want to know how I know, Monty continued. Well, I know the same way you ought to yourself. I know because I know your dog. Better than you do, obviously. You sent him to find this pouk? Yes, you were there. So was Sir Garveon. So you two didn't talk. But if you sent that dog to hunt pauk, he'll hunt pauk till you tell him not to, or until he loses the trail completely and has to slink back and report his failure. Uns caught up with us soon after that, and I took the saddle from him, put it on the lame stallion, and mounted. Monty had jumped onto the saddle bow while I was tightening the cinch. You need a rest, I told Uns. I'm going to join Lord Beale and his daughter and Sir Garveon in the pass. After that, we'll come back down. I want you to wait for us right here. Uns shook his head stubbornly. My place is with you, Sir Abel. Be long, quick as I kin. As you like, I told him, and touched my heels to the stallion's sides. He made off at a limping trot, and when Uns was no longer in sight, I said, I suppose you think I'm mean. Well, he is crippled, Monty conceded, but I have a firm policy. Never feel sorry for birds, mice, or squirrels, or for men, women, or children, save for a few close friends. It's because he's crippled that I treat him as harshly as I do, I explained. He could have gone on living with his mother and done little or no work, and his brother would have continued to take care of him when she was gone. That was why he left. I know the feeling, Monty said. Every so often you want to get outside and hunt for yourself. Exactly. We were nearly at the pass, and I slowed the stallion to a walk. He wants to be useful, to do real work, and sweat and strain and share his master's fortunes. Monty remained silent. I've made myself a knight. That's high up for a poor kid that lost his folks early. Uns is scared he may never have a spot at all. I'm trying to show him that he's got one, that somebody wants him around for what he can do, and not just because they feel sorry for him. Over here, Sir Abel, it was Beale's serving man. His lordship is waiting for you. I neck reined the limping white stallion, who picked his way reluctantly among the rocks. Were you speaking to me before I hailed you, Sir Abel? If so, I couldn't hear you. I apologize for it most humbly, Sir Abel. No, I was talking to my cat. You have nothing to apologize for, as far as I know. Thank you, Sir Abel. That is most gracious of you. They're over there, Sir Abel, by the rill. Perhaps you see the horses. I nodded. His lordship didn't want to camp. Where Pauk had, I take it. Pauk is the gentleman. He's my servant. I had to touch the white stallion with my spurs. He camped here to wait for me. Ah, I see, Sir Abel. His lordship felt it might not be wise for us to cook and sleep, and, and to live, so to speak, Sir Abel, in the area in which he had his vision. Very softly and politely the serving man cleared his throat. I myself was not privileged to witness it, Sir Abel. From what his lordship and her ladyship have said in my hearing, it was most impressive. It was, I agreed. The serving man's voice fell. His lordship is eager to consult you concerning it, Sir Abel. 
You may wish to prepare your mind. Beale was seated on a stone, as I could see by then. He seemed to be deep in some discussion with Idden, seated upon another, and with Garveon, who stood behind her holding the reins of his horse. A moment later Beale looked up, waved to me, and rose. The horse I gave you was hurt in the fight last night, Sir Garveon has told us. I wish I could give you another. I dismounted. I wish you could too, my lord. There are few horses and mules left, though, and a lot of those that are left are in worse condition than mine. He has a bruise, and it's tender and sore, but I don't think the bone's broken. You beat them, though, Beale smiled. We didn't, my lord. We fought them. That's the most that can be said. Our men, I mean Sir Garveon's and yours, are proud of that. I paused to let him talk, but he did not. It doesn't hurt them, I continued, and may do good. But as for me, I don't think it's enough to have fought. I'd rather win. Iden said, You killed four. That's what Sir Garveon just told us. Beale added, An amazing feat. Two knights and twenty archers and men-at-arms. Twenty-two, Garveon put in. Thanks, I nodded. So six of us for each we killed. We should have done much better than that. That's not fair, Iden exclaimed. Of course not, my lady. This was a battle. Nothing was said about fair. I mean, you're not being fair to Sir Garveon and his men, she looked angry. Garveon started to lay a hand on her shoulder, but did not. Sir Abel slew one single-handed. Then he's not even being fair to himself. Beale said, Did you, Sir Abel? If you did, you deserve much more than that stallion I gave you. It was dark, my lord. I couldn't see how many of us were fighting him. Did you see any others? That isn't the point, my lord. Answer my question, Sir Abel. Were you aware of anyone besides yourself engaging the Angerborn you slew? No, my lord. There isn't a knight in Thor Tower who wouldn't preen himself on such an exploit, Sir Abel. Beal looked toward Idden and Garveon for confirmation and got it. Yes, by a holy sky, and paint one of the anger born on his shield, too, with frost on his beard and a club in his hand. Then I'm glad I'm not a knight of Thor Tower, my lord. As for my shield, Pauk has it. It's plain green, and it will stay like that till I do something better than I've done so far. Idden rose, her hands on her hips. Listen to me. I have before now, I said, and I'll hear you gladly again. Fine. You were both away when they came. The men-at-arms and archers had to fight without you, but they didn't run like the servants did. They fought as well as they could. How long did it take you to get down there from here? An hour, I swear. Less than that, my lady. An hour and riding fit to break your necks, both of you. But you plunged in horse and man, and you did all two men could do, fighting in the dark against giants as tall as that rock. Not quite, I sighed. My lady, I don't want to argue with you. Beale chuckled. But you will, Sir Abel, just the same. Before you do, I have one question for you. I have asked it of Sir Garveon already, and he has answered. Will you answer too fully and fairly, this time without a bribe? I didn't ask for a bribe, my lord. Without setting conditions, will you? Yes, my lord, if I can. Did you fight horsed or on foot? Horsed, I'd think, since your horse was injured. On foot, mostly, your lordship. Mostly with my bow. May I ask why you want to know? Beale's smile faded. The day may come, Sir Abel, when I have to lead a hundred knights against the Angerborn. I hope it doesn't, and in fact I'm resolved to do everything in my power to ensure that it doesn't, and yet it may. I'll try to lead them bravely, but it would be well to lead them wisely, too, if I can. Idden said, you knights care little whether you live or die. We have to care more than you yourselves do. I said we, but I mean men like my father and my brother. You, Beale told her, if ever you are a queen. I saw Garveon's jaw drop when he heard that. As quickly as I could, I said, 
I rode into the fight, my lord, but it seemed like the anger born I was after could see my horse, so I got off. That was when my horse was hurt. After that I shot arrows, trying to hit his eyes. Beal nodded thoughtfully. Idan asked, How many anger born were there? Does anyone know? I don't, my lady. Garveon said, My men have told me there were a score or more. I'm not sure myself that there were so many. When I saw them in your father's bowl, they seemed fewer, though more than ten. You saw them in my bowl? Beale asked eagerly. Yes, your lordship. So did you, I'm sure. No. No, nothing of the sort. I've talked about this with Idden, and it seems that each of us saw something quite different. Tell me exactly what you saw. Everything. My wife's deathbed. Garveyan's voice was without expression. She died in childbirth, your lordship. Peel nodded. I remember. Her bed and me kneeling beside it. The midwives had taken my son. They were trying to revive him. I was praying for Vala when one came in to tell me he was dead too. The slightest of tremors had entered Garveyan's voice. He paused to rid himself of it. At that point, Sir Abel said we were seeing the past. Yes, I recall that. What I was seeing in the bowl changed. I saw our camp instead, and Angerborn coming out of the hills to attack it. More than ten, but not a score. Thirteen or fourteen they might have been. Eden said, Sir Abel must have seen them too, because he told me there was fighting down there. I shook my head. I didn't. Sir Garveon looked up and told us to listen, then ran for his horse. It wasn't hard to guess what he had heard. What did you see, Sir Abel? Chapter 61 All of You Must Fight Nothing you would think important, my lord. I saw myself receiving the accolade, then my servant and a woman I know beaten by one of the Angerborn. Yes, Beale said eagerly. What is it? There was one thing, then, that may be worth telling you about, my lord. A big building. A lot of thick towers with pointed roofs off in the distance. Maybe it matters, because the anger born who beat Pauk and Ulfa seemed to be going there. Do you know what it could have been? For a second it seemed Beale would not reply. Then he said, Utgard, I believe. Utgard is King Gilling's castle. I have never seen it, or even spoken with anyone who has. But there are rumors... A mighty castle on a plain, a castle without a wall, guarded by a wide moat. I didn't see the moat, my lord. It was too far away for that. His Majesty has a plate with a picture painted on it. No doubt you've seen such plates. With pictures? Sure. It is supposed to have been painted by an artist who had spoken with a woman who had escaped from it. He looked thoughtful. I came here to make peace with the Angerborn Sir Abel. No doubt I have told you that before. You mentioned it, my lord. Did I say that it was a last desperate effort? No, well, it was. We've tried to talk with them before. All those talks failed, perhaps only because we could not speak with anyone in authority. That was His Majesty's thoughts, Sir Abel, and I concurred. My daughter and Sir Garveon have heard all this before. They will have to excuse me. Garveon said, Gladly, your lordship. Because I wish to say it one more time now that I've failed. We hoped that coming in peace and bearing rich gifts for King Gilling, we might make contact with his borderers and be given an escort to Utgard. Now those gifts are gone. Idden glanced at me, then looked away. Gone from what Sir Garveon has told me and the mules that carried them as well. We have failed. Garveon said, It wasn't your fault, your lordship. You did as much as any man could. I wasn't even there. I never drew my sword, and I must tell his majesty so. I know I am to blame for your absence. I stood as straight as I had before Master Augur. You don't have to say it. But if you want to, you can. May, Garveon muttered. Make it as long as you like. So may your daughter, or Sir Garveon. Nothing any of you say will be worse than the things I've said to myself. Beale raised his shoulders and let them fall. 
Hidden, Sir Abel wished to find his servant, his horses and his weapons, his shield and helm, I suppose, and his lance, and so forth and so on. If you want to play the fishwife again, this is the time for it. She shook her head. Go on, tell him his mismanagement has resulted in our disaster. No, father. I thought not. I would invite Sir Garvey on to abuse a fellow knight who fought shoulder to shoulder with him, if I didn't know him too well to imagine that he would accept my invitation. Swear to come over here. The mousy-looking serving man hurried over. Yes, your lordship? You're a servant, Swert, my servant. Yes, your lordship? I wish to consult you because Sir Abel here also has a servant, another servant in addition to the beggar. Yes, your lordship. Pauk, your lordship. Sir Abel told me, your lordship. This Pauk has been captured and enslaved by the Angerborn. Yes, your lordship. Sir Abel sought to rescue him, and sought my help in his attempt. I gave it, and thus I have been ruined, and the errand I undertook for his majesty has ended in failure. Sir Abel is to be reviled on that account, and I feel you're the person to do it. Coming from you, the abuse should be doubly painful. You need not fear that Sir Abel will strike or stab you. Sir Garvayon and I are here to protect you, though I feel sure nothing of the kind will be needed. Proceed. To, to, the serving man looked helplessly from Beale to me and back again. To revile him, Beale explained patiently. I have no doubt you command a hundred weight of filthy names. Employ them. Father, Eden's eyes were full of tears. To, to Sir Abel, your lordship. Exactly, Beale was adamant. Begin, Swert. Sir Abel, you, you... Go on, the serving man gulped. I'm sorry, Sir Abel, for what's happened, whatever it was, and, and... Idden drew herself up. Proceed, Swert, you know what my father wants, do it. And if you're to blame, Sir Abel, you're a very bad man, but... But so am I. Whatever anyone calls you, they can call me that too. There, Beale said. Your disgrace is complete, Sir Abel. You have been abused by my valet. Now cease this juvenile posturing and listen to me. I will, your lordship. I am his majesty's ambassador to Jotunland. Had my embassy succeeded, the credit would have been mine and mine alone. It has failed, and the blame is mine. I accept it, and I am ready to stand before King Arnthor to report that I have lost his gifts, and to welcome whatever punishment he may decree. I glanced at Idden, but she did not speak. If she felt joy at the prospect of returning to King's Doom, nothing in her face showed it. Garvayon looked grim and unhappy. At last I said, You're going back, your lordship? Yes, I had thought of remaining here with Idden until Sir Garvayon and Master Kral joined us with what remains of our party, but we must bury our dead. A good many of them, from what Sir Garvayon tells me. And no doubt there are other tasks, too. We will return with you and spend the night in whatever is left of our camp. I hope to endure our dead by sunset and set out tomorrow morning. We'll see. Set out for the south? Yes, I've told you so. From his place in Idden's lap, Monny raised an eyebrow. I said, You don't expect me to come with you, I hope, your lordship. The mousy-looking serving man smiled. That smile was suppressed almost at once, but not before I had seen it. I really hadn't thought about that, Beale said, but you're not one of my retainers. You may do as you choose, though you would be very welcome if you chose to come with us. The horse I gave you is yours, of course, as is that helmet. What will you do? Uns arrived, panting and sweating. After glancing at him, I said, I'll try to find a mount for my servant there, my lord. We've none to spare now, Sir Abel, so Sir Garvayon informs me. We will not have horses and mules enough even for our own needs. Garvayon nodded. I know that as well as he does, I told Beale, but the Angerborn will have plenty. I'll get one of those for Uns if I can. You're going after them alone? Yes, my lord. Uns, bowed already by his deformity, bowed lower still. Not exactly alone, your lordship, sir. I'll be holding Sar Abel's stirrup, Sar. Alone, except for this, this hunchback. 
Monty sprang to my shoulder, an astonishing leap. I'll have my cat too, I think, my lord, and the charger you gave me. My dog's still looking for Pauk, but he might come back. I hope so, and the Angerborn will find him harder to handle next time. The friends I described to you last night will be with me too, at least some of the time. Idden rose and hugged me. She was crying and did not say anything that I can remember. Beale drew a deep breath. If my daughter's arms weren't around you, Sir Abel, my own would be. No doubt you prefer hers, but do you really believe we stand a chance? We, my lord? I am a baron of the realm entitled to a seat at the king's high table. They may say in Thor Tower that I failed, but they shall not say that I was bested in courage by a cripple. Then I do, my lord. I listened to you. Will you listen to me, if I stop the juvenile posturing? Beale nodded. We talk about the Angerborn as if they were as big as a tower, or as tall as a ship's mainmast. I was told once by a good friend that I'd be shocked any time I saw one. I had decided to lie, and not to lie by halves, either. All right, I was, but I was shocked at how small they were. They're no bigger, compared to Sir Garveon and me, than we would be to boys. We call them giants and frost giants, and we say they're the sons of anger, but they're just big ugly men. Brave words. When it's brave deeds we need, I understand. I took Monty off my shoulder, petted him, and set him down. I need a number for them, so I'm taking thirteen. It may be off, but I won't argue now. We were taken by surprise last night by thirteen big men. Even so we fought, and we killed about a third. Beale nodded again. Sir Garveon and I weren't there for the first part of that fight, and I'd like to think it would have made a big difference if we had been. Garveon said, I'm as eager for this as you are, but let's not forget we've lost some men ourselves. I know it. I'll get to that in a minute. First I want to ask what would happen if things were turned around. What if we were to catch those nine big men off guard? No one spoke. I'm asking you, my lord, but everybody else too. I'm asking Lady Idden and Sir Garveon, and Swert and Uns. At last Uns said, I fit org, sar. With me bare hands I done it. And alone, I know. I know what happened to you too. Would you fight again? If ya do, sar, Abel, sar. That's all I can ask. I stopped to think things over. When I came, Lady Idden, you said the archers and men-at-arms hadn't run like your servants. Did you expect your servants to fight? My maids? Certainly not. What about Master Crawl? The muleteers? Swear it there? Beale said, Master Crawl may well have fought. It would not surprise me if he had. Garveon said, He did. I nodded. What about the others, my lady? I don't think so. None of them? What about you, Swert? Would you have fought if you'd been there? I hope so, Sir Abel, if I'd had something to fight with. That evening I talked to all the servants, and to the archers and men-at-arms. I've only got three things to say to you, I told them. I'll talk a lot about those three things, because I think you'll want me to. I'll answer your questions as well as I can but everything I've got to say will come down to those three things, so I'd like to get them out of the way before we do the rest. I studied them, hoping my silence would lend weight to my words. I'm asking you to fight, all of you, everyone here. Lord Beale has ordered you to, but he can't make you do it any more than I can. All he can do is punish you if you don't. Whether you fight or not is up to you. That's the first thing I've got to say. You won't be fighting alone. Each man-at-arms and each archer is going to take charge of two or three or four of you, depending on how the numbers work out, teach you what you'll need to know, and lead you when we go to get our goods back from the Angerborn. Lord Beale himself will be leading the men-at-arms and the archers, and so will Sir Garveon and I. That's the second thing. They were looking at each other by that time, and I let them do it for more than a minute. Most of you have heard I killed one of the Angerborn last night. Sir Garveon killed one too, but he had two archers and a man-at-arms fighting beside him. He likes to pretend that it makes what he did less than what I did. But what he did and what I did don't matter much. 
What matters is that our men-at-arms and our archers killed two before Sir Garvion and I came down from the pass. It doesn't take a knight. A few brave men were able to do it without a knight to lead them. That's the third thing I have to say, and the most important. I stopped again. Some of you will have questions for me, or for Lord Beale, or for Sir Garvion. Some may even have questions for Lady Itton. Stand and speak loudly. I've had questions for Lord Beale myself, and he's had questions for me. No one will be punished for asking a question. A middle-aged serving man rose. Is anyone not going to fight? I don't know, I said. We'll have to see. The serving man sat down quickly. Lord Beale is going to fight. Lady Idden is going to fight. Sir Garvion is going to fight. The archers and men-at-arms are going to fight, and I am going to fight. Master Crawl called, So am I. And Master Crawl is going to fight, of course. I took that so much for granted that I forgot to mention it. But none of us know about the rest of you. That's one of the things we're going to find out. One of Idden's maids got hesitantly to her feet. We're supposed to fight, too? Didn't Lady Idden tell you? The maid's nod was timid. Then you know the answer. Let me explain. Ordinarily, women don't fight because they're not as strong as men. But what's my strength or Sir Garvion's compared to the strength of the giants? You can fight them as well as we do if you choose to do it. Lady Idden's going to lead you and teach you. She and her bow have accounted for a lot of deer, but she's after bigger game now, and it's your duty to help her. A cook sitting near the maid said, Do we get to choose the man-at-arms we want? Stand up, I gestured. The rest can't hear you. The cook rose, somewhat embarrassed. You said that each two or three of us would have a man-at-arms to teach us. Do we get to pick which one? Or an archer? No. They get to choose you. The serving man, who had stood up first, stood up again. I just want to say I'll fight if you'll give me weapons. I said, When Lord Beale heard I'd killed an Angerborn, he asked how I did it. I told him with arrows, and he wondered how I could see to shoot, since we'd fought them at night. I explained that they're so big that they could always be seen against the night sky. So big, I'd have found it hard to miss. I held up my bow. I made this. I didn't make all my arrows, but I made the best ones. There are trees here, trees tough enough to bend under the mountain winds and stand up again when the wind dies. The Angerborn took a lot of the treasure we had, but they left us a lot in the way of iron grates and pots and bronze fittings for the pavilions. The man who shoes our horses and mules can shape those things into arrowheads, and you're sitting on more rough stones to sharpen them with than you'll ever need. I shut up to let them think about that. The sun had nearly set, and the grave markers on the hilltop cast long shadows that seemed to reach toward us like so many fingers. Some of you may be helped by the fire elf, I said. I hope so. If you are, listen carefully to everything they tell you. They're good metal workers. Chapter 62 after the raiders. The mountains had dwindled to hills before I camped, high brown and yellow hills, whose sand-colored stones were masked by dead grass. I had ridden and walked while I led the limping stallion, until the sun went down, hoping for water and wood. The waterhole I finally found held water nearly as thick as mud, but the stallion drank it thirstily. I tied him to his own saddle, spread his saddle blanket on the ground, and laid another blanket over it. A fire would have been nice, but a fire might have caught the dry grass and burned half the world. That was how it seemed, anyway, a barren land that went on and on like the sea. Besides, there was no wood. After that, for what felt like hours, I lay shivering, wrapped in my cloak and the other blanket, looking up at the stars and hearing only the slow steps of the grazing stallion and the soft moaning of the wind. It was late summer late summer and warm weather at Duke Martyr's lofty gray castle. Warm weather in the Bay of Forseti. There would be no ice in that bay for months. Sweltering late summer in the forest where I had lived with bold Berthold. The bucks would have begun to grow antlers for the mating season, but those antlers would have a lot of growing to do still, 
weapons of gallant combat, still sheathed in velvet. Knowing that summer lingered along the griffin had brought me little comfort, and my mail even less. I was on the northern side of the mountains of the mice now, far north of the downs, and I believe at an elevation a good deal higher than that of the smiling southern lands. Waves crashed against a cliff, and I leaped and sported in them, together with the maidens of the sea elf, maidens who save for their eyes were as blue everywhere as the blue eyes of the loveliest maids of Mithgarther, fair young women who sparkled and laughed as they leaped from the surging sea into the storm that lit and shook the heavens. That lit and shook Mithgarther. Why had I not thought of that? I rolled over, seeking to close blanket and cloak more tightly about me. Garseg and Garveon waited on the cliff, Garveon with drawn sword, and Garseg a dragon of steel-blue fire. The Kelpies raised graceful arms and lovely faces in adoration, shrieking prayers to Cedar. They cheered as a gout of scarlet flame forced Garveon over the edge. He fell, striking rock after rock after rock. His helmet was lost, his sword rattled down the rocks with him, and his bones broke until a shapeless mass of armor and bleeding flesh tumbled into the sea. I woke shuddering. My sea was this rolling expanse of dust-dry grass, lit by a fading moon lost among racing cloud. The cliff from which Garveon had fallen was the northern mountains now, mountains my stallion's hooves had somehow transformed into southern mountains, and the Kelpies were nothing more than a shrieking wind. Shivering worse than ever, I tried to sleep again. The armies of winter and old night advanced across the sky, monstrous bodies lit from within by lightnings. A flying castle, a thing no larger than a toy, barred their way, and barred their way alone. From its walls a thousand voices pleaded, Abel, Abel, Abel. But I slept upon the downs, while these greater anger-born brandished spears of chaos and bellowed hate. I woke and found my face wet with rain. Thunder shook the sky, and white fire tore the night. A wave of driving rain wet me like a wave of the sea, and another and another. There was no place to get away from the rain, no shelter anywhere. I tightened the studded chin-strap of my helmet and covered my head with the hood of my cloak blessing its tightly woven wool. I could not see. It might be night, it could be day. I had no way of knowing. The chain around my neck was held by a staple driven into a crevice in the wall. Once I had tried to pull it out, but I did not do that any more. Once I had shivered, I did not do that any more either. Once I had hoped some friend would bring me a blanket or a bundle of rags that the seeing woman who had been my wife once would bring me a crust or a cup of broth. Those things had not happened, and would never happen. Once I had shivered in the wind, but I had disobeyed, and would shiver no more. I was sleepy now, and though the snow brushed my face and crept up around my feet, I was not uncomfortable. There was no more pain. Something rough, warm, and wet scrubbed my cheek. I woke to see a hairy, familiar face as broad and as brown as my saddle peering into mine. I blinked, and Gilf licked my nose. Time to get up. Look at the sun. It had climbed halfway up a cloudy sky. Found him. Gilf wagged his tail with vigor. I can show you. Want to go? Yes. I threw off my blanket. I was dripping wet, but only moderately chilled. But I can't not now. I have to delay the Angerborn, and clean my armor, and talk to you. All right. Gilf lay down. Sore paws, anyhow. But first of all I have to find my horse. He seems to have strayed during the night. I got up and looked around, my hand shielding my eyes from the sun. Upwind. I smell him. After half a mile, the track of the dragged saddle was so plain that even I could follow it. Snarling and snapping, Gilf held the stallion until I could grab its tether. Back at the waterhole, I pulled off helmet and hauberk and got rags and a flask of oil from a saddlebag. I didn't have these when you and I were lost in the forest, I told Gilf, but I've learned since. Being a knight's like being a sailor. 
you pay for the glory and freedom by oiling and scrubbing and patching and polishing, or you don't get to keep them. Those were the days. Gilf rolled in the wet grass, rose and shook himself. You liked it on the ship? In the woods. I liked that. Just you and me. Good smells. Hunting. Fires at night. I smiled. It was kind of nice. Bad place. Gilf sneezed. The forest? I thought you liked it. My mail, well oiled when I left Beale's company, had not yet begun to rust. I shook it, dislodging a shower, then dried it with a clean soft rag, working corners of the rag between the close-packed steel rings wherever I suspected a hidden drop. Here, Gilf explained. I considered that. Yes and no. I understand what you mean. It's too bare to have much game, and there isn't much water, though you couldn't say that last night. Then, too, there's the Angerborn. This is their homeland, Jotunland, and their terrible enemies. But Lord Beale talked about leading hundreds of knights against them, and this would be wonderful country for it. Give Lord Beale or Duke Martyr five hundred knights and two thousand archers, and you might get a battle people would sing about till the sky fell, Gilf grunted. Brave knights well-mounted with long, strong lances, archers with long bows and a hundred arrows apiece. This is lovely country for charging horses, and lovely country for bowmen, too. Just thinking of it made me want to be there. A year from that day the anger born might be as rare as ogres are now. A hundred years from that day, half the people in Forsetti would think they were just stories. Gilf brought me back to solid ground. You're hunting them. You said so. Yes, I am. They jumped Lord Beale's company while Sir Garveon and I were gone, and Lord Beale and his daughter too. We killed four, but the rest got away with the gifts we were bringing their king. Get em anyhow, Gilf remarked. Perhaps he may, or some of them, but it won't be the same as Lord Beale giving them on behalf of King Arnthor. So we're looking for those Angerborn. I rode on ahead, and the rest are following as quick as they can, although that isn't very quick, since a lot are on foot now. I could find them. Want me to? You have sore paws. Gilf licked a front paw as if testing it. Not bad. I want you to stay with me, I decided. You were gone a long time looking for Pauk, and I didn't like it. Besides, you could use a few good meals. Sure, Gilf wagged his tail. I've got some dried meat here. I took it from his saddlebag and gave Gilf a piece. It's kind of salty. Can you drink the water in that hole? It's not so bad now after the rain. Busy chewing, Gilf nodded vigorously. You're probably wondering what happened to Monny. Gilf shook his head. He's back with Lady Idden. Gilf swallowed. Bad cat, bad. Not really. We talked it over. He wouldn't have been much use while I was out giant hunting, but he can keep an eye on things in Lord Beale's company for me. It might not be necessary, and I hope it isn't, but it's always better to be safe when you can. A cloud veiled the sun, and Gilf muttered, Elf. You mean Uri and Baki? Starting on his second strip of dried meat, Gilf nodded again. They're out looking for the Angerborn who robbed us. Nope. You mean they found you and freed you? I had them do that first. Now they're looking for those Angerborn. Smell em, Gilf muttered. There were giggles behind me, and I turned. Here we are, Uri announced. Baki said, If we had been Angerborn, we could have stepped on you. You elf can sneak up on anybody, Baki shook her head. Only on you stupid ones, Uri added. The rest always know when we are around. I asked whether the Angerborn knew. No, lord. The sun, which had slipped behind a cloud, showed its face again for a few seconds, rendering Baki, as well as Uri, transparent as she said, They are stupid, too. In that case you must have found them. We did. But, Lord... What is it? They are traveling fast. They can walk very fast, and they keep the mules trotting most of the time. Baki said, these hills level out up north, and there is the plain of Jotunland after that. I nodded. I understand. 
That is where their king's castle is. It is a very big building they call Utgard. The town is called Utgard, too. I nodded again. We have been in there, Uri said somberly. It is very, very big. Did you think the Tower of Glass was big? Yes, huge. You should see this. This is no joke, Lord, what you are doing. Baki said, It is a terrible place, and we want you to stop. Because you think I'll be killed? Both nodded. Then I'll be killed. Gilf growled deep in his throat. Lord, this is foolish. You— I raised my hand, and finding the rag still in it, began to clean my hauberk again. What's foolish is spending your whole life being scared of death. You believe that because some knight told you. Sir Rav, do you mean? No, he didn't tell me that. Only that a knight was to do what his honor demanded and never count his foes. But you're right just the same. A knight told me. That knight was me. People who fear death, Lord Beale does, I guess, live no longer than those who don't and live scared. I'd rather be the kind of knight I am, a knight who has nothing, than live like he does, with power and money that can never be enough. I got up and pulled on my hauberk. You're afraid the Angerborn will get to Utgard before I catch them. Isn't that what you were going to tell me? Uri shook her head. No, Lord, they are not far. You can overtake them today if you wish. But you would be alone, Baki added, and you would surely die. Those others, this Lord Beale you talk about and the other old gods who march with him, will never overtake the giants. Not if Utgard were a thousand times farther than it is, Uri confirmed. Then we've got to slow them down. I rolled up my own blankets and picked up the saddle blanket. I told Lord Beale I would, and I wish that was all I had to worry about. Pauk, Gilf explained to Uri and Baki. Exactly. We've got to set Pauk and Ulfa free. They'll be slaves here till they die if these Angerborn kill me. You found them, Gilf? He nodded. When I had saddled the stallion, I put on my helmet and buckled on Swordbreaker. All right, where are they? Utgard. Chapter 63 The Plain of Jotunland Night had fallen before we reached the Angerborn's camp, but it lay upon the bank of a wooded stream, and the fire they had built there, a fire of whole trees, some so thick through the trunk that a man with an axe would not have felled them after an hour's hard work, lit all the countryside. Two mules turned on spits above that fire. I had taken off helmet and hauberk and crept far into the firelight to see the Angerborn for myself. When I got back to the woods where Uribaki and Gilf were waiting, I had already formed a plan. There are only seven. I seated myself upon a log I could only just see. We argued about their number, and everybody thought there were more. In that case, you will not need our help, Uri declared. A mere seven giants? Why, you and your dog will have put an end to them before breakfast. Won't you fight them? Uri shook her head. You and Baki fought the mountain men. We distracted them mostly, so that you could fight them. We are really not very good at fighting on this level, Lord. Baki would not meet my eyes. Because they used to be your gods? Baki sighed, a ghostly whisper in the darkness beneath the trees. You were our gods, Lord. They never were. We could appear in their fire, Uri suggested, if you think it would do any good. But the giants are not afraid of us, Baki added. They would order us out, and we would have to go. If they did nothing worse, Lord, Yulf growled. Then you're not willing to help us. If that's how matters stand, you might as well go back to Elfris. We will if you order it, Lord, Uri told me, but we would rather not. I was disgusted. Tell me why I ought to keep you. Be reasonable, Lord, Uri edged toward me until her hip pressed mine. Her hip was as warm and as soft as that of any human woman. You yourself did not wish to fight them until you had rescued your servant. Mate, too. Gilf added. From Utgard. Suppose we fought all four of us, Baki and I, who can achieve next to nothing, and you and your dog. What would be the upshot? We would be killed, 
and more likely you and your dog would be, while Baki and I would have to flee to Aelfris or die. She stopped, inviting me to speak. I did not. What would be the good of that? A dead giant, too? None, if you trust my judgment. A knight and a dog to feed the crows. Let us delay them instead. Is that not what we set out to do? Ten minutes later, crawling through high grass toward a group of tethered mules, I found myself thinking that what I was doing was probably more dangerous than fighting. Every move I made rustled the grass, and if the anger-born had not heard me, the mules tied to the gnarled birch I was creeping up on certainly had. They were pretty easy to see because of the firelight. Their ears were up and forward, and their heads high. Their nervous stamping sounded louder than the purling of the stream. It seemed that the Angerborn must certainly hear it, and it struck me when I was very close that mules could kick and bite as well as or better than horses. They thought something was about to attack them, and they were by no means defenseless. Those frost giants are cooking a couple of you this very minute, I whispered. Money had said once that a few animals could speak. I had not believed him then, and did not believe him now, but it was at least possible that he had been truthful. You're supposed to be sensible animals. Don't you want to get away from here? I had continued to crawl while I talked. Now a rope touched my cheek. I drew my dagger and cut it, and heard a little snort of satisfaction from the mule whose tether it had been. Then I was at the tree, and dared stand up, keeping the trunk between me and the fire. My dagger was good and sharp, but the tethers were tough. I was still sawing at them when a loose mule wandered by. With a sort of overwrought absent-mindedness, I wondered whether it was one I had freed or one freed by Uri or Baki. The tether I had been cutting parted, and I found the next one. There was a rumble of angry voices, deep and loud, from the direction of the fire. One of the Angerborns stood up, another shouted, and a third snarled. I slashed at the tough tethers frantically. Half a bow shot off, a mule crossed a patch of moonlight galloping clumsily but fast, urged on by an elf maiden lying like a red shadow on its back. Another tether parted. Nearly dropping my dagger, I searched the trunk for more, but every one I found hung limp. Three Angerborn had left the fire and were walking toward me by that time, two shoulder to shoulder, the third lagging behind. Gilf! I shouted. Gilf! The bay of a hound on the scent answered me. In a moment that seemed long, it became the excited yelp of a hound with its prey in view. Somewhere a mule screamed, a stark cry of animal terror, and a dozen scattered in every direction. One of the giants dove for one as a man my size might have dived at a runaway goat, but it slipped through his hands. For a moment he held its tail, it kicked at his arm and vanished into the darkness. The black beast that had killed so many mice sprang at the throat of another Angerborn. Arms thicker than any man's body closed around it. Desiree! I ran to the fight. The third Angerborn was lumbering toward me when a mule with a crimson shadow on its back dashed in front of him and he tripped and fell. An Angerborn rolled toward me, wrestling a creature that was neither hound nor wolf, an animal far larger than a lion, like a boulder tossed by a wave. Swordbreaker's hard-edged, diamond-shaped blade struck and struck again. Without time or preparation that I could recall afterward, I found myself astride the ravening beast I had fought to save, and racing like the wind across the hills. I felt I rode a storm. Before the sun rose, Gilf had dwindled to his ordinary size, and not too long afterward, he and I found the white stallion where I had tied it the night before. Instead of mounting, I untied it and took off its saddle. You're tired, Gilf commented. You want to sleep? I'll watch. I am tired, I conceded, but I don't want to sleep and don't intend to. I want to talk. I'll go. I don't want you to go. You're mine, assuming that the Badachan had a valid claim on you, and I like you very, very much and want to keep you. But there are things I've got to know. I scare you. You'd scare anybody. Finding no log or stone to sit on, I sat in fern not far from the edge of the water. I'll go. I said I don't want you to. 
I don't even want you to hunt up a rabbit for us. We're still too near those frost giants for that. I want you to tell me what you are. Dog. Gilf sat too. No ordinary dog can do what you do. No ordinary dog can talk for that matter. Good dog. I groped for some way to frame a question that might get a useful answer, but had to settle for, Why is it you get big when you fight something at night? Because I can. When we got Monty, I wanted to think you were like him, Gilf growled. Okay, maybe I should have said I wanted to think he was like you, only a cat. That's how it seemed lots of times, but I'm pretty sure it's wrong. Gilf lay down and offered no comment. Monty knows a lot about magic from watching the witch who used to own him. You don't know anything about magic, so what you do isn't. I don't know what it is, but I know I need to think about it. Unless you tell me. Can't. Then maybe Uri can, or Baki. I called for them, but neither appeared. That's not good. I said, we've got to go to Utgard to get Pauk and Ulfa, and get back before Lord Beale's bunch gets here. We're going to need Uri and Baki, but we may not have them. Gilf raised his head. Think they know? Might know? They might, I said, and they might even tell us. The elf can change shape, I paused to think. Only not in the sunshine. But in Aelfris, Cedar changed into a man called Garseg, and Uri and Baki had been turned into chimeras. Or maybe turned themselves into chimeras, I don't know which. Seeing Gilf's look of incomprehension, I added, Flying monsters, only there's something wrong about all this. I can't put my finger on it, but I know there is. Sleep, Gilf suggested. I shrugged. You're right, I need sleep, and if I sleep, I might think of it. Only just till dark, all right? Wake me when it starts to get dark if you're awake. It was dangerous, I thought as I stretched myself on the cool fern. We were within a few miles of the Angerborn camp. If they searched the woods for the mules, they might find us. More likely, the white stallion might be seen and caught and used for a pack horse. But pushing myself and the stallion and even Gilf to the point of exhaustion would be worse yet and the lands nearer Utgard, from what I had been told, would have a lot more giants living in them than this dry hill country did. As sleep came nearer and nearer, I tried to imagine one of the Angerborn plowing with oxen the way one of our farmers would with a toy tractor. Try as I might, I could not do it. Water surged about me, carrying me with it. A school of fish like scarlet jewels passed, and met a second school of iridescent silver. They intermeshed past. The iridescent fish surrounded me and were gone. The girl face of Kulili lay below me as an island must lie below a bird. Her vast lips moved, but the only sound was in my mind. I made them. I shaped them as a woman molds dough, taking something from the trees, something from the beasts that felled the trees, and something from myself. I saw her hands then, hands knit of a million millions of threadworms, and desiry taking shape as they labored. That dream was lost among other, many others, dreams of death, long before my eyelids fluttered, but not lost completely. I woke at sunset, and in less than an hour I was riding north, with Gilf trotting beside the stallion. About the time the moon came up, I said, I think I've got it. Not everything, but a lot of the things that were bothering me. Gilf glanced up. About me? Other stuff, too. I was thinking you only changed at night. Mostly. Yeah, mostly, but not always. Not when you and me and old man Taug fought the outlaws, for instance. We went on in silence, the stallion picking his way through the darkness as the moon through the cold sky. Do you remember your mother, Gilf? Do you recall her at all? How she smelled. You got separated from her somehow. Do you remember anything about that? Wasn't to go. Gilf's deep voice sounded thoughtful. Went anyhow. I thought of little kids at home. You wandered off? Couldn't keep up. Brown people found me. The Bodachon, he grunted assent. They bowed to me when they gave you to me, remember? 
They tried to hide their faces. Yep. I think somebody in Alfris educated me, Gelf. I feel like I was taught a lot there, but I don't know why or what I learned. Huh. I don't even know if I really learned it. Only I think the Bodachan educated you, trained you, or whatever you're supposed to say about that. Taught you to talk, maybe. And I think probably they told you about changing shape, how to do it. And you shouldn't do it in the sunshine, not here in Mythgarther. Pigs. I reined up. What did you say? Pigs. Smell them. Do you think they're close? I strained to look about me in the darkness, and sensed rather than saw that Gilf had lifted his head to sniff the wind. Nope. We might as well go on, I decided after a minute or two. If we can't ride through this country at night, we sure can't ride through it in the daytime. When we had topped the next hill, Gilf remarked, Like em. The pigs? I had been lost in my own thoughts. Elf. They were good to you then, I'm glad. You too. You've had a rough time of it with me. Just once. In the boat? In the cave. I rode in silence after that. There was a nightingale singing in the trees beside the river, and I found myself wondering why a bird that would be welcomed wherever it went would choose to live in Jotunland. It made me remember how I had stayed at the cabin so I would not get in your way. I had not minded it, and in fact I had liked it a lot, and that made me realize that I liked being by myself out there in Jotunland, too. People are all right, and in fact some are truly good, but you do not see the Valfather's castle when you are with them. Besides, it was good to be alone with Gilf again. He had been right about the forest, and I had not thought nearly enough about that while it was happening. I thought a lot then about how he had gotten bigger, and about riding on his back instead of the stallions. He was a big, big dog, even when he was small, because it was the smallest he could make himself. If he could have, he would have been puppy-sized, like Mrs. Cone's Ming toy. It seemed to me a dog, a big dog like Gilf, was the best company anybody could have. I tried to think about who I would rather have with me than Gilf. Desiree, if she would love me. But what if she wouldn't? Desiree was wonderful, sure, but she was hard and dangerous, too. She would not be with me again until I found Eterni, and maybe not then. I thought that if she felt about me the way I felt about her, she would stick with me every second. Garveon would have been all right, but no Garveon was better, because he was really cedar. Idden would have been a terrible worry. Pauk would not have been bad. He would have wanted to talk, and I would have had to shut him up, but I knew how to do that. Finally, I hit on bold Berthold. He would have been perfect, and as soon as I thought of him, I missed him a lot. He had never been right the whole time I had known him, because of the way one side of his head was pushed in. He forgot things he should have remembered, and most of the time he walked like he was drunk. But when you were around him a lot, you could see the person he had been, the man who had wrestled bulls, and there was an awful lot of that left. There had been no school where he grew up, but his mother had taught him. He knew a lot about farming and woodcraft, and about the elf, too. I had never asked him what I was supposed to say when I spoke for them, and now it was too late. But I felt like he might have known. Bold Berthold would have been perfect. Ravd would have been wonderful, too. Why did the best people I met have to die? That got me thinking about his broken sword, how I had picked it up and put it down again and cried. And I thought that cave where we had found Ravd's broken sword must have been the one Gilf meant. At last I said, We've never been in a cave, except for the cave where the outlaws hid their loot, and we weren't in there long. Were you thinking of the cable tier? That was pretty bad for both of us. Just me, Gilf explained. You weren't there. Garseg's cave? I heard something about that. You were chained up in there? Yep. So Garseg had chained Gilf up like the Angerborn had, and for a while I wondered why Gilf had let either one of them do it. Finally I saw that he did not like to change into what he really was. 
He did it when he had to fight, but he would rather let somebody chain him up than change. Garseg's cave brings us back to shape-changing, I said, and your shape does change, but mostly you get bigger. Garseg told me once that though the elf could change their shapes, they were always the same size. No good. Oh, I'm sure it can be nice. Uri and Baki can take flying shapes, and I'd love to be able to do that. But if it's true, it isn't what you do. We're looking at different things that only seem to be about the same. I searched for an analogy. When I first left the ship with Garseg, there were these kelpies, sea elf, all around me. I was afraid I'd drown, and they said not to be afraid that I couldn't drown as long as I was with them. Gilf raised his head again, sniffing the wind. Later it was just Garseg and me, but I still didn't drown. After that I dove into a pool on glass. It went down into the sea, the Sea of Elfris, and I was alone under the water until I found Kulili, but I still didn't drown. See the hedro? Gilf inquired. I see a long dark line, I said. I've been wondering if it was a wall. Somebody's in it. I loosened Swordbreaker in her scampered. I think the best thing might be to pretend we don't know he's there for a while yet. When we're closer, you might have a look at him. Right. What I was trying to say is that the Kelpies probably could protect people who were with them, but that wasn't what was protecting me. What was protecting me was something I'd picked up when I was first in Aelfris, something that looked the same till you looked close. Huh. So you don't change like the elf change? Desire is tall and slim, but when we were alone, it was in a cave, but you weren't with me then at all, she made herself, you know, rounder. My cheeks burned, thinking about it. And that was nice. Only she had to be shorter, too, to do it. Is there just one person in the hedge? Badger, too. But just one human? Gilf sniffed again. Think so. I told Garseg about Desiree, how she had to be shorter to be rounder, but I should have thought about him. He turned himself into a dragon, and the dragon was a lot bigger than he was. He made himself look like me, too, although I'm bigger than he was. Could you make yourself look like me? Nope. Could you be that really big thing you are sometimes right now? Gilf grew. His eyes blazed like coals, and fangs two feet long pushed his lips apart. A moan of fear, faint but not too faint to hear, came from the hedgerow, and he bounded away. I urged my stallion after him. Chapter 64 A Blind Man with a White Beard By the time I reached Gilf, he was his everyday self again having decided that one large ordinary dog was more than enough to pin and hold an old woman. He backed away from her when I told him to, leaving her weeping and gasping, curled up like a prawn on the dry leaves under the hedge. Now, now, dismounting, I knelt beside her and laid a hand on her shoulder. Cheer up, mother. Gilf won't hurt you, and neither will I. The old woman only wept. Something dark connected the hands that covered her face, and examining it more by touch than by sight, I discovered that it was a chain of rough iron a bit longer than my forearm. I wish I had a lamp, I said. Oh, no, sir, don't wish for that, the old woman peeped between her fingers. Master'd see us sure, sir, if you was to light a lamp. You won't, will you? No, for one thing, I don't have one. Did your master put that chain on you? Who is he? Yes, sir, he done, sir. You're one of them knights, sir, ain't you? Like down south? That's right. When I was a girl, sir, I seen some that come to the village. Big men like you they was on big horses and iron clothes. Has you got iron clothes, sir? One hand left her face to stroke my arm. Well, I never. Are you a slave? An eerie wail filled my mind as I spoke. I shivered, but it soon dwindled to nothing. I asked your master's name. Whose slave are you? Oh, him, sir. He's not a good one, sir, not like his pa, but I've seen worse, sir. Hard, though, sir, hard. The old woman tittered. 
He'd like me better if I was younger, sir, you know how that is. His father did, sir, Hymer, that was, sir. I didn't like him, sir, for he was bigger in your horse twice, sir, only he was kindish to me because it. Only I didn't know it was kindish then, sir, only he wished I was bigger, sir, you know. And I found out after, for I'm too old now, sir. So Hindle leaves me be. It's the warm work for women, sir, is what they say, or else cold and starve. Only I don't know which is worse. Hindle is your master? The old woman sat up nodding. Yes, sir. Hindle is Angerborn, from what you've said about him. Is that the giant, sir? Yes, sir. They do claim her for their ma, sir. If you're running away from him— Oh, no, sir! The old woman sounded shocked. Why, I wouldn't do that. Why, I'd starve, sir, and never get back to where the regular people live. And if I did, I'd starve there, sir. Who'd feed a old woman like me? I would if I could, I told her. But you're right, I couldn't. Not now, at least. Why are you out here at night instead of home in bed? She tittered. Are you an elf? Have you taken the shape to have fun with me? Oh, no, sir. Then why are you out? You wouldn't believe, sir. Gilf whined, and I stroked his head, telling him he would leave in a minute or two. It's a man, sir. It is, and I shouldn't have laughed. Only it's a sore long way, sir, and I'm a weary with working all day. If... If you could ride me on for but a little, Ud, sir, I'll bless you till the day I die, sir. I nodded, thinking. I was about to say that if you were running away, I wished you all speed, but I couldn't give you much help. I have to go to Utgard as quick as I can. I hate to put any more weight on this horse, because he's lame already. You can't weigh half what I do, though, and my armor weighs half as much as I do. I stood and helped her rise noticing just how thin and worn she looked in the moonlight. So we'll just sit you up here. She gave a little squeal as I lifted her onto the white stallion's war saddle. That's it. You don't have sit astride, and I doubt that you could in those skirts. Leave your feet where they are and hold on to the cantle and pommel. I'll lead him, and he won't be going any faster than I can walk. Where are we going? She pointed down the hedgerow. It's a long, long way, sir. It can't be. I was watching where I stepped, and did not bother to look over my shoulder at her. Not if you were planning to walk it tonight. You would have gone home after two, and gone to bed? Yes, sir. Then it can't be far. I started jogging, something I hadn't done for a while. Ain't you afeard you'll lose your dog, sir? I strained to see him, but Gilf's seal-brown rump and long tail had disappeared in the moon shadow of the hedge. I'm not, mother. He's run ahead to scout out trouble, which is what I would have told him to do if I'd thought of it. Rabbits, too, sir, and got a deep mouth from the look of him. He does, but he won't be running rabbits this night. I jogged a hundred strides or so in silence, then slowed to a walk. Did you ever tell me what your errand is, mother? A man, you said? Yes, sir. She sounded terribly sad. You'll think I'm cracked, running after a man at my age. There's only one girl for me, I told her, and people think me cracked because of it. So you're a crazy woman on the charger of a crazy knight. We freaks have got to stick together and help each other, or we'll be left to howl in the swamp. Will you tell me about her, sir? For a year, but she isn't around, and your man is, or he will be soon, we hope. Is he a good man, and does he know you're coming? Yes, sir, she sighed. He is, and he do, sir. Can I tell you how it is with him and me, sir? Twould ease my mind, and you can laugh if you want to. May, I muttered, jogging again. Yes, I may, but I don't think I will. Years and years ago it were, sir. Him and me lived in a little bit of a place down south. Every girl there had a eye for him, sir, but him he had a eye for me. And nobody else would do. That's what he said, sir, and the way it was, too. I know how that is, mother. May every overkind there be bless you for it and her, too. 
the old woman was quite a while lost in reminiscence. I got took, sir. The giants come looking for us the way they does, sir, when the leaves turn and they don't mind moving around. And they found me. Heimer did, sir, my master, what was. So I had to, had to do what I could for him, and get it all over me often as not, and— And Heimer got born, sir, my son that was. Only Master Hindle's run him off now, or he'd help me, I know. She paused. He's not what you'd call a good-looking boy, sir, and it's me, his mother, what says it. Nor Foxy neither, and didn't talk till after he was bigger'n me. But his heart. You're a good-hearted man, sir, as good as ever I seen. But your heart's no bigger'n my Heimer's, sir. No woman's never had no better son. That's good to know. For me it is, sir. Ain't you getting tired, sir? I could walk a ways and you ride. I'm fine. The truth was that it felt good to stretch my legs, and I knew I owed the stallion a little rest. You've run quite a ways, and it's a good ways more. I closed my mind. I wanted to tell her, but it was not easy. And I think about the sea, about the waves coming to a beach, wave after wave after wave, never stopping. Those waves turn into my steps. I think I see, sir. The old woman sounded like she did not. I float on them. It's something somebody taught me, or maybe just told me about, and let the sea teach me, not magic. The sea is in everybody. Most people never feel it. Saying those things made me think of Garseg, and I wondered all over again why Garseg did not come to see me in Mythgarther. It opened me up, it did, having my Heimer. So then we could, if you take my meaning. Like a real wife should, sir, the regular way. You and the Angerborn, who had taken you, mother, this Heimer? Yes, sir, not that I wanted it, sir, hurt dreadful every time. But he wanted it, and what he said went in them days. So then I had my Hila, only she's run off. Master shouldn't touch her, her being his half-sister, only she's... Well, sir, you wouldn't say it, sir. She's got that big jaw they all have, sir, and the big eyes, you know, and cheeks like the horns on a calf, sir, if you take my meaning. Only good skin, sir, and yellow hair like I used to, too. That yellow hair's why my master that was, that was her father, took me, sir. He told me that one time, so it was bad luck to me. Only if it had been black or brown like most, probably he'd have killed me. The hedgerow had ended, though the path had not, weaving its way among trees and underbrush bordering the river. There was times, the old woman muttered, when I wished he had. Is it your son Hymir we're going to meet? Oh, no, sir, I don't know where he's at, sir. It's the man I told you about, him I was going to marry all that time ago. He's got took now, sir, if you can believe it. Got took for fighting them like he did with a white beard, if you can believe it. And, and I hope your horse don't fright him, sir. The noise of it, I mean. I smiled. He clops along no louder than other horses, I hope, and somebody with guts enough to fight the Angerborn isn't likely to be afraid of any horse. Besides, he'll see you on his back, unless the moon— Oh, no! He won't, sir! He can't, sir! It's— It's what makes him think, sir, deep down, you know. The old woman sounded as if she were choking, and I glanced back at her. Makes him think what? That I'm like I was back then, sir. You— You're young yet, sir. I know, mother. Younger than you can guess. And just to have him think like he does deep down. Oh, I've told him, sir, I couldn't lie about nothing like that. Only when he sees me inside of himself. And that's the only way he can, sir. You're young again. For him. Yes, sir. Sometimes I'd like to be young again myself, mother. Young outside as well as inside. I take it he's blind. Yes, sir. 
They blinds em, sir, mostly, the men I mean. Big as they are, they're afeard o' our men. The old woman's pride kindled new warmth in her voice. So they blinds em, and they blinded him old as he was. He sees me, sir. Whining, Gilf had trotted out of the night. I dropped the reins and laid a hand on Gilf's warm, damp head. You found someone. Although I could scarcely see Gilf's nod, I felt it. Dangerous? A shake of the head. A blind man with a white beard? Gilf nodded again. From the white stallion's back, the old woman said, Up there's where we meet, sir. See that big tree up against the sky? It's on top a little hill, only we got to go through the ford first. We will, I told her. Chapter 65 I'll Free You The ford proved shallow when we reached it, its gentle, quiet water scarcely knee-deep. On the other bank I dried my feet and legs as well as I could with a rag from my saddlebag and pulled my stockings and boots back on. It's deeper in the spring, the old woman explained. It's the only place where you can cross, then. Will you help me down, sir? I rose. On the warway I saw a ford so deep we didn't dare ride across it for fear we'd be swept away. I took the old woman by the waist and lifted her down. We had to hold each other's stirrup straps and lead our horses while the water boiled around us. You couldn't have got across, sir, in spring. Only the giants. I nodded. From here I'd better go ahead, sir. I'll walk as fast as I can, if you'll follow me. You won't leave me, will you? I want you to see him, sir, and, and you and him talk. I won't, I promised. I need to speak to both of you about the road to Utgard. You and your horse'll have to go pretty slow or else get to where he is afore I do. I nodded as I watched her vanish into the night. Under my breath I said, We'd better wait here for a minute or two, Gelf. Yep. Was there just the one old man? Yep. Good man. Gilf seemed to hesitate. Let him pet me. Was he strong? Gilf considered. Not like you. Some distance off, a hoarse voice called, Gerda! Gerda! Close now, Gilf muttered. Close enough for him to hear her footsteps anyway, and for us to hear him. I picked up the lame stallion's reins. Hungry. So am I, I conceded. Do you think they might find a little food for us? There ought to be tons in the house of one of the giants. Yep. Where is the house, anyway? Did you see it? Other side of the hill. I tossed the reins onto the stallion's neck and mounted. There should be sheep and pigs and so forth, too. If worst comes to worst, we can steal one. I touched the stallion's sides with my spurs, and he set off at a limping trot. Got your bow? Bow and quiver were slung on the left side of my saddle. I held them up. Why do you want to know? They blind them, Gilf said, and trotted ahead. The hill was low and not at all steep. I stopped near the top to take a good look at the black bulk of a farmhouse a good way off that seemed in the moonlight too big and too plain. Over here, sir, the old woman called. Under the tree. I know. I dismounted and led the stallion over. Dog's here already, it was a man's hoarse voice. Nice dog. Yes, he is. Wishing I had a lantern, I joined them, leaving the stallion to get whatever supper he could from the dry grass. I'm a knight of Shearwall Castle, father. Sir Abel of the High Heart is my name. Abel, the old man said. I'd a brother of that name. I nodded. It's a good one, I think. His name's Berthold, sir, Gerda said. Bold Berthold, they called him when we was young. In a little spot of moonlight I could see bold Berthold's hand grope for hers and find it. Chapter 66 Which Am I? Of course I knew who he was then, and I wanted to hug him and cry, but I knew, too, that he would never believe who I was. And if he did, 
He would believe all over again that I was the brother he had lost. I could not have handled it, and I knew it. I made my voice as hard as I could, and I said, I've brought Gerda safely to you, and that's what I promised her I'd do. You two have got a lot to talk about, and I've got urgent business in Utgard. How do I get there? North, Old Berthold muttered. Follow the star, that's all I heard. You've never been there yourself? No, sir. I haven't, neither, Gerda said. You must have heard reports. It's a bad place even for them, sir. I hate to see a young man like you go in there. Old Berthold was groping for me. Can I feel of you? You sound like my brother. I touched Bold Berthold's hand. Bigger than mine. His hand had clasped mine. He ain't but a slip of a lad, my brother ain't. Gerda said, I recollect Abel now. He was little when you was big, that's right. But he must be as old as us or near it. Abel was took. Gone years and years. When he come back, he wasn't no older than before. Twasn't last year, year for that, maybe. Old Berthold fell silent, and from the twitching of his white beard, I knew his mouth was working. Thought he'd come get me. Maybe he's trying. Wasn't but a slip of a boy, only he growed. There's a Abel here now, Gerda reminded him. Gilf wagged his tail, a faint rustling among the fallen pine needles. I've been trying to get her to run with me, sir, Bold Berthold explained. Only she won't, and I won't without she does. So we don't, neither one. I nodded, although Bold Berthold could not see it, and it is doubtful that Gerda could. That's right. She told me she didn't want to escape. I only said it because I wasn't sure I could trust you, sir. Not that I wasn't. I'd like to, if we could not get caught, she spoke to Bold Berthold. That's why I brought him. He's a knight, a real knight, and not feared of anything. He'll help us. They don't care about common folk, Bold Berthold mumbled. I'll help you if I can, I told him. Only there's no point in either of you going to Utgard with me, and I have to go there to free my servant. I sighed wondering whether I could really pull it all off. Also, a woman called Ulfa, who helped me one time. Pauk's blind now, I suppose, but I have to free him just the same. No, more than ever. I had not meant to add, just as I've got to free you and Gerda, but it slipped out. Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. After that I have to help a certain baron take back the treasure he was bringing King Gilling. Then maybe I can find Svan and Org. Svan's my squire. Org is... I don't think you'd understand. But I wish he were here, and Svan too. At my elbow, a new voice said, I will find them for you if you want me to, Lord. Gerda gave a small shriek. Not yet, I told Uri. I've been wondering where you two were. Scattering the mules, of course. The Angerborn would have them all back by this time if it were not for us. Are you all over black? Gerda asked Uri. I can't hardly see you even. It's like I was blind myself or as bad as. I am a woman of the fire, Eilf, Uri explained and brightened until she glowed like a red-hot poker. Come and to torment me, Bold Berthold rumbled. Well, do your worst, all of you. I am on my lord's business, Uri told him. If you desire to be tormented, I will try to find someone to do it when I have more time. Old Berthold's right hand darted out, catching her by the neck. There, I got her, Sir Abel. Please let her go. She's no enemy of yours or mine. Old Berthold's left hand found Uri's arm, and he released his hold upon her neck. Don't feel solid-like. They never does. They seem less real here than we do, just as we seem more real in Aelfris than we do here. Inwardly, I was full of doubt, but I kept going. Uri and Baki, Baki's another Aelf maiden, fade and get weak under our sun. Uri said, Will you not make him release me, lord? 
What have I done to you or to him that was less than good? Gerda muttered, Let her go, Bert, and tapped his hand, but bold Berthold did not. Well, you picked me up and flew away with me one time, I told Uri. You and Baki and some more of your friends, I paused, considering. I don't think you should have asked me that question. Then we will say I did not ask it. It's a little late for that, I rubbed my chin. Was I more real than you and Baki and Aelfris, Uri? Garseg told me I was. Gerda tittered nervously. These are questions for philosophers, Lord. You and Baki have visited me here many times. Why doesn't Garseg come to me here the way you do? These is bad and Sir Abel, Bolt Bertold declared. Don't you trust them? I have already, I sighed again. Often. Why doesn't Garseg come, Uri? You have asked previously, Lord. Inquire of Garseg himself. I don't have to, because I know the answer. So do you. Why don't you say it? I tried to sound like I had not just thought of it. Uri did not speak. Her fire died, so that for a moment it seemed bold Berthold held empty darkness. Okay, let's go on to another question, one you won't be able to say I've asked already. Since you, Eilf, can fight any time in Eilfris, and there are thousands and thousands of you there, we cannot fight like you, Lord. Why does Garseg want me to fight Kulili for him? A whole host of you, Eilf, couldn't kill her, yet Garseg, who's afraid to come here and talk to me, wanted me to fight her for him. Doesn't that seem peculiar? May I speak freely, Lord? Sure, I said. These are high matters. It is not well to speak of them before persons of no distinction. Before Gerda and her friend, you mean? Yes, Lord. I don't agree that they're without distinction, Uri. But to spare your feelings, I'll just say one thing, then we can talk about something else. The one thing is that Garseg did come here to Mythgarther. He came when I was wounded, and we talked a little on the Western Trader. He came again when we were on the Tower of Glass. Did I promise I'd say one more thing, only one? Yes, Lord. "'Twasn't no promise,' Gerda put in. "'If it was a promise, I'm going to break it,' I told her, "'because I want to tell Uri that Garseg looked unreal in both places. "'He looked like thin blue glass even when I saw him by starlight. "'Is that enough, Uri?' "'More than enough, Lord. "'You understand that I know the answers to all the questions I asked you?' "'Yes, Lord. I am your slave, Lord, your most humble worshipper. You'll tell Garseg when you return to Aelfris. Don't you and Baki meet with him there to report on me? Lord, I have no choice. I shrugged. Where's Baki? Still scattering the mules, Lord. Uri sounded very, very relieved. There remain a few the anger-born have not yet caught. She affrights them in various ways, as I did where they were more. We also took the forms of donkeys and other things to lead the Angerborn astray. What will she do when the last is caught? Come here, Lord, to tell us so. Good. Old Berthold, is that the house of your owner to the north? Must be no others round here. Gerda added, Yes, sir. Bimer's his name, a harder master no one never found. Has this Bimer no cattle? I saw no barn. Bold Berthold chuckled. Eyes don't know everything, Sir Knight. Cow shed and barns on the other side of the house. House is big, but the cows ain't. I understand. Who milks them? I do, sir. That's good. Gilf and I are tired and hungry. So is my horse. We're going to sleep in that barn. Don't tell your master. No, sir. We'll go now and take Uri with us. When you get home, I want you to find some food for us. Can you do it? Yes, sir, and I will. Thanks. We'll leave in the morning, and we won't take anything else or do any harm while we're there. Gerda said, What about us, sir? I have to go to Utgard for Pauk and Ulfa. I told you about that. When I've got them, we'll come back this way and take you south with us. You're a good man. I knew it. Soon as I saw the old lady with you, sir. 
Can't pay, Bold Bertold muttered. Wish I could. You'll pay with the food from your master's kitchen. I had not understood Gerda and decided to ignore it. Let go of Uri now. Bold Bertold did, and Uri skipped from the shadow of the pine into the moonlight. Thank you, Lord. You're welcome. Go and have a look at that farm for us, then come back and tell me about it. The lame stallion had strayed quite away down the hillside while we talked, but Gilf caught it without much trouble. When we were some distance from the hilltop, and about half a mile from Beimer's hulking farmhouse, he said, Which one's really me? I asked what he was talking about. You said about Garseg, he isn't real here. That wasn't quite it. I considered what I ought to say. Do you remember the man with wings? Sure. You liked him? A lot. Then maybe you noticed that the log he sat on didn't seem as real as he did. Neither did the pool or the woods. It wasn't that they weren't real, and it wasn't that they had changed, either. Mythgarther hadn't changed, but he was more real than Mythgarther or anything in it. When Uri and Baki come here from Aelfris, they seem like they're as real as we are, but they're not and when the sun hits them, you see it. When Garseg came here, you could see it even at night. Gilf trotted on in silence for a minute or two. Then he asked, Is it the way I am now, or is it the way I am when we fight? I don't know. I understand a lot more of this than I used to, but I don't understand it all. Maybe I never will. Do I seem realer like this, or the other way? Maybe you're real both ways. I know you want to talk about you, but I'm going to talk about Garseg some more because I don't understand you and I never have, but I think I'm beginning to understand him better than I did at first. You got him to heal me. Did you like him? Nope, not much. But they said he could do it. He said he didn't. He said the sea healed me, but later on when I was hurt in Shearwall, Baki did it. You weren't there then. Nope. I bit her and drank her blood. It sounds horrible when I say it like that. Not to me, Gelf declared. Well, it does to me. Only when we did it, it wasn't really horrible at all. It was nice, and I understood the elf better afterward. Maybe Garseg couldn't have come up here at all if his father hadn't been human. Was it the Kelpies who told you to find Garseg? It must have been. Yep. Maybe they bit him when they were hurt. Did I ever tell you about the dragon? I mean about Garseg's turning into one? Gilf looked up in surprise. Wow. Yes, it jolted me too. But when I had time to think about it more, which wasn't till we separated, it surprised me a lot more. We were on a really narrow staircase, and the chimeras were diving down at us to knock us off, Uri and Baki and a bunch of others. Gilf grunted to show he appreciated the seriousness of that situation. Dragons can fly. There were pictures in Shearwall, one on one of those embroidered wall hangings they had, and one on a big flagon that Duke Martyr drank out of at dinner. They had wings, both of them. Uh-huh. Besides, I know Cedar can. I've seen him do it. So if Garseg could turn into a dragon, which he did, why not a big dragon with wings? He could have chased the chimeras. You can't change yourself like that, can you? Besides getting a lot bigger and fiercer the way I've seen? Nope. Gilf stopped, one forefoot up, to point with his nose at the enormous steeple-roofed house of rough boards we were headed for. Maybe we should go round. I thought, then shook my head. Chapter 67 you lose track. The interior of the barn was as black as pitch, but Gilf's nose found corn for the white stallion, and the stallion almost as quickly found a water trough for himself. I removed his saddlebags, saddle and bridle. And while I was searching for a place to put them, by sheer good luck I bumped into the ladder to the hayloft. Moonlight crept in there, so that after the blind dark below it seemed bright enough to read in. I forked down half a cartload of hay for Gelf and the stallion, took off my boots, and fell asleep as soon as I lay down. Thunder woke me up, 
thunder, lightning, and driving rain that came through every crack in the roof of the barn. I sat up, afraid and not knowing what had happened, and the next time the lightning flashed I was looking squarely into the ugly face of the frost giant I had seen years ago beside the griffin. The giant, whose face and towering stature, and sent me running back to bold Bertholds to warn him. Thought I wouldn't see your horse's tracks. The giant's voice was deep and rough, and would have been terrifying if heard thus suddenly on a sunny summer day. It suffered now in comparison to the thunder. Thought the rain would wash him out, didn't you? I shook my head, yawned, and stretched. He wanted to talk before he fought, and that was fine with me. I didn't know it was going to rain, and didn't care whether you saw my horse's hoofprints or not. Why should I? Sneaking. Hiding. Not me. I rose and dusted off the hay in which I had slept, wondering all the while where Gilf was. Traveling late is what you mean. I've got urgent business with King Gilling, and I rode till my horse was fit to drop. If you had been awake, I'd have begged food and accommodation from you, but your lights were out. I came in here and did what I could. Can you spare a bite of breakfast? The lightning flashed again, and I realized with a sort of sick relief that his head was not severed in standing on the floor before me, but thrust up the hatch in the floor. Night, ain't you? That's right. I'm Sir Abel of the High Heart, and your hospitality has earned my gratitude. Another lightning flash showed a hand coming at me. I drew Swordbreaker and struck at the darkness where that hand had been. The sickening crack of breaking bone was followed by a bellow of pain from the giant. The whole barn shook when he crashed into some part of it. For a second I could hear the thudding of his footsteps through the rattle of the rain. A distant door slammed. He would doctor his hand, I decided, and perhaps fetch some weapon. The question was whether he had barred his door as well as slamming it. No, I decided as I climbed down the ladder. There were really two questions. The other one was, could I beat him? Bold Berthold was outside, between the house and the barn, feeling his way through the driving rain with a stick, and hugging something wrapped in rags to his chest. Here I am, I called and trotted over to him, wet to the skin and nearly blown off my feet the minute I left the barn. The stick found me, and he tried to give me his bundle. Come looking for you last night, but you wasn't there. In the barn you said, and I poked everywhere and called your name, only I never could find you. I was in the hayloft asleep. I felt a sudden shame. I should have thought about you. I'm sorry. He took me by the arm. You hurt my master? I tried to. I think I broke a bone in his hand. Then you got to get away. A flash of lightning showed bold Berthold's contorted face and the empty sockets that had held kind brown eyes. Was he the one who blinded you? Don't matter. He'll kill you. It does matter, was it? They all do it. His voice shook with urgency. You got to run. Now. No. You've got to get me into the house. Into the kitchen would be best. There were half a dozen knives in there, but they were of a size for the trembling women who served Bimer, and not for Bimer himself, knives hardly bigger than my dagger. He's coming, one of the women called as I rummaged through a clattering drawer, and in desperation I snatched a spit long enough for oxen from a vast fireplace. One end was offset to make a crank, the other sharp so it could be run through the carcasses. I put that end into the glowing coals, feeling the sea of battle pounding in my veins and waiting for the storm. When Bimer lumbered through the doorway at last, his groin was level with my eyes. I rammed the sharp end of the spit into it. When he bent double, into his throat. He would have fallen on me if I had not jumped to one side. When I got the spit out, I saw that he had bent it a little in falling. I straightened it over my knee. Was that him? Bold Berthold gasped. That what fell? The women, there were three, all slatternly and thin, assured him it had been. I had taken hold of Bimer's left boot and pulled the leg straight. He doesn't seem so big now that he's lying here. Look at the blood, 
one of the women whispered. Don't slip in it, sir. I'll try not to. I had been avoiding the seething mess anyway for the sake of my booths, although I was tempted to stamp on the ugly little creatures that swam in it. Four and a half steps. I'm going to say a yard for each step, so he was thirteen and a half feet tall or about that. It's good to know. I turned to face bold Berthold, laying my hand on his shoulder. I have to go to Utgard, as I told you last night, but I'll come back as quick as I can. In the meantime, I want you and these women to cut up this body and get rid of it in any way that works. If other Angerborn ask, Yes, lad, what is it? The wind. The wind is in the chimney. A wild north wind moaned there as I spoke, as though it had heard me. In a storm like this, un, tis a big chimney, sir, and the wind always gets in there. I've got to go. Gilf's gone already, it seems. After the Valfather's pack, though I didn't hear them tonight. Is my horse still in the barn? Suppose so, sir. Found it there when I was looking for you. Your saddle's there, too. I'll come back as soon, as soon as I do. I snatched the rag-wrapped bundle bold Berthold been holding, clamped it under my arm, and dashed out into the storm again. The nearest wood, I felt sure, had been the one where Gerda and bold Berthold had met. I recalled that it had been on the side of the house opposite the barn. Keeping the wind to my left as well as I could, I spurred the stallion until water and mud exploded from under his hooves. Lightning showed me moss-grown trunks, and I shouted for desire. There was no reply, but the rain stopped. Not slacked, but stopped altogether. No lightning flashed, no thunder boomed, and no icy drops fell from the leaves above my head, even when I stirred them with my hand. The darkness remained, but it was darkness less black than green. From the slope of some far mountain, a wolf howled. I rode on and crossed a purling silver stream that was never the small river of Jotunland. No sun rose and no stars shone, yet the green dark seemed to fade. Although the air around me hung motionless, save where my breath disturbed it, a wind soughed among the treetops, chanting a thousand names, among them both of mine. I reined up to listen and rose in the stirrups to be nearer the sound. Warlewine, Wace, Vortigern, Kjot. The names that I had heard, my own, were not repeated. Yvain, Gottfried, Eilhart, Palamedes, Duak, Tristan, Albrecht, Karadek. Someone was running toward me, running, stumbling, and running again. I heard the runner's gasps and sobs before the leaves parted, and a teenager with staring eyes and torn clothes stumbled through to cling to my boot. "'Who are you?' I asked. His mouth opened and closed, but only sobs came out. "'You're dirty enough and scared almost to death, it seems like. Is somebody chasing you?' Still sobbing, he shook his head. "'This is Aelfris, isn't it?' I paused to look around. It's got to be, but if that's your natural shape, you're no elf. Why were you running? Pointing to his mouth, he shook his head again. Hungry? He nodded, and it seemed to me that a glimmer of hope came into his eyes. I don't... Wait a minute. Bold Berthold's bundle was a good-sized loaf of coarse bread and a lump of cheese. I tore the loaf in two, broke the cheese, and gave the smaller halves of each to him. It was fresh bread and good cheese. It's polite to talk at table, I told him when I had swallowed the first bite. When I was little, my brother and I just dug right in, but that's not the way they eat at Duke Martyr's Castle. You're supposed to talk about the weather or hunting or somebody's new horse. Pointing to his mouth as he had before, he shook his head. You can't talk? He nodded. I dismounted. Swallow that cheese and open your mouth. I want to have a look. He did as he was told. Still got your tongue? I thought maybe somebody'd cut it out. He shook his head. Lord Beale told me once that if you hit somebody's face with witch hazel, you see the true shape. Maybe that would work on you, but I don't see any around here. Is that your true shape? He nodded. Maybe you were born like this? 
He shook his head. You know, you look familiar. He did, too. I tried to recall the boy Maud Gouda had sent for Pauk. How'd you get to Elfris? He pointed to me. I brought you? He nodded, still crying. Just now? Taking a bite from what remained of the cheese, I thought about that. You followed me from Bimer's farm? The boy shook his head. But I brought you? Another nod. I snapped my fingers. Taug! A round dozen joyful nods. I was here with you. It's been years ago. It doesn't seem like it, but I guess it has been. How long have you been here? He shrugged. It seems like that's the way it always is. You lose track here. Maybe there really isn't any time. Let's see. Queen Desiree took you? Looking frightened, Taug nodded. She said she had something to tell you or to ask you. The two of you went off together and you never came back. Taug shook his head. You did? When? Taug pointed to the ground at his feet. Now? Taug nodded. You just left her? He nodded again. Can you take me to the place? Another nod. Then let's go. He pointed to the stallion, his eyes questioning. You're right, we can ride faster than we can walk, even through these trees. I let him climb into the saddle and got up behind him. Hold on to the pommel and point. Which way? I won't let him trot much. Crying again, he pointed. I clapped my borrowed spurs to the stallion's sides. Chapter 68 In the Grotto of the Griffin Twilight found us among mountains, camped beside a rushing stream. This isn't Elfris. It was something I had said before. Taug nodded miserably as he had the other time. It was in this gorge that things changed, I think. One end is in Elfris and the other here, for us, for today. That's how it seems to me, anyway. I've been in mountains like these before, and it wouldn't surprise me if these are the same ones, though I haven't seen the warway. Was it near here you parted from Desiree? Taug rose and began to walk, pointed, then indicated by a gesture that I was to follow. With a worried glance back at the tethered stallion, I did. By the time we reached the carved stone from which the stream issued, the light had failed. The place where water came out was a big cave, I thought at first, a cave with an overhanging downward curved roof, so that the long, smooth expanse of stone over which the water flowed seemed almost a portico. It was not until I returned to our fire and came back with two burning sticks that I saw the eagle eyes and the pointed ears. I would have gone in then, as Taug urged by eager smiles and gestures. There is danger within. I turned, but the location and identity of the speaker were lost in darkness. It was my home once. The voice was deep and slow and lisping. I felt sure it came from no human lips. I raised my burning sticks, moving them to fan the flame. Something huge clung to the cliff face, something ghostly white and assuredly not human. Strength will not avail against Grengon, the great voice announced, until you grasp Eterni, as you will, nor will cunning once you have her. Wings sprouted from the white form on the cliff face, each wing larger than Beale's pavilion. It sprang into the air. Lightnings played about its wings. The wind those wings raised blew out my sticks and knocked Taug off his feet and nearly into the rushing water. For seconds that seemed whole minutes, that ghostly shape eclipsed the moon. Then it was gone. I helped Taug stand up and grabbed him by the shoulders. Desiree isn't here, is she? He could not speak, and if he nodded or shook his head, it was too dark for me to catch it. Listen now, I told him, and listen good. I told you to take me to Desiree, not here. She talked about this sword, getting it for me. I wouldn't wear a sword because of it. I didn't want a substitute. I didn't want a compromise. I wanted Eterni, the sword she'd promised me. But that's not what I want now. I want her. Taug had begun to sob, and realizing that I had been shaking him hard, I dropped him. 
Only her. I poked Taug with the toe of my boot to make sure he had understood. You can wait here if you want to. I'm going back to the fire. He clung to me all the way back, and when we got there and I had thrown all the wood we had collected onto it, I said, You're afraid of that thing that talked to us. So am I. What was it? He just stared. A griffin? He nodded. You saw it before, I suppose, when you were here with Desiree. There aren't supposed to be any, not really, not any more, and most people would say not ever. Sensible people never believe in things like that. Half to myself I added, Of course, there aren't supposed to be ogres either, but orgs real enough. Probably you're afraid the griffin's going to eat you. Tog nodded again. Or the dragon will, because there is a dragon in there. That's what the griffin said. Grengarm, he's a dragon, the one who has my sword. Did you see him too? Taug shook his head. Well, you're not going to. We're going to Utgard. Your sister's there, for one thing, and you and I are going to get her out. You don't have a blanket, he nodded, looking hopeless. You can use the saddle blanket, but you'd better get more wood for the fire before you even try to sleep. While he was collecting fallen branches from the sparse growth near the water, I got my bedding out of my saddlebag and lay down. If you decide to head back to Glenadam on your own, I said, bon voyage, and I hope you have a fun trip. But if you take anything of mine, I'll come after you. If the mountain men don't get you, I will. Remember that. In dream, I was a boy I had never been, running over the downs with other boys. We caught a rabbit in a snare, and I wept at his death and for some vast sorrow approaching that I sensed but could not see. We skinned and cleaned the rabbit and roasted it over a little fire of twigs. I choked on it, fell unconscious into the fire, and so perished. I had wanted to save the bones for my dog, but I was dead, and my dog had followed the wild hunt, and the rabbit's steaming flesh was burning in my throat. It was still dark when I woke, but no longer quite so dark as night should have been once the moon had set. Taug crouched weeping on the other side of the fire, a small fire now, although there were a score of charred stubs around it. Rising, I gathered them up and tossed them into the flames. "'What are you afraid of?' I asked, and when he made no gesture in reply, I sat down beside him and put my arm over his shoulders. "'What's the matter?' he pointed to his mouth. You can't talk. Do you know why you can't? Sobbing, he nodded and pointed to my side. Did Desiree do this to you? He nodded again, and after that I sat up with him until the renewed fire had very nearly burned itself out, and since he could not talk I talked a good deal, all about Desiree and my most recent adventures. At last I said, You wanted me to go into the mountain where the dragon is. Was that because Desiree told you you'd be able to speak again if I did? He picked up a scrap of charred wood and smeared a long mark on a flat stone with a smaller one across it. The sword? He nodded. You'll be able to talk again if I can get Eterni? Nodding vigorously, he smiled through his tears. His eyes shone. I rose. You stay here. You'll have to look after my horse, but you can use my blankets. Don't touch my bow or my quiver. You grew up in the forest, didn't you? Of course you did. You ought to know how to set snares. You must be hungry, and now that the bread and cheese are gone, we don't have anything here. I stopped for a minute to think things over, then added, I wouldn't try to get back to Aelfris if I were you. The carved griffin's face, when I reached it and could inspect it by daylight, was even larger than I had imagined, huge, ancient, and weather-worn. That great beak might have crushed a bus, and its bulging, staring, frightful eyes were a good half-bowshot up the cliff face. Something about those eyes troubled me, so that I studied them for quite a while before shrugging and seating myself on a stone to pull off my boots and stockings. Those eyes had been trying to tell me something but I was pretty sure I would never understand it. The griffin raced out of the griffin's mouth, icy cold and foaming. Even though the water seldom reached my knees, I was forced to tuck my boots into my belt and cling to every little handhold I could find on the side so that I could work my way up the slope against the current. When it seemed that I had gone a long way into the mountain, 
I stopped and looked back. The circle of daylight that was the carved griffin's mouth seemed as distant and as precious as the America I still thought of now and then, a lost paradise that faded with each struggling step I managed. A knight, I told myself, doesn't bother to count the enemy. Another step and another. But I wish I'd found Desiree, that I could see her once more before I go. Ben, I cannot tell you how I knew then that I was going to lose even the memory of her. But I did. Later, when the daylit opening seemed no bigger than a star, I said, I wish Gilf were here. There was light ahead. I hurried forward, fighting a stream that was deeper but less swift, and plunged into dark water, stepping into a well that I had failed to see and sinking at once under the weight of my mail. Fighting it like a maniac, I pulled it through my sword belt and over my head, and sent it plunging to the bottom before I realized I was in no danger of drowning. I could not breathe under the water, but I had no need to. I swam back to the surface, it seemed very remote, and pulled myself out, spitting water and shivering. When I got my breath, I found that the wide chamber in which I huddled was not entirely dark. Two apertures, high in its wall, the griffin's eyes, admitted faint beams of daylight, and those beams focused on an altar, small and very plain, some distance from it. Finding that I was still alive and in urgent need of exercise to warm myself, I got up and went over to look at it. The side facing me was featureless smooth stone, the top equally plain, and dampened by slow drops that fell like rain from the ceiling. The other side had been carved, however, and though the thin daylight from the griffin's eyes did not find its incised curls and flourishes, I traced them with my fingers. Can tell, Allah, lo, call and I will come. I can't read, I told myself, not the way they talk here or the way they write what they say, so how come I can read this? And then, these are elf letters. I stood up half-stunned. A thousand memories washed over me like the warm blue waves of that crystal sea, the laughing Kelpies who had carried me to Garseg's cave, the drowning island, the long swift swim that brought us to the Tower of Glass. Call and I will come. Then call I do, I said. It sounded louder than I had intended it to, and echoed and re-echoed through the chamber. I call upon the griffin or on whoever's altar this may be. My words died away to a murmur, and nothing happened. I went back to the well from which the little river we called the griffin rose. There was no sword, no griffin, and no dragon in the grotto in which I stood, but my boots were in there, somewhere down in that well, with my stockings still stuffed down in them. They were floating between the surface and the bottom, very likely. My mail was in there, too on the bottom beyond doubt. I took off my sword belt, wiped sword breaker and my dagger as well as I could, and stripped. Trying to remember the swing of the sea, I dove in. The water was bitterly cold, but as clear as crystal, so clear that I could see a little bit by the dim light from the grotto. Way down where the light had just about faded away, something dark floated past my face. I grabbed at it, and it was a boot. I relaxed and let the current carry me up. With a triumphant roar, I broke the surface. I threw my boot out of the well, pulled myself up, and sat shaking on its edge. If I had found one boot, I might be able to find the other. If I found them both, it might be possible to get back my mail. I got up and emptied the water from the boot I had rescued. My stocking was still in it. I wrung it out, and carried it and all my clothes to the driest place I could find, a point some distance behind the altar where the grotto narrowed and slanted down into the earth. After spreading my shirt and trousers there, I dove into the well once more. This time I was not so lucky, and came back to the surface empty-handed. Pulling myself up, weary and freezing, I decided to make a thorough examination of the grotto before diving again. It would give me time to catch my breath and to warm myself somewhat. The dark passage behind the altar descended steeply for the twenty or thirty steps I followed it, 
and was soon darker than the wildest night. A dozen other murky openings in the walls of the grotto led into small caves, all of them more or less damp. Grengarm, I decided, probably had a den in the roots of the mountain, down the long passage. Grengarm would not be able to see me, and that was surely good. I, on the other hand, would not be able to see Grengarm either. Shuddering at the recollection of Cedar, I dove again, swimming down until I thought my lungs would burst, and at last catching hold of something that seemed likely to be a stick of sodden driftwood. At the surface it turned out to be my other boot. I felt like a kid at Christmas. I was so cold and weak that I was afraid for a minute that I would not be able to pull myself out of the well, but I danced on the damp stone floor of the grotto and even tried a few cartwheels before wringing out this stocking and laying it beside the first one. Those stockings were in the entrance to the passage behind the altar, as I said. Looking down it, I found it was not quite so dark as I had imagined. Thinking things over, I decided that I had remembered the utter blackness fifteen or twenty yards farther, and had transferred it to the entrance. Your mind plays strange tricks on you. That is what I told myself. I could read Alf writing, though I had just about forgotten I could write it. Now that I knew I could, I could see that it must have been one of the things I learned in Alfris before I came out in Parker's cave. The elf had wiped a lot of things out of my memory, who knows why. All my memories of that time had been erased. But they had not wiped out what I was supposed to say to somebody about their troubles and the injustices they had suffered. I could not remember any of the details, but they had to be there just like the shapes of the elf letters. They sent you with a tale of their wrongs and their worship, Parker had told me. When they had left their message, they must have left what I had learned about their writing, too. Maybe they had to. By the time I had thought all that, I was back at the well. I knew I would have to reach bottom this time if I wanted my mail back. I would have to give it everything I had, every last ounce. A good dive to start with, jumping as high as I could and breaking the water like an arrow to get as deep as possible. I made a good dive and swam down until my ears ached, but there was nothing but water ahead when I had to come up. After sightseeing around the grotto a while to warm up and catch my breath, I picked out a nice smooth stone almost too heavy to carry and jumped into the well holding it. Down and down it carried me until the light vanished. Here there was, it seemed to me, a new quality to the water. It was still cold and still very different from even the coldest, wettest air, but it was not suffocating any more. It was water that had stopped trying to drown me. I was so surprised and so scared that I let go of the stone, drifting up at first, then swimming upward with all my might when the tiny circle of blue light that was the top of the well showed again. This time I shot out of the water, chilly and tired but not exactly breathless. That was Aelfris down there, I told myself. The water in Aelfris knows who I am. The pool I had dived into on the Isle of Glass had its bottom in Aelfris, I remembered. So had the sea, or that was how it seemed when the Kelpies had dived into it with me. So had the pool into which the winged man had sunk, for that matter. There was no reason this well should not take me to Aelfris too, although I suspected it would not take everyone there. But I'm not everyone, after all. This time I chose two smaller stones, nicely rounded. Something moved in the chill-blind depths. I could not feel it, but I felt the little currents it made. And then, with the outstretched hands that held my ballast stones, I felt something new, rough and hard, flexible. Letting go of one stone, I grabbed it, then dropped the other. My return to the surface hurt like the devil. Again and again I just about let go of the slimy, shapeless thing that held me back. From its weight and feel, I was sure it was the hauberk of double mail I had taken from Niter, although there seemed to be something else caught in it, something long, awkward, stiff, and bumpy. At the surface at last, and grasping the well's edge with one hand, I heaved the whole mess up and out onto the rough floor of the grotto foundering in the process, but bobbing up once my arm was free. About ready to drop, I climbed out of the well, 
carried up by a sudden surge of rising water, an uprush that seemed to have become a lot stronger since the last time I paid attention to it. When I climbed out of that well and shook myself as dry as I could, combing water from my hair with my fingers, the ringing in my ears made me deaf to the music echoing faintly through the grotto. I shivered and gaped and spat, shaking my head. Then I heard it. Eerie and splotched with sour chords, sinking and rising again, foreign and familiar all at once, it snapped like a flame, then sang the way a swan sings when a hunter's arrow takes her life. It scared me half to death, but it made me homesick for some place I could not remember. I ran around the altar to the passage where I had left my clothes. Lights no bigger than lightning bugs danced a long, long way down. As quickly as I could I dressed myself again, forcing my feet into my wet boots, although it felt as if I might break every bone in them. The hauberk I had brought up from the bottom of the well was tangled with water weeds and filthy with mud. I rinsed it in the cold, clear water that would become the griffin. A sword belt of fine metal mesh was linked to it, and a gem-encrusted scabbard hung from the belt. I drew the blade halfway to look at it. It was black, but mottled with silver in a way that made me think of a knife I saw in Forsetti. I turned it over. Was it really mottled? or marked, or just darkened by years under water. Sometimes I seemed to see writing there, other times none. The hilt might have been gold or bronze, a little green now with corrosion. A thousand clear voices had joined the music, a chant like the chants in church. As quickly as I could, I pulled on the hauberk, finding it lighter than I remembered. I had left my own sword belt behind. I was running to get it when the well erupted. Water swamped the floor, and spray rose to the lofty ceiling. From that eruption a snout like the bottom of a wreck emerged, and seeing it I hid in one of the smaller openings, a little cave in which I knelt behind a rock and wrapped the mesh sword belt around me, unriddling the jeweled catch a lot faster than I had any right to expect. When I looked up again the dragon's head was above water. Its scales seemed black in the dim light. Its eyes were of a blackness to turn all ordinary black to gray, the kind of black that drinks up every spark of light. Coil by coil it rose, and I believe it would have spread its wings if it could, but wide and lofty as the grotto was, it was not big enough for that. Half open, the wings filled it, so that it seemed for a minute or more to have been hung with curtains of thin black leather curtains hanging from cruel, curved claws as black as ebony. Sea-green, many-colored, and fiery were the marching, singing elf who poured from the passage to hail Grengarm. But black was the robe of the bound woman they laid on his altar, long and curling black hair that did not quite veil her nakedness. Under it her skin was as white as milk. I stared, dazzled by her beauty, but by no means sure she was human. One of the elf, robed and bearded, indicated her by a gesture, made some speech to Grangarm that was lost in the music and the singing, and fell to his knees, bowing his head to the rocky floor. Grangarm's mouth gaped, and a voice like a hundred deep drums filled the whole grotto. You come with spears! With swords, the curved fangs his open mouth showed, plainly were longer than those swords, and as sharp as any spear. What if Grengarm finds your sacrifice unworthy? The singers fell silent. The harps and horns and flutes no longer played. From far away came the thud of mridangas, the chiming of gold thumb cymbals, and the jingle of sistra. My heart pounded and I knew then that I had danced once like the dancers that were coming. These were elf maidens, twenty or more, naked as the woman on the altar, but crowned with floating hair, leaping and turning, dancing each to her own music, or perhaps all dancing to a music beyond music, to a rhythm of sistrum, cymbal, and mridanga, too complex for me to understand. They twirled and dipped, stepped and capered as they played, and I saw Uri among them. 
Folding his wings, Grengar moved the way a big snake moves, advancing toward the altar. The dancers scattered, and I, almost unconsciously, drew the sword I had just found. A phantom knight stood before Grengarm as soon as my blade cleared the scabbard, a knight holding his sword above his head and shouting, Cease! Cease, worm! Or perish! Chapter 69 Grengarm the dragon reared as a cobra rears, and wings smaller than the great wings on its back stood out upon its neck. Who has overturned your stone shade, that you should rise to oppose Grengarm? What stone was overturned, the phantom knight replied, that you have seeped from beneath its shadow? Still on his knees, the robed and bearded elf called, This is none of our doing, lord. I see the hand of Cetar in it. Cetar's hand is stronger, Grengar might have been amused. Shade, wraith, knight, what will you do if I burn hyssop, or call the gods of your dead? Would not a puff of my breath disperse you? I knew what sword I held. As sword in hand, I rose from my hiding place. He'd call on his brother knight. Grengar moved more quickly than I would have believed possible. His strike proceeded by a sheet of fire, the way the bray of a trumpet precedes the charge. I thrust, both hands on the hilt, and half blind with fire and smoke, heard my blade rattle among his fangs. Slashed and slashed and slashed again, the dark two-edged brand slicing flesh and splitting scale and bone with every stroke. Knights fought shoulder to shoulder with me, who were almost real staunch men, whose eyes looked full upon the face of hell. But behind Grengarm and at his flanks the elf fought for him with spear, shield, and slender elf sword, and fell bleeding and dying, just as men in battle die. Grengarm gave way, and would have dived into the well, but I and a score of knights barred his path. Like lightning he turned aside, and vanished. Blood ran from the mouth of a piteous dwarf who scuttled toward the rushing water. I sprang after him. Fire checked me. He plunged into the griffin and was gone. The elf fought on, but the phantom knights closed about them with war cries the eldest trees were too young to have heard. From the depths of time rose the thunder of hooves. Eternity shattered elf swords and split heads until the last elf alive fled down the dark passage. Panting, I turned to the woman on the altar. An elf, as grey as ash, sawed at her bonds with a broken sword. His head had been nearly severed, and blood dribbled from his fingers to redden her milky skin and raven hair, yet he worked away, turning this way and that to bring the cords in view. She called, Sheath your sword and lay these spectres before they harm us, and please, I beg this, free me. I spoke to one of the phantom knights. He had removed his helm, and there was sorrow in his face, Ben, to tear your heart. Who are you? I asked. Should I do as this woman advises? On my honor, I won't send you away without thanking you. They gathered around me, muttering that they had done no more than their own had required. Their voices were dry and hollow, as though a clever showman pulled a string through a gourd to make it talk. We are those knights, the knight I had spoken to said, who bore eternity unworthily. You would be wise, another told me, to do what she wishes, but unwise to trust her. From the altar the woman called, Cut me free and give me a drink. Have you wine? The phantom knights and I spoke further. I will not tell you what we said now. Then one brought a skin like a wine skin that the elf had dropped. He pulled the stopper and poured some into the little cup that was the other end of the stopper. That is how those things are made in Aelfris. It was strong brandy, as its fumes told me. I had no need to taste it. I wiped Eterni clean with the hair of a dead elf and returned her to her scabbard, thinking to take the wineskin, and the knights vanished. Picture a hall lit by many candles. A wind sweeps it, and at once the flame of every candle is put out. 
That was how it was with them. The skin fell to the stony floor of the grotto, and most of the brandy was wasted, though by snatching it up I managed to save a little. That little I carried to the woman on the altar, and when I had fetched my old sword-belt and cut her free with my dagger, I poured it into the cup and gave it to her. She thanked me and thrust her finger into it. At once it burned blue, and she downed it fire and all. Good Lord! That made her smile. Say good night, she stroked my cheek. I am no lord, sir knight, no lady either. Are you a subject of my brother's? I said I was a knight of Shearwall. You are, and when we meet again, you will bow to me while I smile oh so coldly. Her breath was heavy with brandy. But we are not at court. What are you doing? I was taking off my cloak to give to her. It's still wet, I warned her. I will dry it. She left the altar then, slender and swaying like a willow in a storm, and let me put it about her shoulders. I am accounted tall, but the cloak that fell to my ankles failed to cover her knees. We will both be wetter than that cloak, your highness, before we are out of this place. She held up the empty skin. They brought this for me. She laughed as she tossed it aside, and her laughter was lovely and inhuman. Ah, the tenderness of my old guardians! Let her be stupefied and happy, until Grengarm's jaws close upon her. I wish we had more Eric. I searched for another skin, but she stopped me. There is no more, more's the pity. It would have dried you. As for me, I will not be wet, and before I go I will confide to you, my kind knight, a great secret. She leaned toward me and whispered, had he who turned that halter devoured me, he would have been as real here as in Muspel. At the final word my cloak slumped empty to the stone floor, and the dead elf with it. Outside the sunlit gorge held no one save myself. I climbed out of the stream slowly, choosing every hand and foothold, conscious only that I did not want to fall back into the water, no matter what else might happen, I did not want to fall back into the water. The thing I remember best about that time, almost the only thing I remember at all, is how tired I was. At our camp, where we had built our fire and tied the lame white stallion Lord Beale had given me, I had rags and a flask of oil. I wanted to get them and oil the strange mail I had pulled out of the well. I remember looking at it in the sunlight and noticing that every fifth ring was gold. I wanted to oil my dagger, too, and sword-breaker, which I had carried with me. Most of all, I wanted to care for Eterni. I would have to draw her to clean and oil her blade, and the phantom knights would come. I knew that, and tried to think of some way to prevent it, but could not. I was worried about the scabbard, too. It was of gold, set with precious stones. But I knew there would have been a lining of some kind, probably wood, and I was afraid it had rotted away. Behind me, the great, deep, lisping voice of the griffin rumbled, Would you see him? Look west. I looked at the griffin instead, stared, in fact. He was all white, save for his beak, his claws, and his wonderful golden eyes. Look west, he said again. At last I did. There was a storm gathering in the west, thunderheads plucking at the sun, Against the darkness of the storm something flew that seemed darker still. Yes, will you spare him? From his roost upon the cliff the griffin dropped into the ravine, and his weight shook the earth. Or will you destroy him? I can't, I said. I would kill him if I could. I fly as swift as he and swifter. Will you go? The eagle face loomed over me, and the claws gripping the rocks of the gorge might have held me as a child holds a doll. Ravd had not been among the phantom knights who had fought beside me, but it seemed to me that Ravd's phantom stood behind me as I said, I will. The griffin nodded, one solemn bowing of his great grim head. I waited, wanting to rest, and knowing that I was going into the fight of my life instead and he did something that surprised me as much as anything that happened in the grotto. Turning to look down the gorge, he called, Taug. 
Talc appeared so quickly that I knew he must have been watching us from some hiding place. Here's your bow, Sir Abel, Talc said, and your arrows are in here, and here's your helmet. You left that too. I took them and gave him sword breaker and my old sword belt. You can speak again. Yes, Sir Abel, because you got it, got the sword. I've been waiting. He'd already talked to me. I turned again to stare at the griffin. Yes, him. And he said I could go if it was all right with you, because he saw I wanted to so much, only I couldn't answer, and then I could, and we knew you'd gotten it then, and it was going to be all right. So can I, Sir Abel, can I go with you? May I, I said, and felt Rob's hand upon my shoulder, though not even I could see him. We rode the griffin's neck, both of us, half buried in his white feathers to keep out the cold, me before and Taug behind. You will be a knight if you live, I told him over the roar of the beating wings. After this, no other life is possible for you. I know, Taug said. His arms were about my waist, and he clung as tightly as a limpet. I felt the spirit of prophecy come upon me, the spirit that comes to those about to die. You will be a knight, I repeated, knowing that in his heart Taug, a boy now verging on manhood, was a knight already. But nothing you do as a knight will be as great as this. You begged a boon which I granted. Now I, in my turn, beg a boon of you. Yes, Sir Abel, his teeth chattered. Anything. Say, granted whatever it may be. Granted whatever it may be, he repeated. Just don't ask me to jump. He was looking down at the slate-green sea so far below. I want you to have this griffin painted on your shield. Will you do that? You, you should have it, Sir Abel. No, will you not grant my boon? Yes, Sir Abel, I, I will. The griffin looked back at us, then down, and following the direction of his gaze, I saw Grengarm in the sea. Like a thunderbolt, the griffin dove with outstretched claws, and Grengarm dove too, diving as the whale dives, but not before my arrow found him. We skimmed the waves, and I, seeing them and feeling their warm salt breath upon my face, loved them as a man loves a woman. He must rise to breathe, the griffin told us. His words were timed to the beating of his wings, each syllable the thunderous downstroke that kept us up. But the time may be long, and when he rises he will be far away. We rose too, slowly, and by wide circlings and the air about us grew cool again. If he rises by night, I said, we won't see him. I will see him, the griffin promised us. The sun was low and dim when the griffin dove again and my arrow caught Grengarm behind the head. The third time he surfaced, at an hour when the sun was hidden behind the western isles, he did not dive, but beat his vast black wings against the tossing waves, and rose into the air as a pheasant rises before dogs. Long we pursued him, and high we rose, and saw a million stars under us like diamonds cast on a blanket of cloud. Between the moon and the Valfather's castle we overtook our prey. Griffin and dragon met in a battle only one could survive, at a height so great that the castle, whose shining towers rise from all six sides, so that to the undiscerning it appears a spiky star, looked far larger than dark Mythgarther. Its battlements were lined with men who watched and cheered, and every window of every tower displayed a fair face. As Grengarm's fangs closed on the griffin's throat, I scrambled from griffin to dragon with the wind of their wings singing in my ears, the sword eternity in my hand, and a score of phantom knights blown like brown leaves around me and I drove that famous blade to the hilt where my arrow had shown the way, and felt Grengarm die beneath me. His thundering wings grew flaccid, and the griffin, unable to bear him up, released his grip. As we fell I pulled Eterni from the grievous wound that she had made and washed her in the wind, scattering drops of the dragon's blood across the sky. And I sheathed her, thinking that though I perished, the sword and scabbard should remain together. It was at that moment, when the phantoms had vanished, that Grengarm turned his terrible head toward me, 
craning it upon a neck a thousand times mightier than any crane's, and opened his maw wide, and I, staring into it as into the face of death, understood certain things that had been hidden. A galloping horse dove for me as I stared, its silver-shod hooves driving it earthward more swiftly than even the griffin's wings. The maiden who rode that horse snatched at me and Mr. Grip, but a second rode hard behind her, and a third hard behind the second, shouting for joy as she galloped down the starry sky and lashing her steed with its reins. And this third maiden caught me up, one strong arm across my back and beneath my own right arm, and set me on the saddle before her, as I myself had set Taug when Taug could not speak. I looked back at her, and I saw that though I might be counted a fighting man to match the best, my head was no higher than her chin. All of it am I, the maiden shouted. Your name you need not tell, we know it. So low had we come that the clouds were above us, and up a lofty mountain of cloud all of its white steed cantered, never stumbling and never tiring. From the summit of that cloudy mountain it launched itself again on hooves that drummed a road of air. This is the finest thing in the world, I said, and thought that I spoke solely to myself, words to be lost in the swift wind of the white steed's passing. But all of it said, It is not, but a thing outside the world. Love you a good fight, Sir Abel? No, I said, and looked squarely into my own soul. I fight when honor says I must, and with everything I've got, and I win whatever way I can. She laughed and held me tighter and her laughter was that strange and thrilling sky-sound men hear sometimes and puzzle their heads over afterward. That is enough for us, and you are a man after my heart. Will you defend us from the giants of winter and old night? Will you if we lead you in battle? I will defend you against anything, I told her, and you don't have to lead me. Nobody does. I'll lead myself and fight on when any leader you may give me falls. Bending over me, she kissed me as the last syllable left my lips, and it was such a kiss as I had never known, and will never feel again, a kiss that turned all my limbs to iron and lit a fire behind my ribs. Soon after her steed rolled over as it ran in a most peculiar way, and it could be seen that the Valfather's castle, which had seemed to be above it, was in fact beneath it, and in a moment more its silver shoes rang on the crystal cobbles of a courtyard. End of the Night The Wizard Knight, Book One by Gene Wolfe G-E-N-E-W-O-L-F-E -E -E. Read by Michael Scherer in the studios of Potomac Talking Book Services Incorporated for the Library of Congress, December 2005 Published by Tor, Tom Doherty Associates, LLC, 175 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10010 Further reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. End of book.